City, and welcome to the May 24th, 2022 work session meeting. We welcome the members of the public who are in person and who may be watching our usual video feeds online. Hybrid council meetings allow people to join online through WebEx or in person at the city and county building. We are continuing to watch COVID rates to make the safest choice for all of us. Masks are no longer required in city facilities, but attendees who prefer to continue using a mask are welcome to do so. We will continue to monitor the situation and take any reasonable precautions for the public and staff. As many of you know, there is no public comment during a work session. However, next public comment opportunity will be on Tuesday, June 7th at the 7 p.m. formal meeting. Our agendas for the next several weeks will continue to be focused on the reviewing the proposed budget for each city department. Therefore, June 7th is also the second public hearing scheduled specifically for the public to comment on the mayor's recommended budget for fiscal year 2022 to 2023. We want to hear from you. Remember, it's your city, it's your business. And of course, the public is always welcome any time to provide feedback with the City Council by mailing us at P.O. Box 145-476, Salt Lake City, 84114, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or calling our 24-hour phone line, 801-535-7654. Scott will be moderating today's meeting. And as usual, we always start with our work session items with an informational update from the admin. And today we have uh, Rachel, Weston, and Andrew. And I'm going to turn the time over to Rachel. Get all of us. And get all of you. <laughs> Come on up. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. We'll be brief today. I know you have a lot to cover. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Taylor. Okay, so um, you see that I think the good news is that um, more people are getting up to date on their vaccinations. So um, maybe that's a product of all of us talking about how <laughs> how it really does matter to get your booster shot to keep you out of the hospital. So you'll remember a few months ago, we were just seeing like very, very incremental upticks in vaccination use. And now we are seeing for at least a few weeks in a row over 1%. So that's actually a pretty, that's a pretty impressive improvement. Um, next slide, please. And hospitalizations are stabilizing a bit. Um, we, uh, you'll see just a few, a few fewer than last week there in that month long trend. Um, next slide, please, Taylor. So I wanted to give you this side by side comparison today. So we haven't looked at this map in a little bit and it's kind of interesting. This is the, it's probably a little bit hard to read up there, but you'll see that um, this is the vaccination coverage in our city and um, county. And you will see that we're getting, again, a higher uptake in the up-to-date vaccinations, and it's kind of starting to even out a little bit. So I think that's good news based on you know what we saw back in April and what we're seeing now. Again, that progressive increase in people making sure that they're up-to-date. Next slide, please. With the capital. Here's everyone's favorite wastewater data. And you'll also see there that um, there's, while we had seen a bit of an uptick in those trends, we're seeing some stabilization now and even a little bit more green on that map. So decreasing trends across the state. And then the next slide, please, Taylor. The Salt Lake City snapshot itself, I think last week we saw an increasing trend. This week we're seeing a stabilization or no real trend with a more even looking line across the, the graph there. And then I just have one other slide, I think, on COVID. If you go to the next slide, Taylor. Yeah, so despite the fact that we're seeing a bit of an increase from two weeks ago, we still see um, that Salt Lake County has, is considered in the low transmission, low community spread based on our hospitalizations and deaths. So. All in all, after we saw you know, a bump about a month ago with lots more cases, I think we're seeing uh, a bit of an evening there and we're still generally in low transmission. And again, 
the biggest game changer is just staying up to date on vaccinations. So it's good to see that those trends are increasing. Any questions on the COVID data? No, thank you, Rachel. It is interesting that the waste water is fairly steady and a low and no big spike there. So that's good. Yeah, good. Thank you. All right, engagement. Um, uh, of course, there's our website that I love to mention every time. Um, I wanted to add, I've, we've got pictures of my team here. I have uh, a new member of my team, Katie Reiser, um, formerly from our public lands department. Sorry, Kristen, I know you're behind me. Um, <laughs> Uh, who's joined uh, my team. I'm super excited to have her there. She will be running our volunteer program and some special projects for outreach. Um, and then starting on Wednesday, we'll have another liaison, Hannah Barton, who will be uh, districts three and six. Um, so she will, I will introduce you to her as quickly as I possibly can. Um, all right, um, really quick uh, engagement updates, transportation, next slide. Um, Transportation is doing their Virginia uh, Avenue restriping uh, program. Uh, the survey is opened for residents to respond. Uh, you can go to the website I mentioned before or directly to the slc.gov slash mystreet slash Virginia uh, to participate on that. And that will be on the um, uh, different ideas on how to restripe the street. Um, I mentioned before 2100 South reconstruction intercept surveys will be starting tomorrow, um, basically on the street, basically uh, interviewing folks on the street for their feedback. Uh, the project has not started yet. It is very early in that project. Um, next slide. Sustainability, um, I've previously mentioned the uh, second of several planned rate increases for our waste rates. Uh, the rates are based on the size of one's garbage container, recycling, compost, and call to haul service are included, not charged separately. Uh, mailers were sent out last week. Uh, website to learn more is at slcgreen.com slash rates, and sustainability will be, pre be presenting, of course, their budget to you all today. Um, the open public comment period has begun for the proposed EV readiness ordinance and notice was recently sent to community councils. The comment period is open through June 3rd and then the proposal will go to the planning commission um, in July. Um, hoping to transmit the ordinance to the city council for consideration um, after the new fiscal year. And then the last engagement slide is our housing stability. Um, this is Salt Lake City's Housing Stability Division will be accepting public comment on projects and activities to be undertaken in 22-23 with Community Development Block Grants, CDBG, um, Home Investment Partnership Program, and uh, the em uh, Emergency Solutions Grant, uh, and the HAPWA, the Housing Opportunities for People with HIV AIDS. Uh, so that is under the HUD program, and they are taking public comments for their uh, proposed programs May 25th through June 24th uh, through the website slc.gov slash housing stability is where you can go to navigate to that. And that's it. Question. Mr. Chair, uh, we don't have new numbers for the uh, HRC capacity this week. We didn't get them from the state quite yet. So these are last week's. I wouldn't anticipate much of a change though, honestly. Next slide. Uh, what you'll see is the update on cleaning and abatements. Uh, the Victory Road will follow up this week from a previous one a few weeks ago. The health department's been off for a couple of weeks to trainings and vacations, so they're back. And then uh, Kayak Court did happen last Friday on the Jordan River. Obviously, the Justice Court was there. Rough Haven, a great partner for uh, animals, pets. Uh, Jordan River Commission and Green Bike were both uh, really invaluable partners as well for bikes access and river access. And then the next resource fair is June 10th, our regular scheduled uh, monthly progression every Friday. And then this slide is similar to the one you saw last week about the uh, winter overflow process that the Conference of Mayors is engaged in right now. Uh, in May, I've added there that funding and operator discussions are ongoing. So those are happening now. They will continue to happen. Um, they're not on the same sort of schedule as this. They're happening on a weekly and bi-weekly basis usually. And then you will see here that uh, the expectation is that in June, a ranked list will be provided to the Conference of Mayors to review. And then you'll see the, uh, the schedule from there through the summer. Anticipating again that a site will be, or sites will be forwarded to the state um, in August. Any questions? No questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Any Mr. Question? Chair. Oh, go ahead. If I may, sorry. I just want to say thank you. I had a great talk with Andrew and Michelle the other day, and I want to thank you for that and for the continuing partnership in addressing some of those concerns I've brought up. And um, we had a great turnout for Kayak Court, um, and Rough Haven is an excellent partner. We got a cat licensed and vaccinated and all of the things. So it was a really good turnout. And um, I, I do appreciate us having this conversation and trying to work with the county. Um, had a good conversation with Dr. Dunn as well about how we can partner better with the resource fairs and what we're trying to do on one side and the health concerns and the abatements and what's trying to happen on the other side. So thank you for that. Thank you, council member, for being there. Also for Kaya Court. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Council, we're moving on to item number two, fiscal year 2022 to 23 budget and the Department of Public Service. We have our new director, Jorge uh, Chamorro, with us. Oh, and Allison's going to be opening it up. Then we have, and we have JP and Don. Don is virtually. Don okay, will be and Don's on it there. Okay, yep. great. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council. Um, as you mentioned, this is the Public Services Department budget. Public Services Department consists of divisions for streets, compliance, facility services, engineering, and administrative services. And it also includes the fleet fund, but we brief that separately during the budget because of the size and complexity. Um, for FY23, the general fund budget is proposed to reflect primarily increases to personal service costs, so salaries, merit changes, insurance rate changes, et cetera. And these are amplified by the fact that this is a very large department. Um, I believe it's 241 without fleet. I'm, it's not a test. Um, <laughs> 252, thank you. I'm sorry, I dropped that number somewhere when I, when I tried to put together a summary. Um, so the proposal for these five, check myself, yes, five um, divisions would include 23 new employees, sorry, 23 total employees who would be paid with ongoing revenue from funding our future. Um, those are mostly in streets, but there are three homeless encampment rapid intervention team positions. These were funded by ARPA money last year, the federal aid money, and their salaries would be transfer transferred to funding our future in the public, serv I'm sorry, the public safety rubric. Um, and finally, um, some of you may have noticed, um, there were some clarifications that uh, Jorge and his team were able to make to some errors I had in the staff report. And so, and some of them were just um, ignorance um, for, for uh, needing more information for the staff report. So those are included now in the packets, but uh, you, you might wanna check that out. They're marked in red so you can see in case you, you had any specific questions. So I'll just turn it over to Jorge and JP and Don. Alison, thank you very much for always being so thorough on the staff report. Um, it is a lengthy one, so I, I wouldn't expect that you, you had a chance to read it. We just uh, completed yesterday, but uh, it is in front of you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present this, this budget today. I have with me uh, J.P. Goats, who is uh, uh, serving as, as a deputy director in an acting capacity. And um, I understand that you all have a very busy agenda today, very loaded. So we're gonna keep it short and sweet. If you have any questions at any, at any time, please uh, stop us. We'll, we'll try to answer those questions right away. All right. Here we go. Next slide, please. Next slide. I think it's uh, Scott. Scott, can you? Oh, there there we, go. we go. You got Thank it. Thank you very much. Well, in front of you, uh, there is our department overview. We have our mission statement right there. Um, I will state it for you. The public service is a team of professionals who value integrity, diversity, and equity. We are committed to providing essential municipal services and accessible public spaces for Salt Lake City by investing public funds effectively, efficiently, and sustainably 
to make life better throughout the community. As Alison mentioned, we are close to 300 FTEs in our department with many more part-time and seasonal staff. The department provides a series of public-facing services as well as internal, internal services. On the internal side, we have facilities who takes care of uh, maintenance of our employee-occupied buildings. And we also have fleet providing procurement and maintenance services for all city-owned vehicles, equipment, and machinery. Lastly, uh, our admin services providing support on financial analysis, communication, and special projects. The divisions that are providing public-facing services are streets who are in charge of the maintenance of our roads, which is not limited to the road surface. Uh, they also take care of the maintenance of signs, signals, and markings that make those roads safe for traveling. Additionally, we have compliance, providing, providing crossing guard services to elementary schools in the Salt Lake City School District, as well as parking enforcement. Again, not limited to parking meters. They are also in charge of enforcement of uh, a little bit more complicated, complex ordinances, such as the Streets for Storage uh, Ordinance. Last but not least, engineering that provides the planning, design, and construction management services to bring to life uh, capital projects in our city. The structure, next slide please. Just a quick overview of the structure of our department. We have two sites in our house, one focusing on uh, capital planning. We have uh, engineering and facilities on that side with, uh, as I mentioned, JP um, being, being uh, the deputy director over that group. We also have the operations divisions and include compliance, fleet, streets, and the safety program that supports all of the department and then some. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Our admin services is right in the middle as they provide uh, support with communications, uh, finance, technology, and strategic planning. Next slide, please. All right, you may be familiar with these strategic goals. Uh, they were established on their previous department leadership, and we continue to adhere to them as our guiding principles. First, capital planning, to better understand the life cycle cost of current and new assets, as well as how to better prepare ourselves for the renewal and rep or replacing of uh, these assets in the future. We have emergency preparedness, and safety. Uh, we recognize that the, uh, the department plays a big role in emergency response. So having um, properly trained and prepared staff is, is of high importance to us. This is the oldest, third and oldest um, of our strategic goals, workforce evolution planning. This addresses, um, in a sense, it's our way of responding to the competitive labor <clears throat> labor market that we are experiencing. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, workforce evolution planning is, is our strategy to address the competitive labor market labor market that we are experiencing right now. Um, promoting from within, developing our workforce um, for, for succession purposes. Right? We also have uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion as, as one of our strategic goals. When we invest in promoting these concepts within our teams, the results go beyond our, uh, our workplace, and they are reflected in the decision-making, and service we provide to the public. Lastly, technology and data. We recognize that investing on the best resources to make our operations more efficient will generate data that will support objective decision-making. Next slide, please. Now, let me paint a picture of where we're at with our department. Uh, as you are fully aware the city has experienced unprecedented growth and 
These are just a few of the impacts of that growth. We are managing an unprecedented amount of project funding. The road reconstruction bond is halfway completed with some of the largest road projects undergoing like the second phase of 300 West or are on a schedule like 200 South. There are around $23 million worth of CIP projects in our queue currently. And we're expecting about the same amount to come online uh, this coming year. Thanks to council approvals over the last few years, the facilities capital asset renewal plan has been consistently funded. Perhaps not at the level that is recommended, but every little bit helps getting out of the fair maintenance in our buildings. Also, there is no clear evidence of growth in the city that the volume of users of our public spaces. During the pandemic, businesses with the support of the city were creative on ways to accommodate customers in outdoor spaces. And now we see those spaces being used consistently. So that is uh, an extra load to our uh, business district teams that are in charge of enhanced maintenance in the downtown area as well as Sugar House. Additionally, every construction project in the business districts, those two I mentioned, uh, impacts the spaces and the right of way that they take care of. Increasing the demand for coordination with construction companies, ensuring that they are following city standards when they are putting back um, the, the right of way in place. This is also the team that is going to be housing the rapid intervention team. And lastly, on our last section there, safety. Um, we are currently the hub, the, the safety hub for not only public services, but also parks and public lands, as well as the youth and family division. The number of employees that our safety manager currently uh, oversees and takes care of the safety and the workplace went from 500 to 900 employees, and that includes full-time as well as part-time employees. And lastly, the, the inventory of devices that are installed in the right-of-way for safety purposes, whether it is um, bike lanes or um, signs that are activated by pedestrians, all of those have du uh, duplicated in the last four years. So our inventory basically grew double in the last four years without adding any more staff to maintain those, those signs and markings. We are proposing initiatives in those three categories, project delivery, uh, aiming to improve the efficiency and coordination of project delivery, as well as um, operational initiatives to improve essential services we provide to residents and visitors, as well as the uh, safety initiatives that aim to expand and improve the safety of our employees and the community. Next slide, please. One more, please. All right. I'm going to let JP talk about this, this set of uh, initiatives now. Thanks, Jorge. So with our project delivery initiatives, the engineering and facilities teams are constantly finding better ways to take projects in and get them out the door and built. Um, we are currently have over 90 active JP, property. could you just speak a little bit closer? You yeah. Bet. Yep. Thanks. We currently have over 90 active property projects and over 15 right-of-way projects, including the ones Jorge mentioned that are uh, some of the largest reconstruction projects the city's undertaken in recent history, um, and we're about halfway through those. Uh, so with our growth and renewal needs, we, we continue to see more projects year over year and increased funding. Um, the last three years has shown steady flow of CIP projects, around 30, 45, and then 65. Uh, so right now there are over 90 projects in some process right now with, with our uh, places group. Uh, that includes a lot of parks projects and facilities projects. So, and we're also continuing to, to work on over 30 earthquake related reviews and projects, including where we sit now. Um, so, and this is not to mention the anticipation of proposed bond projects upcoming. 
So to add to that current workload, I think it's safe to say the construction market has been uh, nothing less than odd in the last few years. Um, from bids coming in 30, 40 percent high uh, that we have to put out to rebid, find new funding sources for, to uh, project management consultants, contractors that are short labor, short material, short supply chain goods, equipment. Um, so this initiative uh, has these three asks here and that's uh, aim to achieve better support for our project managers and their delivery focus. Uh, we're shifting some of the renewal project load to facilities and managing some of those projects uh, in that shop and, and are looking for a, a senior project manager there. Uh, engineering, we're looking for a senior project manager to focus on our staff loading, tracking progress with and, and progress with our proposed finance analyst who would be uh, supporting the financial tasks that end up taking an extraordinary amount of time, particularly with change orders that continue to keep coming, um, which uh, is a great deal of burden on the project managers. And this is also replacing uh, our finance, embedded finance analyst, FT, that was shifted uh, to CAN last year. So um, with that, we'll move to the next slide. Thanks, JP. All right. As you may remember, the Public Services Department um, used to have three deputies back in the day. Um, with the changes that happen within the structure of the city and the Parks and Public Lands uh, Department becoming their own, um, they took their uh, deputy position, uh, which is absolutely right, uh, the right move. However, we're seeing also that with the um, migration of, of the second deputy into the um, innovations team, uh, the department was left with one deputy director. As I mentioned in the structure at the beginning, we are trying to focus on two uh, main pillars of, of the department, the capital side and the operation side. Adding a, a second deputy again to the, to the department will allow us to focus on the capital planning effort that the city is undergoing. Um, again, we are preparing ourselves to support an influx of uh, capital investments in, in the city, not only from, from the two bonds that will be considered by, by you, Council, but also um, any potential federal um, money that, it, that will be available. So we are preparing ourselves for that as well. There is a second ask in these operational initiatives, is the business district's operation manager. As I mentioned during the uh, impacts of growth, we are seeing an unprecedented amount of uh, building and construction going on in the business districts, Sugar House and downtown. Every time that there is a construction project, they are impacting the right of way, the sidewalks. So verifying and coordinating with, with those construction uh, companies that they are up to standard when they put back those, those pavers or those sidewalk panels. Uh, it, is, it is very important. In addition, this person will be also coordinating the rapid intervention team, new to public services, but very, very important function that will be continuing to be um, uh, operated in fiscal year 23. Lastly, this is something that we, we feel very, very, very good about. Uh, we see in the, in the near future, we're talking about a few months, the activation of two new facilities. One is a brand new, recently constructed facility. Is a, in the picture right there, a rendering of a 300 North pedestrian bridge. That bridge is coming live. The city will be responsible for its maintenance. And we are calculating uh, the first year, brand new equipment. There is not gonna be a lot of maintenance, but we are getting ourselves ready for um, two, two main um, maintenance needs, the landscaping and the elevator. So in this number, 48,000, there is a, enough money we, we, we estimate to maintain this pedestrian bridge that will come into our inventory very soon in the next uh, few months. Additionally to this, to this uh, bridge, we have the Fisher Mansion carriage house that will be activated with programming for the first time this, this year. Uh, the maintenance needs are, are not as demanding, 
but there is an increase on, on in the inventory of facilities. So it's a new facility they will be maintaining. So we're putting a, uh, in that amount, 48,000, also a, a portion to, to cover that maintenance as well. All right, moving on to the safety initiatives. Um, as I mentioned before, we're currently the safety hub for public services, parks and public lands, and youth and family. And, and we are very happy to do that. Uh, adding an extra coordinator, we currently have one safety manager taking care of the needs of two departments and one division, about 900 staff total. Work hazard assessments that are performed in each one of the locations they, they, uh, they work at, uh, review of any incidents and claims for workers' compensation. She's currently dealing with all of that. So we're adding capacity to, to her function, and this is, this is a much better approach than um, asking for a manager in each one of those other uh, departments, right? Um, just adding one coordinator will make a world of difference. Now, we have two big um, requests in, in the second half of this, this chart. We have uh, streets division requests. They are funding our future eligible. The first one is for traffic signal maintenance. We are adding one FTE there and some equipment as well. When I mention traffic signals, is everything that is power that has lights on the right of way, your traffic lights, your pedestrian activated crosswalks, your hawk signs, all of that. The current number of devices that each technician is responsible for exceeds the number recommended by the Federal Highway Administration. Adding a, a, an extra FTE and, and the uh, respective equipment will create the ability to complete annual preventive maintenance cycles and provides the capacity to complete plan set reviews, final walkthrough inspections, and most importantly, the maintenance and the proper function, ensuring the proper functioning of these signs um, is, is what this additional person would, uh, will allow the team to do. The second um, initiative for, for streets, traffic signs and markings, the maintenance of those, and, and these are your your signs installed on the right of way, anywhere from speed limits to um, school crossing signs, as well as the markings on the road. Bike lanes, crosswalks, all of those. As you may know, a few years ago, streets doubled their maintenance capacity for road, uh, road surface treatments, not for uh, maintenance of signs and markings. So every time that there is a surface treatment, there is an opportunity to add a bike lane, for example, which requires paint, and in the future requires the maintenance and inspection of that paint. Um, so a few years ago, they doubled in capacity for, for road surface treatments without adding the capacity on the other end, which is signs and markings. So we are requesting two FTEs to catch up on that um, maintenance, allowing us to stick to the annual inspection and maintenance of crosswalks and uh, safety regulatory signs on the roadway. That is the last of our initiatives. Next slide, please. And we'll be happy to answer any questions that you, you may have. Council Chair, thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Council, any questions? I have a council member model quick question, Jorge. Thanks for the presentation. Does um, public services maintain street markings within public parks, or does that fall under the public lands department? The maintenance of the parking lot it itself will fall under them, but the enforcement of, of uh, the regulations that they, they place on the parking lot will be us. So public lands has their own striping crews that are maintaining surfaces within them or consult with things do we it's it's parks okay thank you yes i'll save my question for them then yeah. 
Councilmember Fowler. Hello. I have a couple of questions. Um, one that Alejandro and I were just, or Councilmember Bui and I were just talking about, um, and I hope that I gave him the right information, so if not, then you guys can correct me, but um, the impact fees and fleet, and um, I know that we have, so, f and again, Jen may, somebody may correct me, or Ben Ludke if he's here, but um, we were talking about fire trucks and how um, he was asking who buys these, and fleet's sort of in charge of all of that, but we can use impact fees impact fees for fire apparatus, but we have to update the impact fee plan, which I've been asking for an update for three years. And so I'm wondering where that updated plan for police fire, we updated parks, police fire, and who am I missing? Who's our fourth one? Transportation. Um, so I don't know if there's any information on an updated impact fee plan. When you say impact fee, are you referring to um, funding our future? No, impact fees itself. Okay, I, I don't have that information, but fleet is coming later today, and oh, good, I'll have I'll an answer fleet. for you. I mean, and it all might sort of under one yeah. department-ish, unless yeah. we. I think um, we can ask that of the mayor's office because they'd have the view across all all entities. So we could just have that as a follow-up. That might be a Lisa Schaefer question. Yeah, or a Rachel, or a Rachel. afterwards. We'll add it to our I'm not putting you on the spot right now. Okay. Thanks. Okay. As for uh, road reconstruction, um, we're in the last little bit of, of the projects that were listed, and we are in the process of updating that. So, okay. But that's in road reconstruction. Thank you, Matt. And then the other question I had is random right now, but it's regarding Fisher Mansion. And the, was it 48,000 for the maintenance of that? I thought that Fisher Mansion was one of the projects that was in a proposed bond, and I also thought that we had a briefing on it from Parks. And so how many asks for Fisher Mansion are we doing? Yeah, this is, this is the carriage house, which is a detached uh, portion of the, the, the actual it's mansion. And the actual mansion property. still needs, needs uh, some, some love. So is the, if we're programming it through whom? Which division through Parks? So Parks, parks is gonna program it. Mm -hmm. um, you, public Services is going to maintain it? it? Being an occupied facility by, by a city program, facilities will, will be responsible for the maintenance. Okay. And so this is the first time it's activated, and so maintenance will be needed. Uh, for, for that facility. And so will continuing maintenance come out of the proposed fifth bucket of funding our future? That is, is, is completely going to parks, that, that fifth bucket. If it's, parks it's is programming it, then I think these are some questions that I feel like I'm just, it's confusing right. to have um, a new division and then have uh, the sort of lots of different buckets that this is going to, not that it may not be needed. Right. Um, but so I, yeah, I have maybe maybe maybe, maybe I need a flow chart. A little bit. There there are there are two sets of, oh, they, they are all city owned assets and city owned buildings. There are two inventories, one uh, on their parks um, and one on their facilities. And so the the carriage house is under the facilities inventory, portfolio of, of providing maintenance. But there are certain uh, uh, facilities within the parks that are, fall completely under uh, parks purview. And so it, maybe it will be helpful to define those, those two. And, and we have a good inventory of, of what facilities is, is, is in charge of. Um, and I don't want to speak for, for parks. They are coming right after us. Yeah, and, and I guess maybe, and I can talk about this offline, maybe JP, you and I can, and Jorge, we can talk about this, of just like, what's that definition of an asset that should only fall under facilities and the definition of an asset that falls under parks? Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, I think one of the things that since I've been on the council, we've been trying to do in a lot of different areas, and as we look at funding ERP and all these different things, is streamlining mm -hmm. instead of then coming and saying, well, we need money from this bucket to do this thing because only this department does that, but we need money from this other bucket because even though these are really related and they're in fact the same thing, right. this department has to do this. And so I don't, maybe I, that's a future conversation not for you know this limited time that we have in budget season, mm -hmm. um, but it is something I'm interested in. And I could work if you like, Council Member Fowler. I could uh, speak with Jorge and JP and, and see how far we can get toward a response during the budget season. Council Member Pui. Mr. Chair, um, so a few questions that um, just rise up by reading uh, the documents sent mm -hmm. was one was your fuel um, allocation it stays the same from the last couple from the last year to this one and uh, I mean no one that has filled out a tank lately no you know right believes on. that it, that's the same so will that uh, is that uh, accurate? Um, you know, is that calculation accurate considering the cost of fuel has gone up quite significantly and who knows if it's going to keep on going up? Um, right. So we, there, there are two things. Uh, the first one is, is for the last few years, an advantage of having uh, a fleet on their public services is keeping up with, with the rising the, the updated cost of fuel, right? And every time there is a recommendation for adjusting that, uh, we have done it. Keeping up with, with the projections is one of them. Secondly, we're incorporating more uh, EVs in the last um, two or three years, so much that the compliance division is now 75% fully electric. Oh, wow. And so th there are two things that, that help to, to maintain that, uh, not, not in a bigger ask. When we go into the fleet um, uh, presentation, we'll give you a rough idea of how much that, that needs to be adjusted. But uh, I'll leave that for the for the Okay, I, what next. I just wanna prevent uh, from learning from other council members here is mm -hmm. uh, minimize the budget, uh, uh, you know, budget amendments needed uh, later Absolutely. on Absolutely. year. So make sure that we are uh, keeping keeping on it. Um, right. So uh, another thing that uh, to team up with something that was mentioned here by Councilmember Fowler uh, and traffic signs, maintenance, uh, and many of these capital improvements that we're doing in the city. You know, this gigantic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, amazing work that we're doing in the city. Uh, but at the same time, we have Can who oversees. Uh, traffic mitigation, you know, and right. and those two things, this uh, seem to me disjointed uh, because they are doing things over there. Like, I feel like I'm talking, I'm asking both departments sometimes the same thing, and uh, I'm confused about that. Um, uh, it feels to me that, and I'm not sure if this is wrong, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, but it just is confusing to me, and I can imagine it's confusing for the public, but uh, this is one of the you know, most important request we're getting these days is making sure that our streets are safe and uh, we are planning uh, walkable uh, communities and that we are doing um, our best job on, on making sure that our, our streets are, you know, our crosswalks are safe and I cannot even tell you how much I heard about this. So I, I'm a little confused about how to, how to make this happen and, and if there is a group a team between the two departments that gets together often and says, okay, let's talk about this mm -hmm. uh, project. Uh, you know, and last week we had a meeting. Uh, Rachel, you know, was great, grateful to attend. Uh, you know, a few neighbors organized a quick meeting about, you know, speeding in, in a few neighborhoods in Glendale. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know, and I had some uh, a member of CAN came in to the meeting, but maybe it would have been as appropriate for your department to also come in. Um, so that's something that I'm still right. wrapping my head around. I, I, and I'm happy to provide a little bit of clarification. And JP, just correct me if I'm wrong, but that before, before um, traffic mitigation measure is established, we need uh, the transportation division to assess that need, right? And determine whether or not a sign, a speed bump, um, a flashing light, anything goes into place. And so once they determine that, and, and they uh, either contract that out, installing the, the sign, uh, speed bump, whatever it is, whatever measure goes in, in place, 
then it falls into us for the maintenance. Uh, streets does not, they, whereas they can install it, they don't determine where they are going to be installed. Uh, we work with them collaboratively um, to, to um, when, when the workload allows it, to install it ourselves in streets or to contract it out. But again, uh, it, it seems like they overlap, but actually is, is they connect in, in, in the process. Transportation assesses, determines where the, this, uh, these devices are going to be installed, and then uh, public services will pick it up from there you know, for, for maintenance, for, for proper functioning as well. So yeah, it, it is just part of the process. OK, I, I, okay mm -hmm. that's very useful to me. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, so CIP, and I, mentioned, I saw the CIP, uh, the capital improvements fall mm -hmm. within your department. Is that correct or not? We are the recipients of, of what, whatever is allocated for projects, right? So if, if a constituent application is to reconstruct a road, right, uh, council will allocate a certain amount of money for that. We are the recipients, and they, uh, we, we are charged with implementing that project, right? Okay. So, and to that, how long, how far are we to being caught up with funded projects? That's a great question, and I understand how it can be confusing between transportation, engineering, and streets, but if you think of it as, as the, the traffic and the planning folks and transportation, engineering or the builders and then streets being the maintainers i think that's where you want to route things um so as far as we we can get back to you on on where we're at as far as being caught up we've got the bond projects and like we mentioned that we're halfway through the the funding our future bond um and then we've got our non-right-of-way projects so it depends on what you mean by caught up yep. but we had a schedule for, for the bond so we're on track with and, and on schedule for the bond projects. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a backlog of our other places projects and CIP projects that may be parks projects, construction for parks projects, or maybe uh, right of way or local streets or signs or whatever it might be. Yeah. It's, um, it's, a, it's an ongoing process to get all of those through the pipeline. I, I just want to just fi to finish this. Uh, I think this is important for me to know, uh, you know, because the, especially with CIP, uh, because those are originated by neighbors, and you know we set the expectation. They get the thumbs up, you know, once in a while they get a thumbs up, but then they have to wait two, three years for it to happen, maybe even longer, and that is very disappointing. Right. Uh, so I w if we are going to discuss increases on, on the department, I want to discuss what it will take for you to, uh, to get a little more caught up on this. So that is very important to me. So, w yeah, there, and there is one, one initiative in our um, request in this budget is, is to add a senior project manager, which will add capacity to manage uh, these projects. Now, in, in the past, adding more people for, for a temporary influx of money is not, is not a good way to go, right? Because that money will, will dry out and then you have the people without the projects. So we are seeing a, a, a steady uh, um, amount of money being put on CIP, which allows us to say, let's, let's go to the next step, add more capacity to it. And then we are exploring as well uh, with these bond projects, instead of clogging the, the pipeline that we currently have um, a, a slowdown on it, to, to cons uh, contract out the, the project management of, of those uh, new projects so they don't delay even more what we currently have in the queue, right? Now, one of the biggest um, contributors to, to slowing down on the projects is when, when the CIP project is, is, is uh, the funding is allocated. We are allocating funding for a project that may or may not have all the design and the latest estimate in, in, in their submission, right? So we do the design, and then uh, it's, it's very, very easy to happen, especially now in, this, in these conditions, to have a bid that comes 30% higher. So we need to revisit that, uh, value some parts out, see, see what we can do to, to keep it on their budget, and that just delays. Every time a, a, a bid is put out, we need to wait for the responses. So it just, just adds to the timeline. But uh, yeah, one of them is capacity, and the other one is the market conditions as well. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Councilmember Fowler. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm on, I'm clear on the the sort of division of labor between on the carriage house issue between parks that you guys are the facilities, they're the programming. Um, but can you remind me, I remember um, a couple years ago during the Biskupski administration that the council made a big allocation for um, updating the carriage house to get it into a nature center or a field office or a kayak reserve. And um, what is the status? So I thought the carriage house was sort of taken care of, and now we were focusing on the mansion. Um, can you clarify like where we are on the carriage house then, and if more money is needed for the carriage house because of inflation, or if we're just talking about improvements to the mansion and the rest of the property? This is just pure maintenance. Oh, okay. Pure maintenance. You will have a bill every month for uh, the alarm system, the fire detection system. So all of those is the, the ongoing maintenance. This this doesn't include any improvements. Uh, it is, you know, it, oh. checking your filters for for uh, furnace, AC, okay. all of that ongoing maintenance. Now that people are occupying that building, right? Um, it's. But were the improvements that we funded made? Are, are those completed? I don't know if I can yes. invite. It looks uh, like yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. Just uh, checking. Just checking. Um, and then I appreciate the. Um, the questions that um, Councilmember Pui was asking about um, the project managers, but um, for the people that might be listening at home, and so that I can also explain to questions to um, uh, res questions that I get from residents, um, I think they understand when we say we need to, um, you know, add staff to to do this because. Uh, you know, an engineer because we have more projects and they, you know, every time we make changes um, to the streets, those, you know, we have more projects happening, et cetera. But I think sometimes the public doesn't understand why we add to administrative positions like a deputy director. Mm -hmm. So can you um, help me, um, or how would you explain to residents that adding a deputy director um, translates to better services for them or for the city. Yeah, and I, I think it is two, two, two items in that response. The first one is span of control, right? The, the ability to, to follow up and provide the resources that each division uh, needs. The, the deputy director is a more accessible person to, to respond to those demands. Uh, secondly, Allowing to to provide planning and visioning for for those, so they don't fall into the day to day, you know, but more on how we can improve and make things more efficient. It is it is a function of the deputy director, right? Uh, I, I I love um, the willingness and confidence that that uh, Lorna. In, in her time with one deputy at that time myself uh, we were we were trying to do the best, but we deal in at, at least in public services with very diverse functions uh, when you see and we it's very hard for us to put them in the same uh, in the same visioning right because we had uh, parking enforcement and then on the other end we have uh, road reconstruction how can you possibly merge those and say, you know, it's the same visioning for, for these two very, very different uh, divisions. So concentrating those in, in, in two pillars, as, as, I've, as I uh, presented earlier today, with the capital investments side and the operations side, it provides uh, better support to those divisions. So. Okay. Um, is there like an example you could give maybe? An example of? Of like um, something that would, ha having a deputy director would, um, or an additional deputy director would help um, provide the vision or res what, what vision or resources they might provide that would help the, the, the groups that are under them. 
Yeah. So one easy one, uh -huh. and and this this might be very look very bureaucratic, but providing a, a, a resource where they can check in at least once a week. So each division director gets to meet with the deputy director at least once a week. If you if you add that to the to the department director, in addition to to the functions they are they are uh, responsible for, it is it just blows up your calendar, right? And then you have planning and coordination that needs to happen between these two very related uh, divisions in two different departments, transportation and, and streets. And then you have transportation and engineering, um, parks and facilities, because we take care of their, uh, some of their facilities, right? And so all of that is, 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 is a clear example of, of having a, a, an additional um, level of reporting okay. allows for a little bit more efficiency. Okay, I think I understand that. Cindy. Uh, oh. Can I add one to what you're, sure. your exa an example maybe? Um, one of the issues that we have had in the past is that there are so many division directors in some of the departments that it isn't possible to keep up on everything as, as uh, he was saying. Um, and what happens then is that the divisions um, are making decisions on their own and a lot of times they're inconsistent with policy that the council has set mm -hmm. and so the department head or a division or a um, deputy would know that and would be able to stop the decision and get it corrected before it gets implemented so um, something like someone not mentioning um, that they're not going to be able to water this was several years ago, but water the parks um, and the grass was going to all go brown. That was not something that was brought to the council's attention. We found out a week after the budget was adopted. So that's the kind of thing that, that um, having the adequate level of management can help. Another thing was um, one year they decided as a cost savings they would not paint school crosswalks. And then we didn't find that out until um, until it was school time and there were no crosswalks painted. So those sort of things that are uh, policy priorities and things maybe the council has specifically discussed um, or s things that are important to whatever mayor is in office, getting those things translated into the operations is um, is difficult if you don't have that. So. That's just a couple that came to mind while you're talking. Thank you. Yeah, no, those are both helpful. Um, and then my my last one or two questions is about streets. Um, I see that there's a vacancy, and since I probably won't get another chance to ask you, like, what's the status of that? Are, are you interviewing? Are you hoping to fill the vacancy soon? The the division director is is currently vacant. Right. Uh, we're hoping to, to fill that position. I tried to do it before uh, um, Lorna retired. You've been busy. I guess. <laughs> okay. So yeah, just, just, just taking, taking the time to find the right person. Um, that, I, I think that, that is the right answer. Okay. Um, the reason I ask is that um, and, um, we get a lot of questions about streets, or at least I do especially now it's pothole seasons, yeah. they're in full bloom. Um, and um, people, I think a lot of times, depending on where they live in the city, their perception is that, you remember the graph that we had during Funding Our Future that, that showed the streets were right. slowly going down and we were like, if we do all of these things and uh -huh. really quickly, we can make that turn to this. Mm -hmm. And we were like, yay. Um, I think a lot of residents feel like it's still trending down. Um, and so um, is there any information or any updates that I can give them? Um, and, and you don't have to answer this right now. Maybe this is something you could provide to our staff later. Um, uh, just to short sort of explain um, how we're doing in reversing uh, the curve or, or trending upward instead of downward. Right, because um, I know I know that's happening. I'm, but I'm looking for that sort of thing when I drive around the city. You know, I'm looking um, because I'm. It's on my mind. Um, but maybe they're not because maybe maybe the potholes in their neighborhood are still there mm -hmm. or something like that. 
Um, so if you can get us that information just so I can update my residents and say, no, you know, we are changing the tide on that, I would appreciate it. Right. And, and just, just very quickly, I, I would like to add Councilman Wharton that Streets has a vacancy for the division director. However, they are not leaderless. Right. There is an acting director, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy with, with the job. Uh, James Aguilar is, is, is doing so, right. uh, but yeah, if you if you have direct questions, we can we can resolve them. Um, now, in your question on on the um, road condition, uh, one one thing definitely we can provide to you some some numbers, but also um, very very soon we will have a full presentation on uh, the latest uh, survey oh, on on road condition. So that would be a good um, uh, indicator or. or how much in the last that the investment in the last few years has made an impact, uh, not only on the maintenance but also on the reconstruction. Oh, right? great! Thank you. Okay. And I didn't mean to suggest with those two questions that like not having a permanent deputy director was related <laughs> to these questions. I d just lumped them together because they're streets. Right. So thanks. Sounds good. Not a problem. Thank you, Councilmember Valmore. Right. Thank you. Um, so I have a. Three questions. I'm going to start with a rapid intervention team. It okay. Apparently, it's going to go to you guys, and you guys are going to manage. So what can the public expect, and what can we expect? Like, what am I looking at? How is it all going to work out? How many people? What are they going to do? How often? Where? OK. All of that. First, let's, uh, let's yes, this, this, uh, this rapid intervention team, as you may remember, was, was funded uh, by council and budget amendment four of fiscal year 22. And um, it is operating now. Uh, they are undergoing training. They are setting up all the equipment that they need. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it will be housed within the, uh, the facilities division just because the, the maintenance that they provide in the business districts has a similar uh, function as to um, uh, refuse collection and, and uh, beautification of uh, public spaces. So it made sense to, to house them there. Now, what, did the, what does the public or what could the public expect from, from the, this, this team? First, we are operating on a pilot uh, capacity, right? We currently have two staff and one um, uh, lead that will, will be uh, coordinating with the heart team of the city, right? They coordinate, the heart team coordinates the large abatements of, of encampments. Uh, they are going to be able now to coordinate smaller uh, abatements with this team that would be deployed rapidly. It will then require the, the large coordination that, that a large abatement requires. With the, they still coordinate with uh, the health department, the county health department, and now they're going to have an in-house resource to, to deploy and say, we close this, this a small encampment. Now it's time to, to pick up any leftover um, um, items that were, were left there. So they are going to, to um, be able to, to clean up um, in a more, more um, rapid fashion. Okay, so say. will they, so basically what you're saying is like this will be scheduled and it won't be like the public can call and a number and say, hey, there's a lot of debris here, including human feces and used needles. Can somebody come clean up? Are, are you the guys to call? Is this the group? It is the hard team that, that receives a call, uh, schedules and coordinates okay. where to deploy these resources. So okay. w we will then be taking the calls directly. There is already a system in place, right, that uh, uh, where, where the public can report um, encampments. Um, but yeah, but, I guess. yeah, but it's not the encampments. It's not, uh, you know, sometimes people just sleep overnight or have been there for a couple of days, maybe it's just right. one yes. or two, and then they leave a lot of debris, and that's where... That's what I'm asking. If this group is going to take care of those smaller, smaller things, yes, yes. So just heart the can coordination go the comes through whenever, through heart. Yes. So okay. So somebody will call through heart. Heart talks to you. Heart Nipple. heart goes and does the big abatement or medium, and then the rapid intervention team goes to outside here on the street and mm -hmm. takes care of things. Yes. Okay. And, awesome. And I think you could just use it. Uh, mobile app also to yeah uh, i know there's a mobile app but i know also that i have a lot of constituency call me saying hey i i put this five days ago and it didn't happen so i it's sad that i cannot you know say go here like advertise it as much as i want to because it's just not happening sorry so but thank you um three the business district 
Operation manager, manager, operations, uh -huh. manager, sorry, my English, Spanish. Opera <laughs> operations manager, okay. Um, so on this one, like what exactly, uh, what exactly do they do? It's still a little, for me, it's uh, a little confusing. Are they just looking at plans that are happening downtown? Or are they assessing the damage that was done by a new building or are they talking to the to the cost? It says uh, uh, co uh, facilities for all business district customers and patrons. Can you tell me a little bit more about that position? What do they do? And if I, if I'm a business owner downtown, can I call this guy? P perhaps not directly this this oh. person. However, huh. however, <laughs> we we are we are up to building that relationship with them because, uh, as I mentioned, the current business district areas, Sugar House and downtown, are seeing a lot of construction, right? Every time uh, a, a construction project closes the sidewalk and they do something to the sidewalk, we are responsible for it, to put it back into the, the shape it was. So currently we don't have a manager for that, for that okay. group. We have a group of people that they, care, they take care of, of the cleaning, of the, of the beautification of those areas, but we don't have that point contact with those business owners to say, hey, uh, somebody broke a brick here. Uh, can you schedule something to replace it? Okay, so that person, that. that manager, will be able to to coordinate that and schedule it for that team. Okay. Now, um, in addition to to what we are currently doing in the business district, that person is also coordinating and, and managing the rapid intervention team. This is a new addition to that group. Okay. All right. So okay. And mm -hmm. then that okay. Good. I didn't know we didn't have that. Can I? Um, and then sorry, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you with a quick clarifying question while yeah. we're on the topic? Mm -hmm. So is the team that that Councilmember Valmoros is asking about is that the clean team or is this in addition to the clean team? Like the clean team we used to have would, would go around and do the do the cleanups. Okay, um, and I think you're, you're, yes, you're talking services. about the, the, the uh, yes, waste and recycling has a, has a, uh, a team that, that will schedule those. I, I guess in the past we're called neighborhood clean day or clean up day. Is, is that no. no? No, I thought that we had before what was called a clean team that was that was kind of like what Advantage Services was doing. Uh, okay. Because we also had the green team <laughs> under sustainability. This was there are two Among teams. Us. This is a different team. <laughs> um, and this one I thought was doing the type of cleanup. That, that Council Member Valdemoros is asking and that was, was later supplemented by Advantage Services. I think maybe the graffiti team was part of them. Ooh, um, this, yeah, this is, this is a long time I, back, but what, what I know it, it, is, it is in current existence is, is with waste and recycling, they have, they, they, they take care of what is called the illegal dumping, right? If there is something in the street that needs, uh, needs to be cleared, they will do it. Anything in, collection, in connection with the um, uh, with people experiencing homelessness in the city, in the whole city, um, we we coordinate with heart to deploy these resources. This this team particularly. So it is it is more specifically in connection with with that response. So the the heart team was limited to the larger abatements because they have a contract with advantage services those are the most impactful ones but also the, the smaller ones uh were, were in a queue for for uh longer than than needed so now with the addition of this in-house resource they are able to deploy them but okay. yeah th that clean team i, I don't i don't, I don't know, know where that they, went know, maybe it just existed in my mind thank you i'm no, sorry to it existed <laughs> Okay. It existed. <laughs> it existed. Well, uh -huh. the last question: um, Facilities, or you guys, your group paints the curves as well, like the like the curves. Sometimes you know the curves are cracking. There's cracking paint. There, there are there are certain curves in 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 this business district that are uh, painted. Yes. Okay. So, but you your team is in charge of that. Yes. Okay. So you know, and this is maybe not policy, or I don't know if it's policy, but. I'm a hands-on person, so sometimes when I drive around, I'm like, I'm just gonna go buy a paint of, you know, bucket of paint and a brush, and I'm just gonna call my husband and the kids, and we're just gonna go do this, because it seems to me an easy thing. Obviously, I'm not in your business, right. so, but is there a chance, or or maybe you guys think about? I'm, Salt Lake City or Utah is known for volunteers. Mm -hmm. Like volunteers are readily available to do community projects. 
right? So maybe this is something that, these are low hanging fruits that the community could actually go and do it over a weekend, you know, Saturday morning. Right. And if that's something that it will alleviate your, your job or your, you know, please think about that and let us know because I'm happy to coordinate some of those groups and I'm sure there's a lot of volunteers out there that would love to do that, including myself, especially downtown, okay? <laughs> All right, Certainly. thank we, we appreciate it. All right, thank you. That's my Fowler. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of quick questions and then probably a comment that isn't fair that it's you in the hot seat with me saying this because you just got into that position. So, But the first off, um, we were talking about the, si the signs and bond and the, the timeline of the bond projects. At some point in time, again, Chris and I were just talking that now we feel old because we're the oldest on the council, but... Um, I thought that we had that information online and available, so if somebody, what that timeline is, we still have that up somewhere in the world of the internets, right? Yes. Yeah, it's still, it's still available okay. on uh, the My Street section. Yeah. What was that? I don't think it's clear to the rest of us what you're answering. Okay. So there is, there is a, a website that, um, keeps track of those projects. And the, the list of projects that are upcoming will be presented to you. It has been updated. Oh, but, great, yes. perfect. Thank but the you. current projects are, are on My Street, the My Street website. I'm not sure okay, what the URL that's... is, but if you Google My Street SLC, you'll find it. Right. Just to um, a couple of my co-council members, I think it, we can, you know, we all have newsletters and things like that. And so remembering that that was there, hmm. Reminding others that that's there is important, I think. And then we got into a, lot, a, a bit of a discussion on CIP, and CIP is coming up later. It's mm -hmm. the next big thing. Um, and I was thinking about something that uh, Council Member Pui said of maybe it would be helpful if each of the departments, if I could request this, I know that it's probably extra work and I don't mean to do that, mm -hmm. um, but kind of parse out the community um, initiated or the constituent initiated projects and, and an update on where those are okay. and the department initiated projects and an update of where those are that may be helpful for um, as we start to get into CIP budget. I mean, I can off the top of my head think of funding a traffic calming project mm -hmm. three years ago and that there, it still hasn't been done. And so when we get to CIP, especially as it comes to those constituent and like Liberty Park basketball courts and things. When it comes to those applications or those projects that were initiated, initiated by community members and we're in CIP discussions, we get lots of questions. And um, it's, I think would be helpful if we know where, in the, where they're at. And then finally, um, just this conversation about the rapid intervention team kind of and I, I appreciate Cindy talking about, and the question that Council Member Wharton mentioned of the need for a deputy director. And, but this reminds me of a conversation that we had last year during budget season of getting too top heavy mm -hmm. and having a budget that is incredibly top heavy when we have projects that aren't being done. And then we get told by departments that they're not being done because we don't have people to do the work. And we probably could pay people to do the work more people to do the work than what we pay somebody to manage the work that isn't being done because we can't pay people to do the work, right? And while there is certainly um, good reason to have that management and to understand the coordination between things, the conversation then comes to, uh, I, I think, a very good example is what we just had. We have the rapid intervention team, we have the heart team, and then if you add in the, the park rangers, which I've mentioned a couple of times, I am very excited about all of the different response models. Right. But now we have the rapid intervention team that has to coordinate with the heart team. And I mean, the, what I'm hearing is that we need a management person to make sure that that coordination happens instead of having all of this streamlined. So you have one management person or two up here that are actually handling all of these alternative response models. I mean, some of them certainly can't. The fire department, the police department, those are different, right? But with these type of um, intervention teams and the heart team and the park ranger team, we're, we're, it so seems to me like we're creating something that is incredibly top heavy and we're not having 
the actual response that we need for the community. Again, going to Councilmember Valdemoris' point, when we do have an app, for me, when I put in something in the app, it works great. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they know it's me, <laughs> me. Uh, I don't know. But we do, I also have constituents that do something and five, six, seven days later, it's still there and we still have a complaint and I say, but the app is great. And they say, no, it's not. And, and so then we, I come back and it's all about this coordination and not having the people to do the work. And so I feel a little bit that if we're going to continue asking for top heavy management, then we have to be responsible and accountable to actually seeing results with that management. And that is not what I'm seeing. Right. And instead, what I'm seeing is now we need more people to coordinate when in reality what we need is somebody to, a person to call heart and say, hey, we need some help. And that person say, all right, I've assessed the situation and the situation needs VOA, and I have a relationship with VOA, so I'll call VOA, mm -hmm. and the situation needs the clean team or the green team or the <laughs> rapid intervention team or the park ranger team to go out there. And it turns out I work in the same city as they do, so I'll call one of them mm -hmm. and they'll go over there. It, it just, it doesn't seem quite as streamlined as we could make it. And I know that we're kind of building the plane as we're flying it, so totally understand that. Um, but I, it, it feels like a similar conversation that we had last year. And Jorge, again, I said, yeah. <laughs> this is not directed at you. You just happen to be sitting there right now. Um, but we're, we're getting all of this, and I'm wondering where, where we're getting the funding for the, to actual do, actually do the work. Oh, Council Member Fowler, and I wanted to add to that, because we also have the, we have an ask for more um, downtown ambassadors to expand to, salt, to the rest of the, the city. So that's where also, where do they come from? Like, where's the, the streamlining? Do they call hard? Do they call rapid intervention? Do they call the police? Like, what's happening? You know, and so I agree with you. I think we need, uh, as we're doing this, I think we could do more streamlining here with all of the resources that now we have. I just want to amplify and give a hearty amen to this and say it, we're at an awkward growth stage where we do need both and, both the people doing the work and the accountability that comes from the oversight of these managers and our budget is not big boy enough to probably accommodate all of those things, but amen, Amy. We have to, we have, to have the outcomes that our constituents see. It's, it's non-negotiable at this point. Chief of Staff, Rachel. Thank you, Council Chair, and um, your, your comments are well taken on, on all sides, but because um, public services is only a piece of this puzzle here, as you pointed out, I just wanted to address the disparate groups here and also just um, confirm that those are, those are actually kind of disparate functions that we are working hard to coordinate. So just to remind um, us all, since it's been several months since we talked about the birth of the rapid intervention team, this was really intended to you know, provide all of our residents a quicker resolution to some of the increased uh, effects of unsheltered um, camping in our streets. So part of it is, you know, can be dealt with by Advantage Services, but part of that you know, does, the fact that we are leaning on an outside agency that we contract with does lead to a lag time and a certain amount of lack of control that we have to address problems that we see right away. So, and I just also want to clarify that the clean team is Advantage Services. So that's, those, those things are one and the same. It's not, a, it's not a fully separate thing. So the rapid intervention team is intended to give us more control so we can have quicker resolution, but you know, leading with the idea that we really aren't just out to you know, clean up the streets without trying to also connect people to services. That's the idea of trying to coordinate that team under heart. So there is a certain amount of coordination that does come with, with a person in heart, but it will be you know, somebody who can ensure that it isn't just us out cleaning up garbage, it is us also making sure that the people who are associated with you know, the stuff on the street are getting the services and that connection that they need. So we are trying to be lean here, we are trying to be coordinated, um, but appreciate you know, your feedback and all your feedback to be mindful that you know, we're not just like top loading and, and not talking to one another about these services. 
And, and I appreciate that, Rachel, but I, I understand the different functions of everything. I, I completely understand why the rapid intervention team happened and the difference between heart and the coordination thereof. What I'm saying is that are we looking at, is this in the right place, right? Do we need to have three different deputies? Do we need to have three different departments? Do we need to have three different divisions to coordinate all of this? And maybe, maybe we do. I, like I said, I acknowledge that we are flying this plane as we're building it. But at the same time, the, I think that as we're flying the plane, we need to be looking at, is this in the right department? Is there a different way to put this? If we're gonna put everything in under heart where we kind of grow that as its own thing because we know we're utilizing them so much for to address the, the our communities experiencing homelessness. I don't have the answers to that, but what I'm seeing is that in the last two budgets, we keep asking for more deputies and more management, and I'm not sure that we're seeing the same, the, the results. We see a lot of results, and I just want to make sure that we're continuing to see all of the results that having more of that management team is giving us while also then having people come and say, departments come and say, yeah, we couldn't get to that because we don't have the workers to do it. And that there is a balance there. And I'm, I just want to point out that I, I'm hoping that as we continue to look at our budgets in future years, as mentioned, you know, I think the approach of this administration was to look at a three-year sort of idea of a budget, that that is also as part of what we're looking at. Thank Mr. you very much. Go. Just yes. One, one yeah. just quick, thank you very much. Um, I don't necessarily think we're flying the plane as we build it or build it as we fly it, whichever way that goes, sorry. I, th I actually think we, we have thought about this um, and we have thought about where these programs should be placed. It's not something that you know, we're, we're trying to just invent. Um, and I, I don't think we're adding a second deputy or a new deputy to public services, correct? We just have in the past have had two deputies, is that right, Jorge? So we're not trying to just continually add, I mean, we again, we are trying to be mindful of, of what we're adding here. Thank you. And thank you very much. I, I love the discussion and you bring up some very valid points and it's always business and government and any institution, right? How many more managers do I need and how many more uh, laborers do I need? So it's a it's a fine line and I, and I applaud the discussion and I think we always have to be mindful of that discussion and mindful of our, our expenses. I want to, I have a couple questions on just uh, expenses overall. Um, in the staff report, it talks about the consolidated fee schedule and we're not collecting any interviews for special events sweeping, parade routing, striping, displaced parking. Is there a, is there a uh, proposal or a thought about adding to the consolidated fee schedule for cleanup activities? I know it's probably not a very big line item on our budget, mm -hmm. but it's still, a thousand little cuts, you know, could, could help us out there. So did, unless you have a quick answer, just we want to think we about We have that. the cost associated with all of those activities and we can provide it. So um, we, we decide okay. collectively to, to collect them. But yeah, I think it is, it is more of a, um, a policy decision if we are going to charge uh, event organizers those, those fees as yeah, well. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to look into looking at that. Uh, on the whole idea about uh, the maintenance side of the house, I know our goal for s street repair or maintenance is 155 lane miles, right? And I love the discussion on concrete versus asphalt. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great discussion. And I get the understanding that concrete over the long term is less expensive uh, on the long term. Now, it's probably also more viable to do a concrete on a street that has 10,000 or 100,000 cars a day than a, car, a street that does 10 cars a day. So are you looking at that per lane mile? Uh, and in, in the short term, is, is it quicker to put in a concrete street or a, uh, asphalt street uh, if you're having to do the whole, you know, re resurface everything? And just when we're doing that, is it different teams that do the concrete compared to the asphalt? Because I know there's different equipment there. And do we have enough, uh, if we had additional street, either concrete guys or asphalt guys, teams to do that, how much would it, how many additional people would we need to do 200 miles a day, or 200 miles, lane miles a year? And I'm asking a lot of questions here that I'm not, I'm not looking for answers right now. Okay. And is the, um, can you do concrete in the winter? I, I don't know. Like is, is concrete only six months or is it, is it eight months or is it 10 months, 12? What's 12? All year. All year? All year. So 
boy, you know, when you have a, a five-month asphalt window, a 12-month concrete window, mm -hmm. I look at my expense going, boy, my neighborhood would really like a new street and not have to wait 15 years to get it. And if it was concrete, I'll take it. So just questions to ask because mm -hmm. the idea that our st street repair and our bond is a big deal and the, is it going down, is it going up? These are things that I think we need to address with our, with our budget. And I, I think a lot more people would be m more willing to pay a little a few dollars mm -hmm. to have their street without the potholes. So uh, let's have a f further discussion on those items and maybe in, in the, as unresolved. And last, uh, a couple more, sorry. Hawk, hawk lights. Uh, those, those are part of CIP, right? When if you d add additional hawk lights, do those come through the CIP street calming initiatives? It's okay. You can. So that's an unresolved yes. question. Yes, there is there is a, um, a CIP ask by the transportation division on um, traffic calming and um, safety as well. So they they would uh, again they will look at and, and assess where they they are gotten the more complaints. Where where does it make sense to install them? Once they once they install them, they they hand off the maintenance responsibility to us. So those. But the budget for those come out of the CIP. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. That was my, that was my roundabout way to ask my own question. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> last last thing. I drive an electric vehicle. I I enjoy driving my electric vehicle. I think it's the right thing to do, but I also have the privilege that I get to charge for free in different places. And we the city, uh, we have a three hundred thousand dollar, two hundred fifty thousand dollar budget, partially for maintenance of the chargers and partially for the electricity. Uh, has there been discussion ideas on that? Maybe it's a policy vice a budget side of the question on if we were to um, change that to charging for the electric vehicle use. Is that is that the only budget coming out of your budget or is it coming out of other budgets for that? So the, the, the <laughs> The way it works, uh, and, and this is this is part of those those collaborations with with other departments. Uh, the the plan is to transition the maintenance of those charging stations to public services. Right? We take care of assets on the right of way, and and the charging stations are assets in, that the city owns. Uh, so it does make sense to do that. Uh, but currently, on their sustainability, they have a, a, a they have the budget to to maintain those, and it's through a contractor, right? So uh, at what I know is, is that at some point, as an incentive to those uh, like yourself and myself, Council Chair, that uh, drive electric vehicles, to come to the city is, is to, to have free charging. Um, it, 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 we have uh, the ability to calculate the cost of, of the power and, and, and include the maintenance to, to determine a potential fee. Um, but that, that would be, again, a, a policy discussion, whether or not the, the, the city wants to to start charging and recoup some of that. Um, right, and I realize it's more on the policy side of the house. I'm just noticing that we're looking at a, a big budget and I'm just trying to look at different right. line items uh, across the board. Because mm -hmm. I drive it and I think electric vehicles are, are a nice added a right. bonus for the city in our air quality and our traffic. So uh, I appreciate that, but I think we need to have that maybe a policy discussion. Council, we're, we're we're uh, way over time here, but these were wonderful questions, and I wanted to go over time because we had a lot of good questions, a good discussion. So, there's no further questions. We're going to the next department. Thank you very much, Thank you. Laurie, Very much, appreciate it. Mr. Chair, um, council members can get their questions to Allison or to your liaison or Jennifer or me, as you think of them after this. So, keep sending the oh. Uh, if you ha think of other questions, get them to the analyst, which is Allison in this case, or Jennifer, one of us, uh, your liaison even, just keep sending us questions. All right, we're moving on to item number three, the 2022-23 uh, budget, Department of Public Lands. Allison's still here at the table. We got uh, Kristen Riker, the, the director, We Greg, and Tyler, I saw Tyler, he's just in the, he'll hang back there if he, we need him. And Carmen, gotcha. Allison? Thank you, yours. Mr. Chair. So moving on to department, uh, 
the Department of Public Lands. I haven't spoken for a while, so I'm out of practice. Um, Want to note here, there's an enterprise fund in Department of, of Public Lands, which is the Gulf Fund. Um, I believe Jennifer will be doing that briefing later today, or if not, sometime soon. Um, the general fund budget for the Public Lands Department, it will reach nearly $24.2 million. Um, this will be spread over the five divisions of public lands. Um, trying to be brief. Uh, yes, again, higher personal services costs is the main driver of, of the budget increase, the proposed budget increase. And parks and trails and natural lands are the divisions that would receive the, the lion's share of the increases. In terms of staffing levels, um, as you know, the park rangers, 18 park rangers were added in Budget Amendment 4, which was approved by the council several months ago, and the budget approves two additional rangers to be added to this group. Um, in total, there would be eight new FTEs in public lands. And, oh, you might, yes, you, you might be aware of the staff vacancies, um, both in full-time staff and seasonal staff, and this is a an issue that is ongoing and there is a budget amount to um, intended to raise those salaries to help um, address that problem. I think Krista may have some other uh, corrections to add as she goes, but uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Allison. Um, thank you, Council. Thank you, Chair, for having us today. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be sitting here today with Greg Evans. Um, he's our finance manager. That position was funded last year, and he's been a great partner helping to develop this budget. Um, I also would um, like equally humbled and appreciative of our deputy directors and division directors who are sitting here behind me. Um, it is um, really their daily relentless efforts that make the magic happen in public lands, so thanks to them. Um, I'd also like to thank all those who are not here um, for working through the many challenges of the past few years that we've had in um, public lands and in our city. We have an outstanding group of individuals at public lands that work hard, they laugh together, and they appreciate each other every day, and it's just awesome to work with this group. I'd also like to thank Mayor Mendenhall and her administration, uh, as well as the Budget Committee for their thoughtful consideration of our budget request and the continued support for our department and our employees. Lastly, I'd th like to thank Allison Rowland um, for her many staff reports and for being a great partner in sharing information with the public. I have a 20-minute um, presentation to overview the department and share our budget requests. And I'm happy to take comments and questions during or after the presentation. So next slide, please. Really quickly, just um, I think most of you know this, but public lands consists of four divisions, trails and natural lands, the parks division, golf, and urban forestry. Public lands also oversees city-sponsored special events, special events permitting, Additionally, Park oversees the Salt Lake City Cemetery, the Regional Athletic Complex, and graffiti removal. Next slide. Salt Lake City's parks, trails, and golf courses, urban forest, and other services are all central to Salt Lake City's identity and key ingredients to the quality of life that makes Salt Lake so special. Our mission is to enhance the livability of the urban environment and ensure that the resources under our management are carefully stewarded and equitably accessible for future generations. For Salt Lake City to remain among the most livable cities in the country, our department must find ways not to just maintain what we have, but also to advance our park system through stewardship that reflects our community to meet our growing needs. Next slide. When making budget requests, uh, project decisions, um, and creating policies, we look through the lens of stewardship, livability, and equity. These are our stated key values from Reimagine Nature Master Plan. Our stewardship goal to preserve, protect, maintain, improve, and enhance natural areas, parklands, and our urban forests goes beyond our public lands team. We want to also engage residents as stewards of Salt Lake City's public land system to help preserve the legacy for future generations. Our livability goal looks to our communities, <clears throat> public and private partners, 
and staff to work together to create a safe, active, and welcoming public green space that will be an inclusive and robust experience for all our residents. And lastly, it takes a variety of perspectives to create equitably accessed public spaces shaped by the character of our diverse communities. Salt Lake City Public Lands values citizen feedback and will continue to create opportunities to have an open and continuous dialogue with stakeholders regarding the quality of your parks, your programs, and your services. Next slide, please. This next slide is um, the new organizational chart for the department. It includes the park rangers and they're, they're situated in the middle because currently um, our deputy director over our, uh, operations, Carmen Bailey, who's sitting in the back here, um, has started up that program and she's overseeing it right now, but eventually it will sit um, under the deputy director of planning and trails and natural lands, which is Tyler Murdoch, also in our um, audience here. Once all of our park rangers are hired, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, we will have 178 FTEs in the department and that includes our golf folks. Um, and a large majority of those are sitting in our operations side. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to quickly share our annual report. If you didn't get one of these, I have some to share with you. Um, so we publish this every February, and um, next year we plan to change up how this looks to include progress updates for not only our performance measures that we put in the budget book, but also progress on our key actions and strategies in our master plan. A couple of highlights I'd like to share include the graffiti team removed 10,249 tags in the city, parks tracked 11,367 hours of lawn mowing, our special events team issued 331 special events, and that's up 48% from 2020. And the cemetery reports that there are 23,600 graves at the cemetery that have been sold, but not yet filled. The regional athletic complex had 8,841 reserved hours of play, and Visit Salt Lake estimated their economic impact to the city was $18 million in 2021. Next slide, please. Trails and Natural Lands initiated four biodiversity projects within natural areas and increased native plant propagation by 50%. These projects utilize native plant material collected from local sources and propagated in the Liberty Park greenhouse. They also constructed three new recreational boat ramps in 2020 on the Jordan River and completed a, oops, hello, and completed a paddle share program feasibility study with the National Park Service. Urban forestry manages 88,526 trees and 20,000 of those sit in our city parks. Salt Lake City's tree inventory database automatically calculates an estimated total yearly eco benefit. This year, the living trees in Salt Lake City are estimated to bring in $4.8 million in substantial quantifiable benefits to Salt Lake City to improve greenhouse gas, improve water quality, reduce energy consumption, improve air quality, and increase property values. Next slide, please. This graph is on page 24 of the official 2021 survey of Salt Lake City residents. It shows interesting trends when the city asked respondents how they would rank high priority issues. 71% of residents said that increasing investment in our current parks, trails, and open spaces is a high priority, with an average ranking of 5.6, or about second place in relative ranking of priorities by Salt Lake City residents. 66% of respondents say increasing safety in city parks, trails, and open spaces is a high priority. And 63% of respondents say increasing the amount of parks, trails, and open spaces is a high priority. And then in another question, I don't have the graph up there, 70% um, of residents reported going to a park or natural land at least once a month or more often, ranking it the highest of all outdoor open air activities in Salt Lake City. Next slide, please. 
The Department of Public Lands has separated each of our FY23 initiatives into one of the mayor's four priorities while overlapping with the draft Reimagine Nature Master Plan goals. The Master Plan goals are sustain, welcome, protect, grow, and connect. Next slide. Before Public Lands proposed any initiatives to the mayor, all our budget requests were reviewed and prioritized by the department's advisory board. The peanut board's prioritization and the department's priorities matched very closely. The initiatives that I am presenting today are mayor recommended initiatives in priority order of the peanut board. This first request is an increase in non-discretionary funding. Public lands has a large percentage, 36.23% of its budget dedicated to utilities, supplies, and outside services. So each year, operational expenses increase relative to inflation and contractual price increases. So this year, utilities are projected to increase by 332,000. Inflationary contractual increases are at 391,000. Fleet and fuel and maintenance is increasing by 162,938. Next slide, please. I have allergies and took some decongestants, making my, my everything dry. So <laughs> anyway, I'll keep going here. This second initiative is a request to increase the minimum salary uh, starting wage of part-time seasonal staff from $13.15 per hour to $17 per hour. The pie chart on the left shows how parks and trails and natural lands currently have the greatest average number of hired hourly seasonal staff over any department in Salt Lake City. We also have the lowest average wage among city departments for part-time employees. Recruiting seasonal hourly and hourly employees for groundskeeping type positions in, particu in particular is a, is a huge challenge. Um, these primarily seasonal positions, they used to be coveted and people would stay in them for years and then fill our full-time positions. But in the last five years, the working conditions have included things like cleaning restrooms at times sprayed with blood from needles um, uh, in the restrooms human waste throughout our parks and even in our irrigation boxes, the daily repairing of vandalized park amenities, and cleaning up litter and fire debris throughout our parks. Compounding the large number of staff and the increasingly difficult work conditions is our state's low unemployment rate and surging job growth. The financial impact to these wages is $554,707. Next slide, please. During Reimagine Nature public engagement, survey respondents rated Grow Our Urban Forest as the highest in overall importance and urgency, just above Put Our Environment First and Reimagine Neighborhood Parks Transformative Projects. This reinforces the community's desire for using sustainable principles in managing public lands, improving the environment with natural amenities. This third initiative falls within the mayor's Our our environment priority and public lands master plan sustain and protect goals. Tree planning and preservation is targeted at growth of the city's tree canopy by investing in new tree planting. We have been adding new trees to the city each year and in the last two years we have added an additional 1,000 trees on the west side. The urban forestry division recognizes that several of these 1,000 trees have not survived. <clears throat> Last year, the mortality rate was 15%. To lower that percentage in 2022, urban forestry is taking the following steps. They are looking for planting locations that already have demonstrated watering practices. So the park strip is already green and being watered. When a location in a community park strip is identified, urban forestry staff knock on a homeowner's door to understand their willingness to care for a park strip tree. Or if the homeowner is not home, they leave a door hanger um, with a watering guide to care for the tree and um, also instructions on how to opt out of the tree um, um, if they are not interested in a tree, so they either talk that through that or they have a door hanger to explain to the residents how to opt out of acquiring a tree. 
Also residents with new trees in their park strip are provided with a tree watering calendar that serves as a visual reminder to water the tree and highlights a watering schedule that will help the tree survive. And I brought some of those calendars here for you. Tony and his team did a really cool job of creating this calendar for when to water new trees. And um, I have some of these for you if you don't have one. Over the last two years, Urban Forestry Division has covered the cost of new tree planting with alternative funding sources, such as donations and tree mitigation fees. They've also covered some of those costs with volunteers and increased efficiencies. And over over years of future planning e efforts to accomplish new tree planting goals. That previous funding is now depleted and new tree planting locations need to be identified. If the city is to continue to plant 2,000 trees each year for the next two years, we will need an additional $150,000 annual, annually for the purchase of trees and equipment to continue that program. In the second bullet up there, you'll notice reallocation of funds the Urban Forestry Division is proposing to restructure tree health care, bringing it in-house as a cost-saving measure. This strategic change will save enough money to not only perform all tree health care, but also cover most of two additional full-time positions. With the savings, a new plant health care crew arborist will be responsible for insect and disease management in trees and supplement our other arborist duties in urban forestry. Some savings will also be used to elevate a part-time office tech to a full-time. This will give urban forestry more capacity to take and return calls from the public, in particular when we have a tree or wind, tree, wind or snow events. Urban forestry needs a dedicated person to answer phones so that our service coordinators and arborists can work in the field to clear out the tree branches. Lastly, we are requesting the funding of one forest area, uh, one area forester to oversee tree protection during city construction and bolster new tree planting opportunities throughout the city. With the Urban Forestry Division now planting twice as many trees and receiving approximately 5,000 customer requests for tree service each year, additional help is needed. You can see in the graph up here, um, the increase in requests for service on the orange line went from 4,040 in 2017 to 5,399. And on the gray line, total work, hour, work orders raised from 11,187 in 2017 to 13,594 in 2021. With the increase in service demands, the division cannot keep up with building development plan and permitting reviews and site inspections. These responsibilities are vital to preventing avoidable tree destruction and ensuring that the city new growth and development does not needlessly destroy our trees, but rather supports a growing tree canopy. This forester will work towards change of city code to make tree protection enforceable keep up with building development permit reviews and site inspections, elevate tree preservation standards, as well as identify new opportunities for tree planting in public spaces. And there is also some one-time costs associated with these new positions. Next slide, please. New properties and amenities. Each year, public lands acquires new property um, and or amenities through the CIP process. Budgeting for ongoing maintenance, supplies and staff of these new facilities is requested. Once the division understands the date, the project will be turned over to that division for maintenance. This year, we have a few sites that will need various amounts of funding and staffing to steward the new amenities. This initiative falls within the mayor's Our Growth Priority and Public Lands Master Plan Grow and Welcome Goals. The Parks Division is requesting an islands and medians seasonal staff crew. Over the past 10 years, the Parks Division has acquired the maintenance duties of islands and medians and greenways. The duties used to be separated by parks districts and the park technicians maintained the islands and medians within their district. 
but due to the complexity of maintaining small green spaces, sometimes in very heavily trafficked areas on public roads, and with the increasing number of islands and medians being landscaped, the division decided it would be safest and most efficient to separate a team of employees who are experienced in those types of sites. So currently that team has five employees to manage 80 parcels. They're requesting a seasonal staff crew, so boots on the ground, 4,786 hours to help spring startup and summer maintenance. The work is extremely time consuming due to the many locations and the mobilization efforts of packing everything up and unpacking everything and packing it up again every time you go to a different site. The second bullet under the um, parks is the new public trail along the Jordan River Trail and the Roots Disc Golf Course. This new public trail along the Jordan River at Rose Park Driving Range and along the par three disc golf course is currently open and requires ongoing maintenance um, for just gravel fill, signage maintenance, and weed control. The larger portion of this request is to improve the maintenance level of the Roots Disc Golf Course. Root, uh, disc golf has become a very popular sport in Salt Lake City, and, when, and it has seen a huge increase in the number of players and spectators. This seven acre site needs a higher level of maintenance to keep it at a, pli at a very playable level. We are requesting budget for one FTE, additional dedicated seasonal staffing, water, fertilizer, materials to better manage and maintain that site. Lastly, in the Trails and Natural Lands Division, we are requesting one full-time FTE and seasonal staff to provide educational and interpretive recreational programs and activities um, that will provide that will improve community awareness about the Jordan River, its wildlife history, and importance in our ecosystem. So this is the Fisher Carriage House position that we were talking about earlier. In 2019, the council approved funding, the renovation of the Fisher Carriage House to provide office space for public lands outreach and engagement staff, and to offer recreational programming along the Jordan River. This position will be based out of the Fisher Carriage House and is set to open in September. We're hoping to have a grand opening there. Next slide, please. The Board and Community Engagement FTE initiative fits into the Mayor's Our Community Priority. It addresses Master Plan Welcome and Connect goals. The Salt, Salt Lake City has seen a dramatic increase uh, in the use of our public spaces in the past two years as people seek refuge and respite from the pandemic. This increased awareness shines a huge spotlight on everything we do in public lands. We are seeing an escalation in all community groups and individuals wanting to be more involved in decisions that affect their local public parks and public lands. And we embrace that interest and uh, passion for our parks and trails and natural lands, but we're also getting overwhelmed <clears throat> by regular requests for information and adjustments to maintenance and capital improvements. At the same time, we lack a diversity of perspectives and input on our advisory board and in community engagement from lower income households, people of color, and West Side residents. So this request is for a position that will be charged with helping to recruit and retain our um, peanut board members from lower economic dris districts and the BIPOC community. They will also reach out to lower income communities to encourage their service on steering committees during project visioning and design. Recently, we started using funding from other cost centers to pay community members for their participation in visioning and design workshops so that Salt Lake City Public Lands projects have an opportunity to be the most relevant and culturally appropriate to the communities in which they serve. To achieve this res relevance, we are proposing compensation to the PINA board and community members for participation in our workshops. That amounts to approximately $20 per hour. We anticipate this will promote more econo economic diversity in these conversations, giving community members an opportunity to serve who might otherwise not be able to participate. This requested position would also help us better manage community requests for information and engagement and help us with board recruitment, diversity, communications, and management. Next slide, please. I'm getting through this. This last initiative is to request two additional park rangers um, to be a friendly presence in the city foothill trails and corresponding equipment and vehicles. Recent activity in the Foothill Trails has raised an urgency to add 
uh, a presence on our dirt trails to encourage proper use and to educate trail users on trail etiquette. The challenges in the foothills in part include unpermitted events, dog and human conflicts, vegetation and habitat destruction, user, conflict, uh, user group conflicts like hikers on designated trails or on designated biking trails or bikers on designated hiking trails, and then on ongoing destruction of, of property. Park rangers will strive to ensure that our parks, trails, and natural lands are safe and welcoming. However, they are not law enforcement or compliance officers. They will support positive use and promote voluntary compliance by providing educational and recreational services. Park rangers will direct visitors to various city departments to report animal control issues, vandalism, hazards, criminal activity, and to provide information for human services organizations that offer support and resources to those in need. The initial park ranger program included 16 ranger FTEs to oversee the city parks at four locations um, of two rangers with two shifts per day. The original FY22 budget amendment that established the ranger program projected higher salaries um, than the rate that human resources determined was comparable for their positions. So this lower than anticipated cost created an annualized savings that covers all but $18,000 in costs to provide two additional park rangers to the program, vehicles, and equipment. Last slide, please. And this is just a budget overview of our request. In total, the department is requesting $2,196,826 in funding for FY23. And I guess there's one more. Questions and comments? Thank you. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. Nice job. Any questions? Council members? Council member, please. Yeah, uh, going back to the urban forestry section, and I mentioned this very, I, you, men, you said a 15% death rate on, on the trees? Yes. I will challenge that number uh, just on my neighborhood alone, and I don't know if this is, uh, if we are, there is a discrepancy on this, and I don't know how we have done this assessment. Sure. Uh, but I, 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 believe me, I walked that district very much so, and I, I seen all those new dead trees pretty much all of them in, in, in many areas, in most of my areas in, in District 2. So 15% to me sounds odd. Um, so I, 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 I don't know how could that be uh, the reality of that. Ah, here's Tony to res Tony Goliath, our urban forester, here to respond. Hi, Council Member. I can uh, address that. Um, the 15% number is a two-year mortality rate. So these are trees. We have data on trees that died two years ago not trees uh, planted more recently. In fact, not trees planted as part of the um, thousand tree initiative. We do anticipate that those numbers will be higher than 15%. Um, and we, we, I would say when, when you raise planting um, by 100%, essentially, which is what we did, and um, you change from an opt-in strategy, which um, in many ways was not equitable, to one where you have to opt out for it, we anticipate an increase in tree mortality. Um, and in many ways, um, uh, it's, it's just an unavoidable reality of planting more trees. Um, we will have our, our um, numbers for the first year of the Thousand Tree Initiative uh, this winter. and. Um, and we'll work to, to try to reduce uh, mortality in the future. So, okay, so the numbers, uh, the 15% the mortality tree is two years ago. So it's the most updated number that we have is basically two years ago. Okay, right. so we haven't seen uh, the, the mortality uh, on the thousand tree project, um, okay. That, and I, I would like to see: are they are there maps about where the trees are being planted? And it will be uh, great for me to to see. And it will be to, important for me to see the mortality rates on uh, by district. Um, and I agree that we should be planting trees, and we should be planting more trees, and we should be planting trees, you know, on the west side. And I I love this project, but I also 
uh, you know, just planting them when, you know, many of my neighbors are struggling to, you know, to make ends meet and they don't understand, many of them don't, don't maybe don't understand the value or maybe they cannot afford the, the extra water bill. Um, so I, I, I feel like there is something there that is missing. Uh, if we know that I know uh, that there is a, a significant amount of the trees that we're planting are going to be dead, uh, just from my experience seeing them dead. Uh, I feel like we just keep on throwing money into this when they're going to be dead is, uh, to me, it's just a symbol and, not, and we're not solving the problem of increasing the urban forestry. So I, there is something missing in this, in this plan uh, I appreciate that we're trying to do this, but I think that there is something else that we need to do. I love that calendar. I've never seen it before. I love that, that that's going to, I think, help, hopefully help. Um, but I, I, I very much struggle with this. Um, I, again, I am not against trees. We should be planting more. I've been requesting more. I requested some in parking strips that are being watered. You know, that was a low hanging fruit, and I'm trying to identify more that are already being watered by the school district, by the other county, uh, and see if we can plant more trees in those because we already know that they're being watered. But um, it, I, I, I just uh, struggle very much so with, with the plan as it is right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Council members? Council member Fowler? Yeah, and I may have missed this, but in. Um, on the slide regarding new properties and amenities, the Trails and Natural Lands, uh, 98 plus thousand, that is for one FTE to activate the Fisher Mansion and the Carriage House? Just the Carriage House, and, and, that, and then that area, yeah. The Fisher Mansion is, is not habitable yet. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, they'll be pr providing interpretive educational information, bringing the public there, um, and um, having programs and activities for the public along the Jordan River. And that could include cleanups and um, educational activities about how the river um, impacts our um, ecosystem and um, the riparian corridor. I'm wondering if... Uh, with the discussion of this budget and that particular FTE, if we worked at all with um, the Jordan River Commission to partner with them such that if we had partnered with them or, or there would be maybe um, a subsidy that we could give but not reinvent the wheel by having somebody activate that wherein there's already an entire organization that does that. Right, yeah, we have been in discussions with um, with the Jordan River Commission. I don't know if, Tyler, if you have any more information on that you want to share. Yeah, that's a great uh, question, Councilmember Fowler. We, right now, we do uh, actively work with the Jordan River Commission in activation, primarily in their in river cleanups. Uh, we don't do a lot of activation of other Jordan River properties, um, but we do work with their, uh, their team and their outreach team for Jordan River kind of float trips, which will be started at the Fisher Mansion with the new boat ramp that is there. I think the other thing, just to this position, if funded, uh, it, it really is more is thinking more broadly about how do we activate the entire Jordan River corridor. Uh, the Jordan River Commission, while they are very helpful in that and we work with them closely, they have one position uh, that works from North Salt Lake all the way down to Utah Lake. So our small section uh, is only a very small portion of what they are working on as well. Yeah, I, I know her well. Um, so, um, but again, I, I look at, I appreciate the partnership. I'm glad we're working with them. Um, in some ways, it seems though that it, again, we're sort of reinventing instead of saying, how can we make this partnership? You know, something we've talked a lot about within the city, and I know this is sort of different, is like a private public partnership, right? And, and being able, and again, I re recognize this is different because the Jordan River Commission is a nonprofit, but um, capitalizing on those relationships so that where we could maybe partner and say, we'll, we'll go in half on an FTE if you go in half on an FTE, and then we have this new FTE and we don't have to put training into it, we don't have to do anything, we sort of, and we do this, like I think about um, the Sorensen Community Center, right? We, we basically have an interlocal with the county 
that says, you know, we pay the maintenance, you do the programming. And, and recognizing that this is a different and sort of outside of the box thought, because this is another nonprofit, I think there's ways to leverage our monies and our connections with these organizations so that we're not just funding an FTE to sit there when, again, there's an organization that already does all of this and, and we could maybe subsidize and help them. Hey, Councilmember Council Member Pietro. Um, hi, how are you? <laughs> Thanks hi. for this. Um, I have incredibly high hopes for the Park Ranger program and have heard Chris's pleas. I'm a little apprehensive about growing a program that we have no metrics on the success of yet. Um, can we have a brief discussion around adding these two park rangers? What sort of metrics? Additionally, to me, it seems that monitoring the foothill trails would be almost an entirely different beast than the other parks that we've been talking about, which are much more compact in their geography. Can we talk a little bit about metrics for success around this and making sure that we're not just throwing more people instead of better streamlined wisdom at a, at a problem? Yeah, so um, um, currently the park rangers, um, well, we're in the process of hiring them right now. Um, we've hired four, the leads, and um, um, the other 12, we've interviewed 12 more for interviews for the first round, and we'll do the second round um, next week. Um, and we're also purchasing a lot of things, and one of the things we're purchasing is phones for everybody, and on those phones, they'll have a software called SilverTrack, and SilverTrack will track um, a lot of different things that they're doing, so we can, um, we can tell where they've been um, by, you know, we can have like a QR code where they can check in so we know where they've been. Um, they can track every interaction that they've had with the public on there and, um, and um, identify um, people's names if, if there's issues. Um, we can um, track interactions, positive or negative, with all the constituents. And some of that information will probably be helpful. We met with the police department also, the police department, um, to act on any kind of crime or um, those kind of things that might happen in the park. So we are in communications. We've, we've talked to several other cities with park ranger programs about how do they do tracking and how do they measure their progress and that kind of thing. And so we're thinking about that. We're, we're adding a system to um, allow our park rangers to put that information in their phone so we can track it and give you some statistics back. And it's a fairly robust program that other uh, cities have used, and so we're excited to get that going. And so we have models of where this is successful even in other cities that we can kind of replicate successes from? Yeah, every city is so different right. in how they do it. And so um, there are there are some models, they're all a little bit tweaked differently. Some are in the police department, some are not. Some carry guns, some don't. Um, some are volunteer, some are not. So, you know, we're trying to take information from all of these to come up with um, a good program. Starting anything is really, really daunting. You, you feel like we have the organizational bandwidth to diversify to the foothills at this point and maintain a reasonable level of assurance that we're going to have success in our outcomes? Or do you have any concerns that we're muddying waters and potentially diluting what was a concise mission? I am not trying to take away from your people. I swear, I promise. <laughs> I promise. But I do, I, I do want to, look, it's about time District 1 did this, all right? <laughs> um, but it, but yeah. do, do you feel confident that your leadership has the support they need to do this reasonably well and that this investment is going to reap the outcomes that we're looking for? I am, and I know Tyler has something to say here too, but um, the foothills, you totally nailed it. It's totally different, which is why we didn't include it in the first part, um, in the first phase. Um, we added it because of 
all of the requests that we've been getting. We do have a trails coordinator, Tyler Fonero, who is a full-time person who's been up in the foothills and they can work, they will be working very closely with Tyler and um, some of his team up in the foothills. We have the volunteer and ambassadors that are already up there. And so I think together though that group is, they're going to work um, with the other park rangers, but they are going to be kind of their own unit up there and um, having two people that are very familiar with the foothills um, is, is gonna be so helpful. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the park ranger program that they had it in Draper, but they just put one park ranger up there and I bike up in Draper and the word with all my friends was, oh, there's a park ranger, you can't do this. You know, everybody talks about it and there was just one and I have never seen him, but everybody knows that they're there and they're enforcing, the, they're, you know, watching to make sure you're following the rules. And so I, I think there, there, is, um, there is a real effectiveness to just having a presence in the foothills. Go ahead. Kristen, you touch on my two points. I think it's a, an excellent uh, and very thoughtful comment that the, the foothills are a very different area than the other uh, locations where these rangers will be housed. There are very different issues. I think it will be critical that those two rangers are dedicated to the foothills and that they are working very closely with our recreational trails manager and with the currently uh, uh, just fund or just started trail ambassador program so this year we have nine ambassadors these two rangers will work very closely uh, with regards to education signage maintenance needs in the foothills and i think that's going to have to be treated and uh, managed in support with our recreational trails manager because my police i i just put a mint in my mouth so i'm sorry um, <laughs> can you ask my question first sure on the uh Seasonal staff side of the house. I know you you have a big hole right now, and uh, will this pay raise kind of close that gap, and uh, will then the work orders close sooner and the work get done uh, more efficiently with that additional seasonal staff? Last I checked, we had um, 74 of the 115 positions right. um, filled for seasonal staff. That's groundkeepers. We don't, I can't guarantee that. I don't know for sure. I, I can tell you that without it, um, we're not gonna attract folks, is, is the feeling that we have. Um, we are trying really hard. We've done several job fairs for um, part-time seasonal staff. Um, we feel like adding more pay will attract more folks. Um, in order for us to get our work done in a timely manner, we have to have more people out there. We just, I mean, a person on, you can only have one person on a mower. You can't have one person operating two. And so there's only so much you can do with a certain amount of bodies. And um, so we're trying, we're looking at all the angles um, of how we can be as flexible as possible with our staff and attract more people. Um, and we feel strongly that a pay increase will really help us. Okay, and, and on the other side of the staffing question, you talked about the community engagement. No, I can't find them. Yes. Yeah, the board and community engagement uh, position. Mm -hmm. uh, with that position, you know, and, and Councilmember Valdez Morris talked about you know volunteer efforts to paint curbs. You know, I know there's people that talk about hey, let's have the friends of the Miller Park, friends of the Laird Park, friends of the yes. you know. Yes, we have our, several groups. Right. Would that uh, community engagement person work with those volunteer groups is that part of that position or is that uh, am I so we have a position for that Weston Clark just stole her <laughs> for the um, communications group thank you Weston um, no she's awesome and um, she got a really nice promotion with the mayor's office so we have a um, Katie Reiser was our volunteer and um, our, our partner group uh, coordinator. Um, so that position is currently open and we will be filling that. This position um, is actually gonna be more coordinating our board and the board activities, as well as working with community councils and getting information from public lands to community councils and back and forth um, so that we can address so many of these requests that we're getting from our community councils to adjust um, 
our operations, really, or our, our CIP projects, or you know, work with them on CIP projects. So it's really kind of this liaison between public lands and all of these boards, somebody that has a lot of information on public lands that can communicate for us. And I mean, I, I know, I go back to the Council of Police point about the you know, trees. I know planting a tree is not just, you just don't give anyone a shovel and say, go plant this tree. But, you know, planting trees and volunteer groups doing that effort, because I know uh, there's a number of areas in my neighborhood, we do have a lot of trees, but uh, that would love to plant more trees, and I think they would be more than willing to help out. We have so many volunteer okay. opportunities right now, and it's really hard for us to utilize them without some of our communications team. We have four people out right now. Um, just on different different uh, things, we we've, we've lost two of them to other positions. But um, but yes, volunteers. We need to utilize volunteers as much as possible, and um, we have a lot of opportunity right now. People want to volunteer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have a follow up to your first question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I so it definitely, it's important that we get those groundskeeper positions filled. We had a conversation when we were touring Liberty Park earlier about pay raise versus or in addition to not having them be seasonal because I know that that, you know, people don't necessarily want a job that they know they only get for six, eight months out of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, also that I know that would require paying benefits, but that's probably a thing that those people also need. Right. So is there... Um, I guess for obviously it's a financial how what is the difference in how much it would cost the city to instead of doing the pay raise do f not do do them year round and then offer benefits or both or maybe having two different positions one that could be more year round and then one that could be a seasonal and maybe there's an option for these people because it seems like there are some people that for whom a pay raise and a seasonal position is what's what's wanted and you know i could imagine if you're in college or something like that that makes great sense but for others for whom they really need benefits and they really need something that's a little bit more long-term and stable um was that kind of discussed and you decided that the pay raise and keeping it seasonal was better well, how did that decision come about well we anticipated I anticipated this question from you since we had that discussion. Um, and I, I don't know if it's Taylor um, that's working the, um, oh, it's Scott. Um, Scott, if you could show that last slide after the comments. Um, we did contemplate the costs of what it would be to convert several of our seasonal staff to full time. And we didn't include it in the budget because of the cost, but we wanted to show you. and. Um, Greg did a great job coming up with this. Um, Greg, I don't know if you want to run through that real quickly. Do we have time? I don't want to. Okay, we can just share this with you then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. So, but the the short answer is that it's a financial. Yes. Yep. Problem. Okay. Two to three million dollars. Okay, <laughs> it's a small one. Okay, Not small. That's what Pui first. I've been illuminated with some thoughts, and they're probably horrendous, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, um, on the trees, back again to the trees, um, I've been talking, it's either fireworks or trees. Yes, it is budget question. I, um, so, um, you know, what can we do to keep them, uh, keep them alive? And maybe it's reducing the scope of, of how many trees we plant, and maybe you just mentioned that there's a lot of volunteers, maybe through the hottest months of the year, we come up with a plan about helping water them and maybe knocking on the door again and saying, hey, by the way, you should give them an extra water. Uh, you know, they are dying. Um, so I, again, again, one, it may be a budget question that maybe we, can f maybe we need to fund something else there that to help the trees survive the first two years. Um, and uh, then after that, most likely they're likely to survive. Um, but maybe there is also something there to, with the volunteer wor w group. Maybe there is something that we can put together uh, to keep them, to help this my community uh, have those actual trees and and, uh, and enhance our, our lives in the West Side. So.
want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, what I want to impart is that we're doing, we are doing those types of things. Um, uh, our staff is reaching out to community councils and visiting with them, showing them where their trees are going to be planted um, on, a, on a seasonal basis, and then engaging with uh, volunteer groups who are willing to, um, to spread the word, uh, community members who love trees and wanna make sure that their, their neighborhood blocks um, have the shade that they get in other parts of the city. Um, so this, these are things that we're continuing to work on and will continue to work on. Um, it, 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 more than anything, um, this is an outreach challenge and it's a, uh, an information challenge. I, I think you mentioned earlier, um, you know, a lot of people have a, uh, an impression that watering a tree is, is cost prohibitive. And we, we did the math on that, and, and based on our, uh, you know, however many days we have listed in our watering calendar, um, it's, it's a $2.59 investment for a, a year of, of tree water. Um, so in that respect, it's not cost prohibitive, but people don't necessarily know that. And, uh, and in other instances, they maybe lack the means to physically care for a tree, or um, uh, or just lack the awareness of how to do it effectively. And that is um, uh, something that the public lands um, department uh, and, and the resources that, that it brings to bear can really help urban forestry with um, as we outreach to the community. Thanks, Tony. Councilmember Warden. Thank you. It's, I feel like every time you come before me, I have the most questions and take up the most of your time, and I probably send you the most emails. So I'm only going to ask one question this time. It might have a subpart. So, <laughs> for, uh, so, no, no, and and it's it's not about park rangers or trails. Um, it's not about trees. Um, it is about. I received several messages from residents about dandelions, and they asked the city. Um, what about dandelions, um, why there were so many this year, and they said that they were told by the person they asked that Parks doesn't budget any money for weed control. And I was like, I can't imagine that's true, um, but maybe there was some sort of miscommunication there. And then I was like, is this a budget issue? You can't afford the weed control, or is this a decision that we make because of like we want to, you know, pesticides and things like that. Thank you, Lee. Lee Bullwinkle, <laughs> Parks Division Director, can take that one. Thank you, Councilman Wharton. Um, it is not a budget issue. Okay. It we have the budget, we have the sources and the res the resources of the material. We just don't have the personnel to get it applied. Honestly, the best time to spray is in the fall, and that's when everything is closing down, winding down, and it's just. It's a challenge because, you know, one, people will complain about dandelions, and then when we go take care of it, people complain because we are spraying. So it's this double-edged sword. It's healthier for the turf if we can take care of them, and it's just trying to get to them because we have all these things, and that's just one of the things. And so because we can't do it, we try and mow it, but we can't mow because we don't have the staffing. But. I, was, I mean, do we need, like... Is this a second question? This is the subpart. Do we need like a fancier, uh, all natural version of the weed killer that's like less toxic? So is that we've available looked into in this, large quantities? And it is twice the cost to go organic than it is. Uh, <laughs> okay. We did that at Laird, and we've done a couple of test plots, and it takes sense. takes a couple of years to see that results. But you got to stay on it, and we had the funding through. Uh, a, grant. a grant through uh, sustainability got us that grant and the funds ran out and it is twice the money and so one of these years we'll come back to you and at this time and we'll ask for more money for farmers, farmers market because we can just sell dandelion buds <laughs> need them I don't need dandelions I <laughs> need to get rid of the dandelions um, there probably is uh, all right Okay. Uh, okay. Whatever. Enough about the Thank you for the answer. Right. You've answered my question. <laughs> hey, thank thank you very much, uh, Council. We're.
45 minutes behind schedule because of our great questions and our in-depth discussions. I appreciate that very much, uh, Kristen, and your, and your group. You. Chief, we need to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll be right back with you at, uh, at, 3.20, at 3.35. Thank you very much, Chief.
Uh, item number four, fiscal year 2022 to 23, fire department budget. Jennifer Bruno is up to bat to uh, give us an introduction, and we have Chief Lieb also with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the interest of time, I'll keep it really short. Um, the fire department operates uh, out of 14 stations across the city. For the new council members, there's a map uh, in packets that shows where all the stations are located. The fiscal year 23 budget represents about a 6.6% or $3 million increase over last year. Most of the increase is due to a proposal to add an MRT, a medical response team in the Sugar House area, and add six additional firefighters to address overtime. I'll turn it over to the chief, um, who has a, a short presentation to go through some of the things. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, council members. Council Chair Dugan, thanks for uh, having us today. I look forward to sharing a little bit about our fiscal year 2023 budget. Um, with me today on my right is my finance manager, Clint Rasmussen. Behind me, one of the onlookers is my deputy chief, Rusty McMicken. I've got two assistant chiefs uh, watching on their computers, Assistant Chief Fox, Assistant Chief Milne, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my staff chiefs, all of whom contribute to the development of the budget. It's obviously a lot of moving pieces, so thanks to all of them. Um, just a little context before I get started. My, my PowerPoint is relatively short. There are six slides, four of which have actual information on them, so I'll try and uh, <laughs> facilitate it. Um, but, you know, last year, uh, 2022, the fire department responded to 31,000 unique requests for assistance, and that was 3,000 more than the year prior. Now, COVID had something to do with that, but our service demand remains about 80% emergency medical service, and that number is slowly climbing, 80%, 8 zero. On the fire side, I want to tell you the two primary fire hazards we see in Salt Lake City are wildland interface fires of which we see three sides of Salt Lake surrounded by the interface and vacant building fires, uh, which is addressed in my very first slide. So the next slide, please. Okay, our first component of our fiscal 2-3 uh, budget is an emergency demolition fund in the amount of $200,000. We ask that this be placed in a capital improvement maintenance fund outside of the general fund. Okay, any given time in the calendar year, Salt Lake City Civil Enforcement is following up to 150 vacant buildings. Last year, we responded to 30 fires in vacant buildings. This year, we were on track for 50, 50. Many of these buildings, up to 30% of them, burn more than once. So quite honestly, these buildings are dangerous. They're dangerous to curious kids. They're dangerous to individuals looking for shelter. They're dangerous, obviously, to the firefighters, and we need to find a way to get them to the ground before someone gets hurt. Now, city ordinance, city ordinance right now exists and allows the, the building official to initiate emergency demolitions. It also allows them to delegate that authority to another entity. So that's what we are asking for in this component of our budget. We would like that authority to, authority to initiate emergency demolitions under certain conditions. Uh, number one, the building has to be vacant, obviously. It has to be impacted by a previous fire, at least one, therefore compromised structurally, and then it has to be under one quarter of an acre. So we would, of course, ask the building property owner, if we can find that owner, to initiate the demolition. If they do not, that gives the fire department the authority to initiate that demolition. What we are missing is funding to actually pay for the demolition and the removal of the debris. And we have to do it with the kind of contractors that are familiar with assessing hazards that could be involved with some of these buildings. But we have had those conversations. We have those contracts in place. We've had discussions with DEQ. We've had discussions with Salt Lake County Health. We are ready to do this. We are asking here that we have the funding. Next slide, please. Um, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Come to my I have a more. question on that. So, sure. Um, so it, to me, I mean, I think it's a great idea, and I think we should do it. I sh I'm just thinking about how to recoup some of those funds that are coming from our pocket. And if there, have you guys thought about what can we add or tag into the property? If we, you know, onto their property, if they cannot pay right away or they never pay, and we have an agreement that they were going to pay for portions of it, I don't know, but something to recoup the money and that 
I mean, this is, and if they're not doing it on their own, we'll help you take Absolutely. care of this hazard for you, but you have to help us back. So that is a legitimate concern. We have been working with finance. Uh, they have told us that they have had some good results putting liens on such properties okay. and other aspects of city, city needs. And they've had some, some good, res good uh, results in getting some of the funding in return. This is one of the reasons we want to put the funding in the capital improvement maintenance fund rather than the general fund. Okay. So it's continually, hopefully, re-supporting re itself. So it's self-sufficient. Okay, great, thank you. I'm just, sorry, I missed that self-sufficient part. How is it self-sufficient? If we end up paying for the demolition, council member, we will, we will ask the property owner to compensate the city for that oh. cost. In fact, we will ask the property owner before we initiate emergency demolition, we will go to them and we'll say, if we can locate them. Sure. The problem is sometimes we can't locate the property owner. Some of these buildings are in transition. Uh, they're being developed. They're not being developed. They've been inherited. There's a conflict about who owns it. So that's, that's the steps we'll go through. Perfect. I, I like this program a lot. And, you know, we had, I had a, we have lots of vacant buildings and some that were burned down. And then there was all this, but we couldn't get the rest of it out. And so I think this is a great emergency fund um, uh, program. So thanks. That's all. Welcome. Chair, do you prefer to return to regular order where he presents and then questions? Or are we going well, to do we questions? Because I have one about this right now, but I'll wait if you want to. Uh, unless it's Jermaine right now. Go ahead, ask real quick since we're, we stopped. Go ahead. Is how much demolition does two hundred thousand dollars buy us? We estimate a demolition of a building in under of a quarter acre is approximately forty to fifty thousand okay. each demolition. So that would provide enough to do three to four a year. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a comment. I think this is very important. We have a lot of vacant buildings in my district that have been problems, and some that have bur burned have caught on fire multiple times. So absolutely, I think this is, I didn't know that the fire department had the authority to to initiate this, or maybe I knew and I forgot, but we should be doing this. I'm a broken record, but we should be paying for this out of impact, or not impact fees, um, boarded and vacant building fees. So we should update our consolidated fee schedule. And then of course we should lean the property to try and get that back. So that should be something that ultimately um, we as taxpayers aren't paying for. They're being paid for by the property owners that are choosing to keep vacant buildings. But I know that that's two different ways to get that money back and that both are complicated. Um, the other thing I'll note is um, I think we should look at how the fire department's authority to, I guess, condemn or demolish nuisance properties interfaces with the demolition ordinance, especially with regards to housing stock, housing loss mitigation, because that makes, because we have an ordinance that makes it difficult to dem demolish houses. We, we made the demolition ordinance much easier for commercial buildings, but for homes, it's still quite difficult for a property owner to do, do so. So I think we should look at how we can streamline that whole process. And I know that some of those things don't fall under the fire departments, but I'm glad that you're taking this initiative. So thanks. Thank you, council members. I, I sincerely appreciate the support because this is number one. This is a number one priority for the fire department. This was number one on our budget proposal. And worthy of note is that just this past January, Baltimore City lost three firefighters for just such an incident, trying to fight a fire in a vacant building, building collapsed, three fatalities four months ago, one seriously hurt. And I do not want to see that in Salt Lake. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next uh, priority. Staffing and personnel in the amount of 395,000. Many of you uh, council members know that since 2002, Salt Lake City Fire Department has prioritized four-handed staffing. It's the number one priority for my office, Office of the Chief. It's the number one priority for my labor union. It enables us to do our job faster, we're more efficient, and the, both our residents and our firefighters are safer when we have four individuals on a fire engine or a fire truck. Over the past two fiscal years, however, it's becoming more and more difficult to maintain four-handed staffing. We're seeing some of our engines and trucks three-handed. And some departments across this valley are now doing mandatory overtime just to maintain three-handed. So we feel like we're on a slope that we kind of, we want to stop. 
Um, prior to COVID in 2019 and 2020, we were on the right track. We've been incrementally adding fire, firefighters and we've been reducing our overtime. We were reducing at 10%, uh, 19, 15%, 20, and then worldwide pandemic and it turned everything upside down. I wanna get back on that road. Uh, we are seeing increased use of good city benefits. I mean, the employees are entitled to use their benefits and they're wonderful, but things like parental leave, uh, short-term disability, ERPL of course was crazy. Um, they are on the increase and they put a really tough challenge on us to maintain our staffing. So these firefighters that I'm asking for, these six, would just be used to reduce that number of vacancies on a daily basis and ultimately reduce our overtime and we'll get back on track to trying to slowly reduce our overtime. We believe the way to go is to add firefighters rather than just add to our overtime budget because if we keep adding to an overtime budget and we keep using the same people, we're gonna be victims of burnout, stress, uh, anxiety, uh, potential for injury on scene. It's, it's just makes all the sense in the world to add full-time people than to try and just alleviate the overtime. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll move on, next slide. Next slide, please. PPE investment in the amount of $82,000. PPE is fundamental to the services we provide. Obviously, we need to update, uh, we need to repair our equipment. Uh, to outfit a firefighter from head to toe is approximately $4,500. Turnout coat, turnout pants, helmet, boots, gloves. They're all Nomex, they're fire resistant, they're very expensive. Their life expectancy is just under five years. And we need to keep them in a perfectly controlled, you know, temperature, no exposure facility. So this, this $82,000 not only goes to an updated PPE, personal protective equipment, it also goes to improve the facilities that we store this equipment in. We have a, um, uh, a room outside at our training center that holds all of our reserve PPE. So when our firefighters are on scene and they become contaminated, they have to get that laundered and it has to be professionally laundered. And we don't send these out, we do these with large machines right at our training center. So um, it's a pretty um, complicated process and it's worth every, every dime to make sure our firefighters are as safe as they possibly can be. <coughs> Any questions regarding that? Thank you. Next slide, please. Our fourth component and our last component of our fiscal 2-3 budget Medical response team expansion in the amount of $320,000. Um, quite simply, MRTs, medical response teams, they work. They're focused, they're efficient, they're sustainable, uh, and they're fast. And they allow our heavy apparatus to remain in the station when they go out and take the brunt of our EMS calls. Um, as I said, eight zero percent of our calls are EMS, and the vast majority of those are low acuity calls, meaning they're not life-threatening calls. These are the type of calls that we can send an MRT to pretty routinely. And right now, we have two in service, one at station one and one at station six. Station one MRT runs about 2,000 calls a year. Station, the one at station six runs about 1,500. We are proposing to add another MRT. We expect that MRT to run another 1,500 calls per year. That's 5,000 calls that a heavy apparatus that gets three to four miles per gallon is not going out on a medical call. It makes, they make all the sense in the world. Um, we see opportunities not only for expansion with the MRT program, but we see opportunities to use the MRT as a platform for other services, which brings me to chat, community health uh, access team, which I'm sure some of you may be interested in. Should I just go there <laughs> now? <laughs> Okay, um, there's a lot of alternative response models. I, I understand that. We work with police department pretty regularly. We are currently working with SLC 911 about how to triage these various kind of, of uh, alternate response models. This is how chat is different. Chat incorporates a commu community health resource, which would be a social worker, with our trauma assessment resource, which are firefighters on the MRT. When you put them together, you have three individuals, we call that chat, okay? They, we are gonna deliver that resource directly to the population that we think needs it the most. And we are gonna show up in a timely manner. We are not gonna do it by telephone, we are not gonna do it by computer, we are gonna dispatch this team to the people that need it. And hopefully, we develop a case for some of these individuals, we find them the services that they need, um, 
we are talking to them, we're looking long-term, not just their physical health, but their mental health and their emotional health. And we incorporate, we enlarge our toolbox exponentially with the addition of a social worker, as opposed to a firefighter. We are trained and we're really good at keeping someone alive and identifying that, boy, you are not, you don't look well at all. You need some help. We're either gonna treat that individual on scene and re possibly release them, or we're gonna take them to the hospital. Those are really our only options. But when we, add, when we add a community health component to it, now we've opened up all kinds of other things, from Fourth Street Clinic to USARA, you know, to uh, Utah Naloxone, all of those kind of service providers are now within our realm. Third component that's different with chat is we are not gonna send a chat team to a dangerous scene. If there's a weapon involved in any way, shape, or form, or there's a threat or some kind of violence that we believe is apparent or, or imminent, we're not gonna send chat to that. So that makes chat a little bit different than what the police may provide. A police may be capable, I won't speak for Chief Brown, but they may be capable of responding to a call like that. They're equipped with vests, they obviously have a police officer there or nearby, and that's not the case with chat. We're going with three, three individuals, two firefighters and a social worker. They're not gonna wear a vest, at least at this time. They're not gonna have uh, protection with them. Uh, no OC spray, you know, no stun guns, nothing like that. We'll give them some initial training, obviously, for uh, being aware of their surroundings. But that's, those are three big differences to what you're hearing from other response models. Any questions about that? And you guys, you'd be working with uh, the Downtown Alliance that also would kind of help you sure. coordinate Absolutely. and, and, we participate and in communicate with the different uh, clients that you'd end up having. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilman Fowley, yeah. Thank you, Chief. Um, First off, I mean, you guys know, I don't need to say much, but um, I'm so excited about the MRT program. And one of the things I was talking about with somebody the other day is something I truly appreciate about um, your budget every year is I've been pushing for an MRT in Sugar House since my very first budget. And Chief came to me and said, we just don't have the numbers for it yet. Councilwoman, like, thank you for your support, but I'm not... We don't have the numbers. And I, I appreciate that philosophy in looking at the budget um, and your particular budget. Um, because honestly, we probably, I probably could have gotten the votes for that. And I appreciate you saving us some money on, and waiting. Um, and so I, I know that we're seeing the numbers and I also know we're seeing um, a more acceptance in your department too of the MRGs yeah. as well. Um, one of the, so thank you for that again. Um, two questions, one question with the MRT, I see the four firefighters, the vehicle, vehicle and the medical kit. Is this a vehicle that can be paid for with impact fees? No, I think that there's a, I think that there's a million dollar minimum uh, for fire apparatus under the impact fee statute. So it's truly the, I know. Uh, it's truly the large, heavy apparatus, and I think that that's just one of those conversations that we need to have with those people up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, sorry, it is paid for with funding our future dollars, though. Okay. So, thank you. And then the other thing, um, I was visiting a station and talking. Uh, I think do we've rolled out chat in station one. Is that right? MRT. No, it's chat, just the MRT? Our uh, proposed chat rollout would be approximately Labor Day. Okay. We, so yeah. One of the things I was talking about, particularly with Station, the, the you know, I know how busy Station 1 is, mm -hmm. um, is an increase in calls after that midnight hour, which we know that our MRTs aren't responding at that time. And one of the things that, and I know that this wasn't necessarily um, an well, it wasn't an audit of the fire department, but one of the things we learned from the police audit, and one of the reasons we have all of these alternative response models and are trying to fund these alternative response models is because we were getting a lot of calls that police officers didn't need to go to. That's why you guys all came up with these great ideas that we said go do and come up with ideas. But the other thing that we learned from that audit is that we were seeing services provided during the day and really the most calls for service came at night. So these alternative response models aren't responding when we're seeing an increased call for services. And um, I recognize there's some difficulty or some apprehension in sending out, you know, something like chat or something like MRT 
in those later hours for safety reasons. I've talked, I, I know, I know all of the arguments, but I do think it's something that I, I would want to look at and see if we can, you know, once the team gets up and rolling and there, there's a comfortability around it, even if there's apprehension right now, at, at those calls for service that we're seeing late in those later evenings. I think the audit said we were seeing, you know, a huge increase, which makes a ton of sense. I see it in like the criminal defense world, right? It's when all the crimes happen or it's when people are getting hurt or it's when people are overdosing. Is in that like two o'clock, 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. time period. Um, and that is what the data shows with the audit. And so eventually I'd like to see our alternative response models in a position, including chat, maybe MRT, that they would be also available to respond when we're seeing that increased call for service. Absolutely, council member. You touched on a lot of points there. Um, it, you know, I, we take it upon ourselves as a fire administration to make sure that we have allocated our resources as appropriately, appropriately as possible. We want to optimize um, the resources you've funded and the mayor has, you know, has, has supported over the years. So it's no different here, whether it is an MRT overnight or a chat, or maybe it's an existing resource. We are focused on those same numbers that you're referring to. We know that station one, uh, for instance, is far and away our busiest station right now. Station one is on 500 East, 200 South, right downtown. And the evenings are tough. We still see more calls when the city is most populated. So we focused on the day. Um, and as long as I'm, I'm there, we see uh, MR, the sweet spot for the MRTs as a total of four. Now, if we're successful at this budget, if you support this budget, uh, we'll have three. And soon I'll come back and we'll probably ask for one more. And I see an appropriate area for that in the northwest quadrant of the city. Um, so those are the kind of things that we talk about and we discuss right now. And, and right now, as an administration, we're discussing how to alleviate the pressure we're seeing at Station 1. Um, because there is no magic elixir. We can't just say, oh, I'm going I'm to put another you know, engine in there or I'm just going to get chat just like that. But we're aware of it and we do see um, certainly there's going to be an, an opportunity for us to expand and, and use uh, MRT as a platform for other services. So, Thank you. And if I may just follow up, uh, I'm sure if you've been listening to the budget meetings over the last couple of days that or weeks or wherever we're at, um, one of the things I have brought up is how grateful I am for these different alternative response models, but also making sure that we are being effective and we have those. So, and I, I know, Chief, that you um, are good at the numbers, but I think it is important that as we roll out chat, as we look at MRT, um, what those numbers are, where the calls are, and as you sh said, just making sure we're efficient on that so that we, we have those metrics. We don't know what they are yet, <laughs> right? But we do know that you can, we can at least track calls. Um, and that will be helpful in upcoming budget cycles when we're saying, okay, what, what of these programs worked and which ones can we expand on and maybe which ones do we need to absorb somewhere else or something along those lines, so. Thank you. Councilmember Bella Morris. I had a question on, um, Chief, so what was the difference between this group and chat? I'm sorry if I missed it. Which group in chat? Uh, the MRT, MRT and then chat. MRT are two firefighters responding to low acuity medical calls only. Okay. They're not doing case management. They're not doing mental health assessments, substance abuse, okay. um, handoffs. Okay. And then chat is the one that? When it becomes chat, if we add a social worker to oh. that team, council member, then, we'll, then it becomes a chat team. Okay. And then this will become the chat yep. team. And then they'll, go, they'll travel together. I see. Okay, thank so you. We're, we're, you have funded, the, the mayor has proposed last year, and you have funded three total social workers for the fire department. And we have hired one manager just recently. Right. And we do have applicants. We do think we can hire the two operational social workers. We'll hire those in the next couple of weeks. We will train them and get them involved in you know the fire department atmosphere and how we do business. And we expect to put out yeah. one chat team out of downtown area by Labor Day. Nice, and, uh, and that's amazing. So I'm super excited about this. And I think, you know, I, was, I keep thinking about the downtown ambassadors and their role and to make sure that we're connecting with them because I almost, and maybe it's happening already, but I, mean, I don't know, but where, you know, they're like, to me, the, the ambassadors are like the first 
point of contact where they go around and maybe somebody's sleeping and they're like, hey, you know, can we take you somewhere? Can we help you? You have to move along, et cetera. But maybe somebody, but maybe that person becomes violent or is actually intoxicated or is actually having a medical episode. Then I want to make sure that you know who to call. Is it you, right? Or is it the police department or both? Or can they say, hey, we actually need just medical. We don't need you know, it would. It would. It's ultimately going to be through SLC 911, and okay. they will triage these calls and all send right. the appropriate resources. And then once that person moves, and the, there is debris all over the place, which is usually the case, then they will call Hart, and Hart will call Rapid Intervention Team, and Rapid Intervention Team is going to go and clean it up. And then I want to see 10 emails, you know, <laughs> uh, that say, "Hey, Anna, can you do something about this? Look at this mess." Anyway, thank you. I love this. Thanks, Chief. I've, and I love the chat program, and I, I'm, I'm excited for this thing to roll out. And I also like the MRT program right now, so I think it's variable across the city. And probably it's an uh, invisible value that most people don't even see. Um, but So I very much appreciate it. My question is on University of Utah calls that we take and uh, reimbursement of those calls. Do we get reimbursed for those calls? Not right now. We do not charge the university for those calls. How many do we do a do? You um, I don't have those numbers with me, council member, but I can provide those, wow. unless my deputy chief knows approximately <laughs> university calls. It's it's significant, council so, member. So uh, maybe that's back to us. I know it is. On we need to uh, resolve that somehow as a council. And, and I think there's a broader policy conversation about tax exempt properties in general. I mean, you could make the same, you could make the same question about um, a lot of the tax exempt properties that are in the city, a lot of the large uh, institutional tax exempt properties that are in the city um, that generate calls for service, whether it's police or fire. Um, so that's it's the same is true for police responses to the university that are above the university police uh, maybe expertise level. Yeah, we'll have to. Write that down as something that we need to do because I uh, I look at those calls and yeah and it would let and it would likely require um, collaboration with the state to yes. enable that charging right. of fees. Yeah, I know it's not simple. <laughs> I can't just call it up. So okay, thank you. Oh, my other thing is training equipment. Uh, is it? Do you have training equipment that's in the CIP? Um, uh, we do, and it's and been funded. We have a couple of items that have been funded. Okay, through the and CIP so we're, we're doing doing well on that. Okay, uh, okay, great. That was my. Uh, I was going to ask about that too, Mr. Chair. Last year, I think you had four requests, and you kind of ordered them. And I, I believe we funded the first two. We did. So, do we expect that we'll see the other two? And are there others that need to that will be in the budget? Yeah, we will come. We'll come back, and we will see the the other two requests once again. Okay. Thanks. Is there is there hazard? There are some concerns about uh, hazmat suits. Or uh, renewal or different hazmat suit is that? That's not part of the CIP council member, but um, is that part of this PPE? No. PPE, no. The hazmat suits I don't believe are going to be part of this uh, PPE. Mostly is going to be turnout, structural suits, and um, wildland. Okay. All right. I was just just curious about adding the concern with having additional hazmat suits. The cleaning of them and the, and the upkeep of them. We'll we'll check into what the hazmat team is um, requesting specifically. I'm sure right. Station Ten probably let you know if they need mm -hmm. some hazmat. Team. Possibly. Bryce, <laughs> 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 I have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, sure, no, I, I appreciate all the work that you guys do. is is incredible, and the, and the the neighbors uh, are very happy with the work that you guys do, with the service Thanks. to the community. I. Uh, on the fees, I remember the county did uh, a, a police fee back in the day, and it wasn't very, uh, and it was basically on that connected to calls of service, which I think is genius, uh, but the state didn't like it very much. But maybe there is a way of connecting it with fire. Maybe they like that. But I, uh, I was, I worked for the for Slovisa in the aftermath of that, and it was, <laughs> I had to do a lot of cleanup in there. Um, but um, I. I, you know, I just wanted to uh, ask. Uh, you mentioned how how much gas those engines use, uh, and it's obviously striking. Uh, it, I, I mean, I'm not surprised. I guess there are you know big gigantic buildings almost that they drive through the street. But um, 
you know, are, are, are there needs to replace some of them? And, uh, you know, what is the rotation on that? Maybe this is a question for fleet, but, um, and uh, are there efficiencies, are there new technologies uh, to use? I see them all the time. I live very close to a fire station, and uh, I can, you know, they're not very efficient in machines, I'm, you know, as we know, just because of the gas consumption, how heavy they are, but, uh, knowing that many, much of our fleet is going electric, and I don't know if this if fire engine that is electric is a, you know is front upon, but are there technologies out there that could make this more efficient? There are, Council Member, and I'm happy to report that fleet has supported our efforts to be as as sustainable and as efficient as possible with our heavy apparatus. Our heavy apparatus is relatively new. Technology exists now to virtually eliminate the carbon monoxide put out by those engines. Uh, but the fossil fuel use is still relatively high. Um, but um, Fleet has supported us in all of our initiatives as far as um, our equipment, our vehicles. We are all hybrid. For instance, our light fleet is all hybrid. I drive an electric vehicle. Um, and we are always looking at electric fire engines. Um, right now, I'm just kind of watching to see the, the select few that are in service on the West Coast to see how they perform. And I would, I'm a big advocate for going that direction at some point. So um, you will probably see me at this table, you know, in the maybe not so distant future talking about an electric fire engine. It would be an investment, of course, for the city, just like they always are. But boy, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Um, thank you, Chief. I think uh, you guys are, do such a wonderful job, and I think you guys have the authority uh, with the police department to keep informing us on the very present um, issues that we have in our streets, which is mental health. Uh, when we when we went to DC back in March and met with our congressional um, group, I can remember congressional delegation, and sorry, I caught you off guard, but we talked to them about how we're trying to respond to different crises, uh, especially with our homeless population and mentally ill, and that we're trying our best. And so obviously we put you as an example with this program, and we're like, you know, stay tuned, we're gonna give you a report, you know, and yeah. we're gonna have these great uh, data points so that they have enough information so that they can push forward some sort of reform or maybe other or re rethink, you know, mental health and how municipalities are taking care of it with our very limited budget and we're taking, you know, doing a lot of work and we need more help from the federal government and new programs or whatever it is. So having that said, that was long. I think you guys are equipped to give us like that information. So as you go through these programs, and I know you already have some data points, but if you would be inclined to say, hey, the first six months, you know, we looked you know, we took care of this many people, and mm -hmm. we we do you know strongly feel if that's the case that you know it's a mental health issue, and it might not be you know this, or it might not be that you know. So that that way we can when we talk to them, we can we have the information like this is true and this is happening. So we will we'll we'll yeah. look at it as a pilot program, Council Member Valdemaros, and we'll report what we see in six to eight nine year. But I think we have to try. You know, this is what we do on a regular basis. What we do is respond to medical calls and mental health, substance abuse and trauma, which we've been doing for years, is right in our wheelhouse, right? This is, it makes, it, it's, it makes complete sense that we engage in this chat kind of uh, program. I, I am under no misconception that I guarantee it'll be a success, but we have some metrics already developed, some preliminary metrics and we have to give it a shot. And if it's not, if it doesn't hit right where we want it, I don't have any problem modifying it or changing it or tweaking it. And I will keep you updated on what we're looking at. Thank you, at. that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Council Member Mono. Just thanks, Chief. Thank you, Council Member. Thank Council you, Member. this is awesome. All right, we'll be moving on. Thanks, Mr. Have a great Chair. day. Yep, thank you. Moving on to item number six, fiscal year 2022 to 23, Fleet Fund. We're swapping uh, Jennifer out for Ben, and we have Jorge back at the table, and Nancy. All right, it's back for more. So this is like a deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> like I've been here before, <laughs> very recently. 
Ben, kick it off. The fleet fund, you can find it in the budget book. Oh. No trees. No trees. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> in the budget book, you can find the fleet fund on pages 61 to 63. That's where the key changes are listed. You can also find it in the staffing document section on page 280. The total proposed budget is just over $30 million. This is a $2.3 million increase, or 8% over fiscal year 2022. The budget includes uh, several inflationary impacts to continue providing existing services at higher cost. There's also one new FTE, a customer service advisor, to coordinate with vendors and departments for expanded hours of operation. Funding Our Future is contributing six and a half million dollars for slightly more than 60 new vehicles. Note several of those vehicles are for new FTEs proposed in other departments. This includes the civilian response team in the police department. I want to quickly point out on page four of the staff report, there's a chart showing the alternative fuel and electric powered vehicles in the city's fleet, not counting the airport because they have separate fleet uh, facilities and management. 43% of the city's vehicles are alternative fuel or electric. Fleet has a significant role to play in meeting the sustainability goals as adopted by the council and the mayor in a joint resolution. Those are shown on page three of the staff report. And attachment three has the electrification goals that the council and the mayor adopted in a follow-up resolution in 2020. And I'll turn it over to Jorge and Nancy who have a presentation for you. Fine. Thank you, Ben. As always, uh, great introduction of the budget um, and this time Fleet Services Division. Uh, I have here with me Nancy Bean, uh, Division Director for Fleet. And, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect. Um, this is a brief breakdown of the Fleet Division. Their purpose is related to vehicles, equipment, and machinery that is owned by the city. And it goes from the procurement of these uh, pieces of equipment to fulfill the needs of all of the teams across the city, to usage analytics, and ongoing maintenance and disposition of these assets. There are four main functions within the division. Uh, we have maintenance. You see there, uh, there are a total of 32 FTEs on the maintenance side. We have two FTEs currently in the customer service office. We have six FTEs in the parts warehouse and five in the administration, including Nancy. That is a total of 45 FTEs. This uh, count is, is not including the one FTE that we will talk about in just a couple of minutes. Um, just the organizational structure for your reference, we have the division director, Nancy, and then we have um, running the shop, our operations manager, Jay Spencer. Two slides up first. Thank you. <laughs> One more. One more slide. There you go. Thank you. All right. Just sharing a little bit of uh, highlights from uh, fiscal year 22. There were 40 vehicles replaced. From, from the fleet, these uh, were replaced with newer ve new vehicles, actually. Um, fleet analyzes the usage of, of all the vehicles and determines when a vehicle needs to be replaced based on a points system. That point system uh, considers mileage driven and maintenance cost primarily. So once they, they reach certain points in, in, in uh, the chart, they are determined to be needed for replacement. Um, we saw a few budget amendments last fiscal, well, this fiscal year that is ending um, that added eight vehicles for new positions in, in the city. So 
eight new vehicles added to the inventory. On the other hand, and thanks to the analysis that Nancy and, and her team are performing regularly, eight vehicles were retired from our fleet, what um, Nancy calls the right size in the fleet. So analyzing the usage, uh, the needs, the current needs of, of the departments and divisions, and determining if a vehicle is, is still needed or not. So these vehicles are uh, not being replaced. They're completely retired out of the fleet. So a net gain um, between those two. Um, we are happy to report that we are preparing our workforce to incorporate more in-house electric vehicle maintenance with 11 uh, technicians currently enrolled in phase one of training and three technicians enrolled in phase four, which is the final phase. They will be able to uh, safely handle uh, electric vehicle maintenance, which is very different from uh, your, your fuel uh, powered vehicles. Now, um, we are slowly incorporating more uh, electric vehicles to our fleet with very limited options right now in the market. Um, we, we all know that new vehicles are not really available. Even if you show up with a big check, uh, th there is just nothing in the lot. So with those constraints, uh, there is a strategy that uh, Nancy will describe in just a few minutes on how we are going to accomplish those uh, electrifying uh, goals for, for the city. Um, as Ben mentioned, we have 26% of our fleet are hybrid ve vehicles. While there are not all of them plugging hybrids, they are highly efficient um, vehicles. Faster is our fleet management software. This software is being expanded to incorporate uh, telematics as a predictive tool for maintenance and uh, the loaner pool module that will allow uh, city staff to easily access uh, loaner vehicles. All right, now this is our budget uh, request. We have a series of initiatives listed in this. Next slide, please. I'm going super fast. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this is an overview of those initiatives. Uh, we have quite a few. Um, I want you to focus on the number on top, $154,281, because that is the amount that we are asking to be added to our base budget in fleet, $154,281 only. That will cover the maintenance, a new initiative to incorporate the maintenance of the car wash facility. Uh, this facility was not budgeted properly for maintenance. We had in the past uh, supplemented the maintenance with the help of our public utilities department. Uh, that's no longer the case. So we need to contract out that function. Uh, we are seeing an increased cost on, on that task. So we are including an initiative there so we can continue to keep our vehicles uh, clean, more specifically those heavy duty vehicles that before they get um, serviced by the shop, they need to be properly clean. So there's one. The next one, uh, our faster software is moving to the cloud. We would like to um, provide more security and resiliency for this uh, cr uh, critical system in case of cyber attacks and power outages. More recently, um, we have a power outage where the, ser the physical server is, leaving the, the fleet shop without the ability to service any vehicles. In order to prevent that in the future, we are moving to the cloud, which provides a mo much uh, better service and uh, resiliency to, to access this, this system. Uh, fleet is adding charging capacity to their building. We are asking for a charging station to be added to um, that location. We are very interested in exploring an option that doesn't rely on the grid uh, to power this, this charging station. We are looking into incorporating um, solar powered, battery backed up um, charging stations. If successful, if we are able to implement this, if it is funded, um, we would like to use this as a pilot to explore the expansion of this uh, type of charging stations into the rest of the city. That will, uh, um, create more resiliency in case of a, of a blackout or brownout uh, deficiencies in the power lines, 
it will be addressed with, and, and we will still be able to uh, charge our electric vehicles in, in, in those cases, right? There are two equity initiatives listed there. One is uh, to adjust the salary of uh, staff in the shop to align them with uh, the local market. This is supported by HR, as well as including snow pay for three supervisors that are responding just like um, the streets division supervisors in case of uh, snow fighting. When they are called in, um, there is, in the MOU, there is, um, a stipulation for snow pay, and these three supervisors have been overlooked in the past, so we are addressing that now, and the upcoming season will, will include snow pay for them as well. Um, as Ben mentioned, we are providing now expanded hours of service by creatively scheduling staff on their 410 schedule. We are providing 60 hours of service Monday through Friday. So a total of 60 hours. Uh, we heard from our um, customers, who are uh, the police department, the, the waste and recycling division, that they will be better served if we were extending the hours after they are done with their shifts, so around 3 p.m., 4 p.m., when they are able to drop off their vehicles and have a quicker turnaround. So the downtime for, for these pieces of equipment uh, is minimized. So 60 hours of service now. Um, there is just, just a little gap. We were able to implement that on a, on a cost-neutral budget. However, now that we have almost a year of this uh, uh, expanded hours of service, we notice that one of the gaps is, is our c customer service office. We currently have a part-time staff that cannot work past certain hours, so we would like to um, uh, add uh, additional funding so we can convert it into a full-time uh, employee. That will give us three staff in the front office uh, spread out to cover the 60 hours total. Lastly, uh, this was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation with uh, the, the department-wide public services budget. We are, in this request, included in this 154 and I'm gonna explain why in just, just a second, but we are accounting for 1.4 million of projected increased cost of fuel for the next fiscal year, right? So we are calculating this um, with the numbers we had in January. Now, we can update that now, but that's gonna be chasing our tails because it changes by the minute. Right, so we are basing this projection on numbers we had available in January, understanding that the market is very volatile right now. It's unpredictable, um, and that may or may not require Council Member Pulley to come back with, with a budget amendment as we see how the market adjusts uh, through the fiscal year, right? Um, we also include some inflationary increases um, for parts, for utilities, and uh, admin fees. All right, this, uh, next slide, please. This is exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. So as, as you know, for the past, um, what is it now, three, four years, that consistently we have received in fleet funding through funding our future. That has allowed us to replace, replace some of the big ticket items in our uh, fleet inventory. The large um, equipment for streets, um, the, the, the large number of, of patrol vehicles in, in, in PD. And so when you, when you put that money in, it frees up the general fund dollars to replace general fund fleet vehicles. Right, So we have those categories under funding our future that allow us to replace vehicles that otherwise will pull away from the general fund. And when, when you see that uh, over the years, we have on the, far, on the far left, fiscal year 21, we had savings of $365,000 with incorporating funding our future money pulling away those, those um, old pieces of equipment, you know, like a street sweeper, 
It's very expensive. The maintenance, because we cannot replace it, is just eating us from inside. When we are able to replace it with a more efficient one, maintenance drops, right? And so we see those savings. And it also frees money to replace other smaller vehicles, such as, let's say, um, compliance small vehicles, right? That we, we normally wouldn't be able to because we are trying to replace larger pieces of equipment. So thanks to the Funding Our Future funding, we are killing two birds with one stone. We are replacing all large pieces of equipment that allows us also to free up some money and replace other vehicles in the general fund. The savings projected for the next uh, four years will be up to almost $2.7 million on maintenance. Our ask on the other side is for funding our future money to replace those specialized vehicles that we, I, I mentioned before. Um, next slide, please. We have two vehicles under the fire department and one uh, asked for uh, replacing 44 uh, vehicles in the police department. These are not going to be electric vehicles. The, the, the market is not there. There are no options that are um, uh, pursued rated, but we are incorporating hybrid SUVs that are highly efficient um, in their fuel consumption. Streets, 1.7 million will go to replace uh, four, there are six pieces of equipment total. Listed in the presentation, we have one loader, there is one uh, large pickup with a dump bed, another um, sweeper, as well as uh, three large trucks uh, with roll off capacity. So, funding our future for the win. I'm gonna let uh, Nancy present this, this uh, the next slide, please, which is a strategy to incorporate uh, more electric vehicles into our fleet. Hi, I wanna thank you for your time today. And I know that we are all excited about going electric in, in the city, and I am, I meet you in wanting to get there as soon as possible. Unfortunately, there's good news and bad news. The good news is the public is, is really taking advantage of some of the electric vehicle technology that's coming out, more of your sedans. And um, some of the pickup trucks that are coming out look really interesting, but we're finding that there, it might be more truck than what we need or not enough truck for what we need, and they are um, the manufacturers are pretty much releasing an upper-ended uh, or upscaled vehicles to target the general population. So that's good news because the, the general population is buying them up and we get air quality. Fleet gets to wait a little bit until some of these vehicles are spec'd more for what our needs are. And, and in that, I mean the interior is a little bit less than what they are, they are providing right now. Um, in the next two years, uh, I d I've been very conservative in what I project we will buy, be purchasing in electric vehicles. And I wanted to take this two years to get our infrastructure for fleet set up where uh, we have charging stations that are on-grid and off-grid because we want to be able to service our city if there is a brownout or blackout, as Orhe had said earlier. Um, in, 24, in, in 2024, we just found out that uh, the Chevrolet Blazer will have a pursuit-rated total electric vehicle um, for police and we are going to see quite a few more models coming out. And that's why this graph is very conservative. It's just waiting for the technology to, to be set up so that we could be in a position to go fully electric with, 
with the needs of the city. Sedans are, are, are available, but we only have so many sedans in the city and we've pretty much gone electric with those. What we're waiting for is the pickup trucks and then the, the larger trucks for our streets maintenance um, to come out so that we can incorporate, the, incorporate, incorporate those with a, the alternative fuel. Um, the other thing that we are looking at, and uh, we have been invited to go to LA to hopefully see this new fire electric vehicle that has a six gallon uh, range extender, and so we wanna see how that works. Um, so this slide is, uh, I know that we wanna go electric, and it looks really conservative for the first two years, but that's when technology is going to catch up. That's when we're, we're not asking anymore in fleet replacement this year because it's not available. Um, every time I buy an ICE vehicle, I'm making a commitment to our greenhouse gases for five to 10 years. So we're being very, very, we're, we're pulling back on what we absolutely have to purchase and looking at where our technology is going so that we can go alternative. And so this is the graph of what our savings will be um, in the next five years in fuel and in maintenance going to electric vehicles. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Are we, are you, I just, just wanted to add one more thing, if that's okay, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, part of this effort is an is analysis effort with, with the different divisions and, and departments to say, uh, can we push, can we, can we delay the replacement of your vehicle one more year uh, in, in, in hopes that we are able to, to get our hands on those electric options? So we are trying to, to delay the replacement so we, end up, we don't end up committing ourselves to keeping a, an ICE vehicle for the next five years. So we are trying to find, as, as Nancy mentioned, what are the, the vehicles in our fleet currently that must be replaced and, and unfortunately, in some cases, are, are, there are no electric options, right? Um, that that uh, sweeper, for example, th there, is no, there is one electric option, but when we assess our need, there is absolutely no way it will keep up with, with the usage that, that, that we require. So um, in, in, in efforts to, to, to wait just a little bit longer, there is a lot of analysis that goes uh, from, from fleet to, to say what vehicles must be replaced what vehicles can be delayed maybe a year or two um, so we don't, we don't commit ourselves to another ICE vehicle replacement. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Councilman Romano. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense to wait on some of these vehicles. If we can get a few more years out of some of these older vehicles um, and that allows the newer electric or more fuel efficient vehicles to come online, I think that's great. I also um, wonder... A uh, more general question, I know that maintenance is an ongoing cost and, and you have a lot of data to say when, we sh when a vehicle should be replaced so that the maintenance costs come down, but do we, have, do we factor in like embodied energy into that because the vehicle itself is the, like to manufacture a new vehicle, there's all these materials and things that go into that. So I know that's not a direct city cost necessarily, but it's a cost on the environment. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any analysis of that? Of like, maybe it's worth us keeping all of our vehicles a little bit longer, even if the cost of maintenance, direct city dollar maintenance is higher because that allows over the next 20 years, this, num this many fewer vehicles to be manufactured. Like, is that... It, does that factor into our equation at all? Yes. <laughs> um, so the longer we keep a vehicle, the older it is. And so your fuel technology is down, your maintenance costs go up, and, and then, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the production of those parts themselves that, that start to become obsolete for that vehicle. Your maintenance, and like I said, your maintenance costs go up. We also lose money on sending it to auction because at 
if we wait too long and it's broke down, it goes to auction and we get absolutely nothing, maybe scrap money. Um, and we also have higher downtime when we keep them longer, which means that it's not available for them to go and pave a street or, um, or respond to a, a call. Um, we need to make, our, make sure that our vehicles are safe and reliable. So yeah. holding them past that time, it doesn't make sense. But we are, but we're being very careful about what we replace. And through the fleet committee, it's we've talked to the departments to find out what can what can we hold on to, and will it work for another? Yeah, year. I mean, I guess I see things like a pickup truck or a sedan that can go to auction. That's someone's still going to be using that, so we're not putting things into the landfill. But. Right. Like a street sweeper, is there a second-hand market for a street <laughs> sweeper? Do those get sold I, I, to I, smaller cities? or? It's sometimes they do, and sometimes they rebuild them. So when our cost comes down here and the cost to maintain it is more than it's worth, that's when we need to let it go. Okay. That's when it doesn't make sense. And I guess just projecting forward, if we are kind of waiting on these newer vehicles to come through, um, we may need to be planning for a few years from now when we, right now we're not buying as many vehicles because we're waiting for new technology, but once that technology is available, are we going to have to have a bunch of money to buy all these new vehicles that need to be replaced? I think we're gonna have to replace them quicker, right? So that's something I'm not sure exactly who would be. We will certainly keep you, keep you posted, uh, whereas once, once it is available, we, were, we would like to get our hands on it. Uh, we we want to keep you posted, so there is no surprise on where we are doubling the ask just to replace this, these vehicles. So we, we will keep you informed on that, and, and we, will, we will happily do that. And I believe that will come at a budget year where we're no longer asking for $5 million for replacement vehicles, but we're going to hit you hard because we want to go electric. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate the conversation here because, you know, you, the staff report says that 19 percent of the fleet is um, beyond the recommended life and replacement is at $17 million and that's at today's dollar value and number of vehicles and that number of vehicles will probably increase every year as, you know, we, we're not replacing them as fast. So uh, I'm, con I'm concerned that we delay response for the beautiful truck right, right. when we end up with having some issues then we need to re replace the truck now and i'm hoping that we're looking at that th those replacements so we don't end up with f not enough vehicles to service the city we are looking at anything that is absolutely critical that we need to replace and that's what we're asking for we've also analyzed what is what we can push out a year, maybe two years, but again, it's, it's the most critical and working with departments of what we can replace now and keep, keep well under, and we're also keeping our eye out for an electric replacement. Wonderful. And I, um, oh. Council Chair, just, just to add, uh, the, the main driver of that cost is, is some of these larger pieces of equipment that, uh, you know, we, we we are, we are delaying more in the sense of they are still um, working fine. We're working with the division to say, what, what is your maintenance need? Uh, Nancy and, and her team analyze the cost. So yes, they are due for replacement. Can we do a couple more years? Yes, funding our future is helping us to get those out um, of, of our inventory. Wonderful, I have, I have another question, but go ahead, Council Member Pietro. Um on the vehicles we're talking about for the police department, mm. are those vehicles the police actually want or are they vehicles that we are buying for them out of our own? Now, I am like working with the police department. That is their rolling office. And, um, and I understand where their criteria, they need a little bit higher platform yeah. to prevent injury. Um, I am not going to force anything upon police that, that is not good for them uh, just to, as much so as these, i won't let them have a tesla you know <laughs> so um but we are working very very closely together okay so they're responsive to their needs yes there, there's compromise there as okay. well mm -hmm. thank you 
Council Member Fowler. I was just going to make a comment about talking to those people on the Hill about impact fees so that we could use those for police vehicles. So that would be helpful for yeah. And is, do we have like a piggy bank that we're putting saving money in so that when, since we're not buying cars this year, but we have to come back in three years, we'll have, no. <laughs> that I'd ask. We have not raised our, our fleet replacement ask from 5 million for, uh, I think it was 12 years. And, and we did not want to up that as, again, we want to wait for the technology and then I will be sitting here and asking you for more money at that time, but we will have something to back it up. I, I Councilman Pui. <laughs> I, uh, again, you're very surprised. I, I to team up with with the mention that uh, with the impact fees conversation, and I, we've been exchanging some messages on this. Um, and I, I understand that uh, it makes a lot of sense that may, maybe the legislature is not very happy about impact fees in general. Um, but I, it just uh, doesn't make sense that they exclude police uh, from using some of the impact fees. And I wonder if there is a uh, work that we can do as a city. And many, I bet many cities in the, in the state are interested in some of this and using some of these impact fees for some of the police equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, that's something that maybe we need to add into the negotiations when we're talking about with the legislature and, and make a push uh, to them to allow us to use some of that. Right. Certainly. Now, I, I just want to shift a little gears on the uh, staffing side of the house. Uh, so you're okay with the, st the current staffing levels and the current facility? I mean, are you outgrowing your facility? Uh, but you're okay there? No, not at this point. We, right. we, are, we are right there, exactly what we need. Um, there is just the one, the one staff um, for, for customer service. Um, one of the, the, the functions of that office, in, in addition to deal with vendors and receive, uh, receiving um, parts and, and equipment, is, is connecting with the staff that just dropped off a vehicle for, for maintenance. So the sooner we can contact and, and, and let them know that their vehicle is ready, the, the less downtime on that piece of equipment or vehicle. Um, unnecessary downtime, right? So that's, that's one of the main Great. drivers for this. Thank position. you. And I just want to put a plug in into uh, the use of uh, tier three gas. So that is huge on our air quality side of the house, and I uh, appreciate the uh, effort across the board to uh, use tier three gas on all our on our fleet. So uh, it's uh, it's a big bonus, and I'm, I appreciate that very much. Doesn't seem like there's any other questions, comments. All right, no. going once, going twice. All right, all right. thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ben. Staff, we're moving on to. Uh, Fiscal year 22 to 23 budget, sustainability department, and uh, refuse fund. And I have Sam coming up from the staff. Debbie Lyons is here. And Sophia. I also have Chris Bell. Okay, great. And Chris Bell, yes. That works. Sam, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> The Department of Sustainability is divided into two divisions, an enterprise fund over waste and recycling service and another over the city's sustainability and related initiatives is how the divisions are broken down. Historically, the environment and energy division, this- We can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh. Historically, the environment and energy division, this uh, sustainability division, would budget to receive funding from the operating revenues at the county landfill, uh, which is owned and operated conjunctively by the city and county. Factors such as increased costs and other operational considerations at the landfill have resulted in low funding inputs to the E&E division. Previous annual budgets have recognized dwindling cash reserves in the division. The department requests general fund transfers to subsidize ongoing projects and operations. The general fund request this year is a total 1.7 million. The division's projects and initiatives this year total about $2.1 million, and some of those are ongoing from previous years. The total budget request of the division, by contrast, is 3.4 million. So relative to the waste and recycling, it's smaller. 
The Waste and Recycling Enterprise Fund requests a fee increase of 15% this year for residential refuse and recycling collection services. Residential services include the city's call the hall waste removal program. The city's limited business recycling program also has a proposed increase. Previous budgets have recognized the Enterprise Fund's dwindling cash reserves and uh, increasing operating costs faced by the program. Consequently, a 12% fee increase is anticipated for next year's request, in contrast to this year's 15%. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd ask to turn it over to the department. Thank you, Sam. Debbie. Great. Thank you for having me today. I am pleased and honored to be presenting our fiscal year 23 budget. I'm going to keep my mask on because we had a COVID case in my house this week, or about a week ago, so I'm just going to keep it on and hopefully you can hear me. Um, as many of you know, I have had a very long career with the city. I've been here for 25 years working on environmental sustainability and, and waste and recycling. But this is my first year as a director, so I am humbled and honored to be here with you. Um, I, during my career, I have seen and had a hand in establishing uh, the sustainability department and uh, the trajectory that we have taken to become a national leader in sustainability. I deeply appreciate your commitment and the commitment of your predecessors towards setting really ambitious goals and uh, facilitating the funding to achieve those goals. Next slide. So as you all know, we are seeing and we are experiencing the impacts of climate change and poor air quality, and our residents are expecting the city to act on it. And when disasters happen, as you know, local governments are often the first to respond. And so it's in our best interest and our responsibility to reduce pollution and reduce our, our impact and increase resilience in our community. And so this is, why the uh, this is the reason why the sustainability department exists. We initiate system level changes that will reduce pollution and improve equity. And I think it's accurate to say that my team members, those that are sitting at the table with me, and the many who are not, believe wholeheartedly in our mission and consider ourselves fortunate to work every single day to help our environment and address these global and existential problems that we're facing. I'll say that equity is not a new concept or a lens or a new way of doing our work. We recognize that those who are most impacted by our sustainability work are people who have been burdened by the systemic and racist policies and decisions that have led to environmental degradation also cause many other social inequities. And so we see and appreciate a direct correlation between equity and sustainability. And so while we go about our work and as a city unraveling the system of inequity, we realize that it can be difficult and it can take a lot of time and it requires agility from all of us to be able to correct our course, um, admit when we're, we're taking the wrong path and get back on the right path. And we are committed to this work. Next slide. There are two divisions in our department. Operations is headed up by Chris Bell, who's sitting next to me, and they are our employees there, serve and see residents every single day when they pick up their garbage and recycling. And then our E&E division, Environment and Energy Fund, or the Sustainability Division, is headed up by Sophia Nicholas, who also serves as our deputy director. And they are the ones working on the policy issues um, and tackling climate change, air quality, and food security. Next slide. So we have been fortunate as a city that a lot of the progress that we've made over the past decade has been supported by landfill dividends and at times recycling revenues in addition to the city residents who pay for their uh, curbside services. Our situation has been unique. When we evaluated how other cities fund their sustainability efforts, most of them, at least in the Western states that we looked at, fund it through the general fund. So our situation where we have had 10 years of progress facilitated by landfill dividends was, was very unique to us. 
In 2020, the city of Denver had a ballot initiative that was passed and it raised their sales tax by a quarter percent. And that is what is funding their climate work going forward. So in the last 10 years, we've been able to do a lot. We put solar panels with this, with this landfill money. We put solar panels on over a dozen city facilities, our buildings downtown, fire stations, libraries, even a restroom at the regional athletic complex. complex. Uh, we built a solar farm next to the parks and public lands. And about right now, about 14% of our municipal electricity is coming from renewable resources. And we're working on a project right now that will bring us to 90% within the next year or so just for city operations. And we've got our eye on the target of 2030 for our entire community being powered by renewable electricity. We've installed the first set of publicly accessible EV chargers. We expanded the CNG fueling system at the fleet and streets yard. Uh, through this fund, we paid for the first year of an energy commissioning authority for the facilities division to look for energy efficiency upgrades that could result in savings to the city. And, and, and uh, this fund paid for uh, lighting upgrades and other efficiencies. We launched a citywide uh, or a, a, a statewide climate action network that convened a group of businesses and other organizations to collaborate on climate action. And now this network has spun off and is being run by the nonprofit Utah Clean Energy. We provided seed funding for the Culinary Incubator Kitchen, and now that has developed into a successful private business. We established a fruit share program where residents can sign up and have their, their fruit trees harvested. They get to keep some of the fruit. Some of the fruit is, is donated. And that program lives on with uh, the Green Urban Lunchbox, another nonprofit. We partnered with Utahns Against Hunger and provided matching funds for a federal grant that enabled our farmer's market for the first time to begin accepting SNAP EBT benefits and Double the Value, a program that's called Double Up Food Bucks. We entered an agreement with Wasatch Community Gardens to formalize the city's uh, community garden program, which is now coordinated through the Parks and Public Lands Department. And some of you may know uh, that the Sustainability Office hired the city's first open space manager, which has now transitioned into the Trails and Natural Lands Program. In the past 10 years, we also launched the citywide yard waste program and glass recycling, both curbside and drop off, which took us from about a 12 to 15% recycling rate to nearly 40%, 40. So those are the kinds of things that we work on. We look at these ideas and shifts in the system that can be, uh, uh, have great impact in the long term. Next slide. So this year, we're asking for your continued support. As was mentioned, for waste and recycling, financial resilience is very important to us, particularly because we provide an essential service that residents depend on every single day, and services that we're proud of and consistently get high marks for. So I'm asking you to, improve, to approve a 15% rate increase for our waste and recycling operations. And the second thing I want to highlight is a project that we have planned to conduct an evaluation of our waste stream and services and plan for the next decade of our goal to zero waste. For the E&E division, I am asking you to continue the path toward the E&E division being incorporated into the general fund and to fund the one-time and ongoing projects within our three main focus areas, and that is air quality, climate and energy, and healthy food access. And these are not requests that I make lightly, but it is a demonstration of this administration's commitment to air quality and sustainability, and a commitment that I am asking for your support as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Bell, who will go over his division, and then uh, Sophia will, will make a few remarks as well. So next slide. Okay, Council. <clears throat> This is my first budget presentation in, in person. Uh, I'm going into my third year in the city and the last two have been virtual, so this is great. <laughs> it's good to be back. Um, it's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Much we share. Um, 
anyway, thank you all for this opportunity. It's good to be with you uh, that much more in person uh, once again. And thank you um, to council staff as well as administration for uh, your ongoing support. We, we, we feel that acutely and, and I'm very grateful for that. And, and frankly, it's our continued license to operate. So we, we're grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> in this first slide, one of our smiling faces um, in that picture really uh, speaks to the human element of what we do. And that's kind of where I'd like to start. It really can't be overstated that our people um, in the city and our division, our department, are far and away our greatest asset. Um, it, it simply can't be over, overstated. Um, our division is made up of 55 of the most talented, passionate, resilient individuals that I've ever known. Um, they come together as a team every day, five days a week, including holidays, to deliver some of the most time sensitive services that the city provides, as Debbie mentioned. Um, they do so safely and consistently with a smile on their face, regardless of adversity, and, um, and continue to, to perform at a very high level. Um, frankly, I feel like the luckiest guy in the city because I get the privilege of leading them. Um, we love what we do. Next slide, uh, well actually, let me just kind of touch on um, our weekly services that, um, that we provide as part of our monthly rate. We, uh, that includes curbside weekly recycling, yard waste, and regular garbage collection. And, and integral to these weekly programs are our education and outreach team that monitor quality and ongoing contamination in our recycling and yard waste programs and drive, uh, drive the quality through those programs as well as outreach that they do at, uh, at numerous events, community councils, um, et cetera. They're a very key part of our team. Next slide, please. Uh, to continue our, um, our regular services, we have our call to haul bulk uh, waste service, which is an on-demand program that we provide residents up to uh, two pickups a year for that uh, continues to receive high marks as well and be very well received. Uh, folks like the on-demand nature of that and, and some of the enhancements that we successfully implemented this past um, uh, current fiscal year. Then we have our uh, uh, permits office that um, manages our, our special events, business and multifamily recycling, uh, subscription operation, and uh, construction demolition uh, recycling permits as well. Next slide. Who's got the slides? Thank you. Um, as Debbie mentioned, uh, with the 15% rate increase that we're proposing. This is uh, phase two of a multi-year program that we proposed last year with, as Sam mentioned, a 12% uh, rate increase that um, we implemented without issue this past year. Um, and, our, and our goal is to get back to a, a point in the next few years to a place where we can um, just charge a smaller, um, annual rate increase that's quite consistent with CPI. Um, and th which was mentioned as the kind of preferred option that our, um, our residents gave us through feedback in engagement surveys that we've done over the la last few years. So um, our goal there is, is again, maintain these high service levels, maintain our, and balance that financial resilience um, while really trying to minimize this the, the financial impact on residents, in, especially in the face of current inflation. So um, that, uh, that percentage increase translates to, um, for the most part, $3.50 a month. Uh, the 90-gallon container is, is by far the, the biggest piece of our subscription. Um, but you can see the, um, the annual impact there, just $42 and then on down. Um, this, uh, this also encourages our um, uh, downsizing um, that uh, that we look to residents to to try and do, and, and some of those conversations have already started um, since we've put this um, a mailer out with communication around this increase in the last week or two. So uh, even with the rate increase, again, trying to minimize the impact on residents, the we're allowing our our 
our fund balance to dip uh, to about a projected low of 11 percent. It, it's almost half of, of where finance would like us to be in terms of resilience level and, and kind of 18 percent of operating revenue. And then that's going to be illustrated a little better on the, um, on the next slide, please. So really the, the operative thing here on this slide is um, kind of draw your attention to two lines. The, the orange line, which is our um, fund balance, against the purple line, which is our, main, our, our, our target fund balance. Um, so again, allowing us to dip into a, a, a moderately you know, calculated risky level to take some of this hit, and then over the next several years get back to um, close to where that recommended percentage is. And in kind of real term round numbers, it's we're taking, we're allowing ourselves to just go to about one month's worth of expenses in the bank versus a target of two months of expenses in the bank. And that's for unforeseen things like windstorms and, and other uh, emergencies. Uh, as Debbie mentioned, the, the last key initiative of ours is our uh, request of $200,000 for um, a, a refreshed, renewed assessment of our current waste stream and identifying those opportunities that will inform that next decade or two of really actionable opportunities that, like last time, where we had you know many, many results from our kind of current pay-as-you-throw, basic pay-as-you-throw model to, um, to other implementations like yard waste. Um, but but really drawing that map in a in a um, in an equitable, impactful way, to uh, to set plans in place as soon as this assessment's done, and it, it's kind of time sensitive because these assessments take almost two years from from start to finish. So we we feel some urgency on that to to get that going now, and it is it is also um, completely aligned with the mayor's plan for for this year. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Sophia. Thanks. All right. Uh, again, great to be here in person. Thanks for um, all you do, and thanks for your support of sustainability over the years and last year in particular. Um, Can so, you advance the slide one more? Yes. Thanks for that reminder. I'm looking at it on my own screen, but you guys can't see my screen. Um, so. The E&E &E division stands for Energy and Environment. We work on all of the policy type programs within sustainability, uh, climate and energy, air quality as it relates to um, mobility and other air quality initiatives, building efficiency and building energy efficiency, healthy food ac access and equity, and then we have two engagement buckets. We have our community engagement and outreach more generally, and then our sustainable business program, the E2 program, as well as other ways that we engage with businesses. Next slide, please. So this uh, is just to put a face to some of these um, programs. These are our, our staff in E&E. &E. You can see we're a pretty um, small team um, working on things across the city that affect every department, every resident, every business, um, everyone in Salt Lake City. So um, I won't go through all the names, but uh, we're just really, I'm very grateful to be leading this team and, and they're such dedicated, passionate, talented people. So I wanted to share with you that picture. Next slide, please. So as Debbie mentioned, our goal this year uh, with the budget proposal is to continue our community informed energy, air quality and food work to take advantage of um, the opportunities with the uh, um, federal funding that's coming in for in infrastructure as well as other opportunities to make investments in electrification, both with our EV community and um, fleet needs as well as other equipment with electrification. And then finally, that sustainable funding source for our division. Next slide. So as Debbie mentioned, our uh, side of things, we've been very fortunate to have been funded um, with that special one-time disbursement from the landfill. We also annually do receive uh, tipping fees and other disbursements from the landfill, as well as recycling revenues when the markets are doing well. Um, we are 
glad to be getting those recycling revenues again this year, but we did have a few years where we, we did not receive those. So it's not something that we can count on each and every year. Um, because we have known that this situation it was coming for quite a while, we've been having conversations over the last several years with what's the best way to have a sustainable funding source for sustainability. And um, we explored a lot of different options. We looked at what other cities have done, as Debbie mentioned. Um, and because we really do provide a benefit to everyone in the city, it was determined by the attorney's office and, and others that, that it really does make sense for us to be seeking general fund support for the things that we do to benefit all residents. So we know that's not um, maybe something you'd like to hear. <laughs> There's a lot of demands on the general fund. We, we very much recognize that. Um, the good news is there are some um, revenues that we will continue to get from those, those landfill disbursements and, and recycling proceeds, fingers crossed, um, as we go into the future. So uh, we, we did lay out a plan uh, last, last year in our bu budget presentation, a four-year plan to begin this transition of receiving some funding from, from the general fund, and that did begin last year. Um, let's go to the next slide where I can show you the, the, the chart. So we did receive 440,000 last, this, this current fiscal year. Uh, for next fiscal year, we are asking for 890,000 to support our, our programming and operations, which is in line with what we proposed last year as well. Um, ramping that up to a $1.2 million ask for fiscal year 24. And then you can see that fund balance line, that orange line um, dipping to um, zero, where in fiscal year 25, we would need to be um, seeking most of our funding from the general fund. Could we um, get some clarification on the numbers um, from either Sam or Jennifer in terms of how, um, how we would articulate it in budget terms? Is this, is the total amount of money in FY23 the 890,000 or is it a different number? The 890, if I can just answer that, is related to just generally supporting the E&E division operations, and then there are additional um, funding requests for one-time projects that adds up to the 1.7. I do have a slide about that as well, which I can skip to if you'd like. Okay, so the yeah, we total, have it broken out in a the total slide. investment from the general fund in this department is 1.7. Right. Okay. Thanks. And I'll show, I'll show that slide um, last. We'll save the best for last. Um, but yes, uh, just wanted to touch, be, circle back on how we were asking for that last year. So if you go to the next slide. We are um, breaking our budget in this division really into to two things to, to talk to you about our ongoing projects and initiatives, those three buckets, air quality, climate and equity, and healthy food access. Um, same amount, sa same ask as last year, that 650,000 um, that we've broken up into to some ongoing and some new initiatives, which I'll go into now. So the next slide, please. So for air quality, we're looking for 345,000. This would really be used to support electric vehicle uh, studies as well as some O&M for our public station maintenance. You just heard the presentation from Fleet and Nancy. They are doing some fantastic planning. We're working very closely with them on um, how we can achieve those pretty ambitious goals that we have in the city that, that the council considered and, and passed in a resolution in December 2020. Um, where, where we really would like to be transitioning most of our fleet in the next few years to all electric. So they're doing a lot of planning, um, but we, it is quite complex because it involves not only fleet planning, but elec electric capacity and other needs. Uh, so we're asking for 150,000 to go to an internal consultant and then 150,000 also to, to support us with our community planning. And then the ongoing O&M that the sustainability department budgets for and pays for um, is 45,000, we're having conversations with public services to begin transitioning that to them in the next few years. Next slide, please. So the next, the next bucket is our climate and equity bucket. Um, so this is um, the 
non-anchor payment money, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but this is, this is our, our funding to support uh, communications consultant for the Community Renewable Energy Program. I think that was something that the council um, had recommended when I presented about that a few months ago, um, which was a great idea, as well as some funding to have uh, community-based organizations help us with that, with that outreach and design um, around our CREP program, which we have already started this year. Um, we continue to ask for Utah Claim and Action Network support as well as the uh, on-call legal support from um, uh, an, an attorney in case we need extra help with anything with Rocky Mountain Power. Next slide, please. And then our third bucket for ongoing program support is our Healthy Food Access Initiatives. We have started our second cohort of the Resident Food Equity Advisor Program. They've had their, se their second meeting last month. So 35,000 to support um, that program into the next fiscal year. We are also um, asking for 35,000 to pilot a microgrant program. And we really like the idea of a microgrant program because it, it helps the city fund existing organizations that are doing a lot of the work in the food space, but perhaps could use a little bit more support in line with the recommendations from the resident food equity advisors last year. And then finally, we are looking to finish our community-informed update of our community food assessment, which will help lay out the plan for the next 10 years of how the city can continue to engage um, on food across a range of different topic areas. So the next slide. So now uh, we've, we've broken our budget. I t just talked about the ongoing programs. Now I'm going to talk about the one-time projects. You can see here, uh, what those, I'd like to think of them as things we're sponsoring through our department, um, not necessarily our, our um, staff and, and, and ongoing project support, but things that we have helped other departments and we're helping other um, initiatives move forward. So we have our, uh, I'll, I'll go into it now on the next slides, but we can come back to that table if you'd like to see it. So next slide. The first one is the Community Renewable Energy Program second and final anchor payment. And um, we've been working very collaboratively with 15 other communities that are moving forward on the Utah 100 commitment. Uh, Council Member Dugan, um, Council Staff Sam Owens have been fantastic um, collaborators on that. So we re really appreciate your investment and support on this. There's a lot more we can talk about here, so I'm not gonna um, spend too much time, but we can come back at any time. <laughs> Uh, so it's the second and final anchor payment to, to get that program off the ground. Next slide, please. Once again, we're asking for funding for the Community Electric Landscaping Equipment Exchange. Um, we, this will be the third, third year that we work with the DAQ, Utah DAQ, to run that program. Um, every year they change it in terms of how they do it. Um, so our goal is to, to work with at least 750 residents and continue our outreach across the city to um, um, swap out this equipment because gasoline um, lawnmowers and gasoline um, leaf blowers and edgers and, and all of that, it really, it, they don't have catalytic converters. They put out a lot of pollution given how small they are and it is at the, the home and the neighborhood level. So it is, it is actually something that um, is a very tangible thing that the city can do to not only reduce pollution um, locally, but it has other benefits, right? It's quieter, it's cleaner. Um, people have really appreciated the city's involvement in this. Next slide, please. So our other one-time ask is for infrastructure, for those electric vehicle charging stations themselves. We have been working closely with other departments. Um, we formed uh, a, a, a series of subcommittees and a, an electric vehicle, electrified transportation committee um, working across the city to identify opportunities for EV charging stations. We currently have about 20, I think it's 20 public ports now. That was the low-hanging fruit from a few years ago where we looked at where do we have electrical capacity, where are there opportunities for us to place charging stations, but this next level of, of siting is a little more complex. And um, this ask is for 
Um, six new stations, 12 ports. You can see some of those potential sites we're exploring down below. This uh, 214,000 does not include money that we would be uh, getting reimbursed for from the federal government or the state government. We anticipate that upwards of 80% of that would be recovered. So. But we do want to have, um, I, didn't, I don't know if I touched on this earlier, but with, with our electrified transportation planning, there's a lot of money coming f through the infrastructure bill and other uh, Rocky Mountain Power and state government. And so it, it really is important for us to be thoughtful about that process and that planning, planning process that we're doing, which is why um, we have this broken down. This ask is for equipment. The previous ask was for the planning so that we can take advantage of that, that money coming towards us. Final, last slide, next slide. Uh, finally, on our one-time asks, we have been looking um, at how we can, talking with the Public Lands Department on, on what they can do next to elect, continue electrifying their equipment, have identified um, $450,000 worth of equipment that could be transitioned. Mainly, this is um, riding lawnmowers, eight electric riding lawnmowers. And my last slide, next. So just to sum it up, on the next slide, there we go, is uh, that question um, that you had, Cindy, where we have our this broken down with the uh, operational transition ask um, from the general fund. It includes the 450 that's listed in the budget book, new in fiscal year 23, the 440, which is the carryover from fiscal year 22, the salary adjustment recommendations based on HR's reviews, and then our one-time project asks, which are listed underneath that. So with that, we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Councilmember Fowler. Sorry, I have a bunch of questions and I'm gonna try to figure out this table because my, my, Oh wait, let me do one calculation. Hold please. Somebody else can I'll ask, ask a question quick question. I'm very interested in the 2040 zero waste plan and I'm not sure exactly what that means and I probably should wait till after budget to ask the question because I imagine it's an in-depth answer but I would love to schedule a meeting to learn more about that and um, what, like, what does it actually mean and what does it take to get there because it feels ambitious but important. Um, I've made the suggestion a few times, but I think that the waste uh, fees that are charged to residents, I, I, I feel like there's a way that it could be better aligned with people's waste production habits and where rather than just charging a flat monthly fee, we charge them each time their trash can gets picked up. And I know we do that a little bit with the different size cans, but I mean, if I have to pay an extra, you know, $5 for the second time or third time in a month that my trash can gets packed up, I might actually recycle, you know, I might actually be more concerned about uh, recycling more. And I, I think economic, not that I'm not, I am concerned about that, but I think uh, aligning what we pay with our conservation efforts is really important. So some of those things are, I think, just uh, ways that we can encourage our residents and all of us to, to produce less waste. So I'd love to keep figuring out if that's possible. I know other countries have systems that kind of mirror that. Can I do a follow-up with that? that? Similarly, in the vein of, of environmental justice, acknowledging that we have lots of multi-generational families, in particularly in ethnic neighborhoods where we have fewer contributing monetary contributors in the household, uh, having safety net funds that would help alleviate that sort of system would be absolutely structurally important to anything that we plan or integrate to your if if i can if i can take that to your initial question around what does that plan you know what does this assessment or plan look like that that assessment that will be done through a consultant uh, through a competitive bid process much like we did about a decade ago will inform and and s provide strategies and thoughts around doing exactly what your asking and and so we get that feedback and 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 structurally with that with that study 
you know, we're, we're saying apply a lens of, of equity and environmental justice to, to keep all of these things in mind. We're, we're completely aligned around trying to drive um, an equitable, um, really, pay, you know, more sophisticated pay-as-you-throw model to, to, to drive waste reduction and, and individual behaviors. But this, this assessment um, that, that does take a while to complete because it's very comprehensive, it takes into account what our, what our waste consists of, um, because that's always evolving. It's, it's probably different than it was as a city as we grow 10 years ago, um, you know, compositionally. So anyway, don't want to go on too long, but, but this is going to help us roadmap strategies to achieve exactly the things that you raised. I'll make another quick comment. I think in regards to a lot of the air quality goals that we have, great. I, I think making sure that we're, uh, I mean, air quality is a problem for our entire city, but especially I think on the west side where we have the inland port coming in and the airport exists there and refineries. So uh, I would be interested in seeing numbers um, and then knowing what our goals are to, for instance, the the landscape equipment exchange program. Are we putting extra effort into advertising that on the west side. Um, I see the electrified transportation. There, I think there's only two of those that are west of the freeway that are in the proposed new locations for electric vehicle charging stations. So wondering if maybe we need to think about more infrastructure on the west side to support west side, west side residents, given the fact that they have more of the air quality generators and um, uh, their residents suffer a disproportionate effect of those things. And, and that's exactly why we are looking for um, a consultant to help us with that process, including public engagement, to see both the overlay of where people want chargers, where there's density, where there's desire, and making sure there's an equitable component into the geographic locations. Thank you. Council Member Fowler. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's been a long day and I do need a flow chart apparently. So if you, if we go to this slide that it says the SLC uh, green base project budget, which is a few slides back, I believe, but this is where the, the breakdown of the 650,000 comes from. Is that 650,000 a part of the original 890,000? Like, is that a further breakdown? Like if I have 890,000 up here in a box, then I break it down and there's 650,000 front of that and this is what that 650,000 is? Yes, okay. Um, I needed to know that so that I, because my numbers were off. Um, now, I have some questions up there but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, if I go down to the one-time projects, um, well, it appears that we're calling at least the Community Renewable Energy Program payment and the Community Electric Landscaping Equipment Exchange one-time projects. There's, they're probably not. Like, they're probably going to come back because the, the Community Renewable Energy Project is will. This is the second and final payment, so that will end. Okay, so that one will end. What about the equipment exchange? Um, the Community Equipment Exchange could end. <laughs> It's, it's not something that um, builds upon itself year after year. So the, that's probably why we called it the one time. It's is, and it's, sorry if I'm, it, this is yes part of the lawn por, lower, lawnmower program or not? The 250? Yeah. That's the community lawnmower exchange that we do. Okay. We partner with DAQ. So considering this is the second year that we funded this, this is more likely an ongoing project because I can't until all of the lawnmowers in the state of Utah are electric or Salt Lake City are electric. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I, and I, I just think it's important to point that out because I don't think that we um, take good programs and fund them for a couple of times and then as, as politicians want to be like, well, that was a really good program. See you later. And so it's better for me personally if, if I'm looking at that in a future budget as well, thinking, you know, we're probably at least for a couple more years, this is going to 
be again in that overall budget. And this is, Im again, important to me because, as is stated, we're transitioning from a fully general fund subsidy for this department, potentially. And so when we're looking at that next 24, the fiscal year 24 of 1.2 million, is that what that ask was? Um, oh, yeah. it, it seems that we might as well add this 250 in there, right? And that we might as well look at some of these other things that seem to be or look like one-time projects but maybe aren't, and so that we can have a realistic view of what a future subsidy ask is going to look like. Sure. And one of the reasons why we provided so much detail is so that you could see every single thing and make that deliberation and say, you know, is this something we want as a council to, to continue to fund or figure out a way to, to you know, just incorporate it as a, a general activity? So, yeah, we wanted to provide you that detail to, so that you could, you could look and I, the menu of options. And I, I appreciate that. So I, it's, I'm wrapping my head around where all of this is going. And again, flow chart and... 530 of budgets yeah. so <laughs> I, I think too we it, it's probably a misnomer to call it a one-time project in some ways but it's it's a it, it's a it's it's not funding staff it's funding lawnmowers it's not funding us to develop new programs and so that that's the distinction with us is that it's a transfer to DAQ to help us buy lawnmowers for people so. no and I understand that but again I wouldn't say I'm an expert at budgets at, by any means, but I've been here a couple of times. And I would say that we often will say, oh, look at this great program, and there's $250,000 there. And then maybe that program ends, but a, a department will be like, but we can have this other great program that is similar to landscape equipment exchange, but now it's weed whackers, I don't know, something, right? And we need $250,000. So realistically, I, I see what you're saying, but I've also seen departments be like, oh, we're going to do this other thing. So for me, it's just more realistic to say, is this going to come up in an in, in FY24 budget? And if so, let's add it in now. So there's an expectation there. Councilman Pui. So I have a few questions related to, well, one of the things that Councilmember Romano mentioned, uh, you know, it will be interesting to me to find out how much it will cost our city to uh, be smart about garbage and, uh, and see, you know, how much it will take from us to be able to do that. You know, we are, you know, most likely the most progressive and forward-looking city in the, in the state. And, uh, you know, we can set the bar high uh, and maybe we can look at, uh, at that in a way, uh, in a more progressive way, in a more uh, smart way, right? And uh, so that, that will be something that I would like to, to hear. Maybe there is, maybe we actually need to pay a consultant to tell us how much it will cost and what technology we need to implement to, to find out if we can charge neighbors by their use therefore encouraging you know people to use be smarter about this uh, and then we can also probably track down uh, you know infractions about you know who's using wrong you know putting things in the wrong way and maybe saving costs that way so we don't have the garbage police so we don't have to have them I call them that so um, garbage police um, no no my favorite uh, position well thank you all those uh, city employees <laughs> that do this work um, but uh, so the, the related to the lawnmower exchange, I would like to know a little bit the breakdown by district. Uh, you know, the, the, the breakdown of the, who is using it. Maybe a few years back, it will be interesting to me to find out That's true. because I know that this year I had a few messages from people that they missed the deadline. It's hard to reach out everybody, right? But I would like to know if there is a way to uh, to do better, uh, being uh, being equitable requires more work uh, and uh, it, you know it requires m a much bigger effort no that we're not doing that but maybe we can improve and maybe we can I missed the line to tell my you know put it in my in my uh, uh, to make an extra emphasis on my own newsletter because I didn't I missed it I mean I, that could have been an easy ask from me I said hey can you put this in your newsletter at least you know so that that's one of them and uh, on the lawnmower exchange um, it feels to me that th this program is great. I understand these engines are b very bad, but then we have Home Depot, Lowe's, 
other companies selling them. So I wonder if there is a way to use some of these efforts and trying to get them to stop selling them. Um, and uh, you know, from let's try to cut it out. No, yes, people will go buy them online. People will move to Utah with them to yeah. But but we have a few stores in Utah and Salt Lake already that, that are selling them. I can just go get one right now. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we need to get them on on board to say like, this is not. We don't want this kind of engines here. You know, can can we? Can we partner uh, on this? And I, I, I wonder if there is some, some of this there missing. Um, maybe some of this money needs to be used in a different way. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, I just want to think about this, and maybe there is something there. And I, uh, you know, I challenge them, you know, your, your department to think about this, and I will start thinking too. Of my, and we have a good relationship with some of these partners already. So, um, I uh, again, uh, and just the last thing is environmental mitigation. We are probably going to have some funds from the inland port uh, on environmental mitigation, and I wanted to s to find out if it will fall into this department some of this, and uh, if so, how it will work, or maybe we don't know yet, maybe because this this is still like a, up in the air. But I, you know, can can some of these monies be used for some of these um, these programs that we have uh, related to the west side? Maybe, uh, uh, yeah. I'll leave it out there. Thank you. Councilmember Pietro. Um, the proposed lawnmowers for public lands, does that represent a redundancy? I see that we have uh, a little over $5 million proposed in public lands for capital expenditures, but I don't see where it's listed out exactly what those capital expenditures would be. Is there any way for us to find out if public lands are budgeting for something that's also being budgeted elsewhere inadvertently? Yeah, we can ask that. That would be an unresolved question. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you've coordinated, so this yeah. is not a redundancy? I would assume, because we worked very closely, we wouldn't know how much to ask unless we knew that it was possible and knew how much they were going to be. So. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me see. I think most of my questions were already answered. I uh, appreciate that. I mean, if you look at our priorities as a city, you know, air quality, water quality, our health all kind of go together, right? So this is, you're doing very important work for us. Uh, yeah, the lawnmower program, I mean, it sold out last year pretty pretty fast, right? And I expect it to do it again this year, but there is a cost to that. The EV program, again, it's, is there a lot of demand for our EV chargers right now? I, I bet you there is, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends. Certain ones are busy all the time, but we get questions. Your office probably gets questions constantly about where's the city going to install the next EV chargers? Um, so we, we want to have some good answers for that. Yeah, and I think the, the idea about, you know, pay for you go on garbage pickup. Yeah, these are all good stuff. But, you know, bear in mind that w air quality is, is uh, on the, it, one of our priorities. That all affects our mental and our uh, physical health. So thank you very much. But I, Councilmember Fowler's got one. Oh, Maybe sorry. Oh, you sorry. Skipped one? I, I thought you guys were done. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Councilmember Fowler. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hey, uh, so thank you. I, w you mentioned some of these one-time projects that you usually get reimbursed or about eighty percent. That is it for all of it or for just some of it or what? It just depends on the uh, the grant funding source. The EV, she was talking mostly about the EV charging, and there's a lot of federal funding coming forward. Okay. Uh, between uh, and Rocky Mountain Power um, has a lot of interest in in helping build out public infrastructure. So Great. we will be leveraging as much of that as we For can. Sure. <laughs> so that yeah, if we can get, I mean, eighty percent is not small, you know, not small feat. So then th that number reduces a bunch. Um, my other other things that you know, in terms of refuse and. Um, I think if we might have to do like some sort of like for, in terms of equity, in terms of the you know, West Side um, residents that might not have you know the the funds to fund, I mean to pay for recycling and things like that, you know. Um, but it's also a behavior issue. I worked, I worked with this department before uh, when I was not at the city. I went knocking on doors in each of the doors in the West Side in District One, especially uh, with a consultant in like educating people about 
recycling, how it could be cheaper maybe this way, and also cross contaminations and stuff. But it takes quiet our communities, at least including myself, and I see it as well with some of my clients, it takes quite the effort to change behaviors. Um, I can't remember when we did this, but I'm not sure if you have done it again, but maybe it is a matter of, again, knocking on people's doors, and now that we have a lot of Spanish speakers, like even ourselves, just to go and say, hey, you know, these are expenses, this is expensive overall, but if you were going to do some recycling, it could reduce your refuse expense overall. Um, and then, what else I was going to say? You know, and and then, you know, and not to, and you guys have heard me talk about the incubator kitchen, but you didn't mention this, um, Debbie, and I was looking at the number of applications that Square Kitchen has had since it's open. So we're over at 100 new businesses that's all, like, you know, that Square Kitchen or the incubator kitchen has produced. And so that's quite the, the number for, $700,000 that you guys uh, asked for, t you know, 10 years ago. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention that since you didn't. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I appreciate the comments around recycling and education. So our, our education team that I'd mentioned engages with residents every single day. Um, and, and now that we're back to somewhat normal, uh, we are re-engaged on our what we call knock and talks doing exactly what, what you mentioned. Um, just to clarify, again, recycling is included in the, in the monthly rate, mm -hmm. but to your point, most importantly, driving that education and awareness and, and habitual behavioral change can help manage costs down by recycling more, uh, which we will provide a second recycling container for if somebody would like to, to reduce their, their can size. Um, so hopefully that helps. but. And, and there's no finish line on that. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember Count, Wharton. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, I, can you remind me how many, how long has it been since we, or sorry, how many years in a row have we raised fees for um, garbage and recycling? We raised fees last year, mm -hmm. and that was the first time since 20... 15. 2015. Yeah. Fiscal years. year 2015. Yeah, fiscal 15. Yeah. Okay. There and so... Year, there was a seven-year gap there. Okay. And this... And did we do 15% last year as well? 12. 12. 12. And then next year? Approximately 12. We, we feel like it'll be somewhere around 12 for the next few years until we can get back to sort of more of a CPI-aligned small percentage increase. Okay, it's, how do we, um, so if we don't know how exactly how many years we're gonna have to have um, an increase and exactly what percentage um, it needs to be each year to get, to get back to where the place we were in in 2014 that allowed us to not have to raise fees for a while. Um, why, why does it have to be 15% increase this year? It comes to, down to the, the cash balance. Uh -huh. um, we will be dropping, so we want to keep at least a two-month uh, cash balance to, to pay for two months of operating expense or an 18% cash balance. Mm -hmm. um, and as we calculate uh, what we project to spend by the end of this fiscal year and next fiscal year, we are dropping b below that, that recommended cash balance. And so we just watch that cash balance line and adjust accordingly um, every year. And I think, you know, we do sort of a 10 year projection and I think um, we hope to get to that CPI around fiscal year 28. So it's not like 15% forever. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it just, it will depend on costs and how things. Okay, and if we didn't do that, yeah. we would just have to allocate more out of the general fund. We no. don't get general fund allocation into waste and recycling. That is a, okay. a fee-based program. Okay, so, so it would just drop our cash balance to almost nothing. Okay, but then what would happen at that point? Then would we have to fund with general fund dollars? Either that or cut a program. Okay. So 
um, I think a, uh, an overriding theme for me um, today is trying to um, explain to residents why these changes um, are necessary, why we pick the numbers that we're picking um, or that are being proposed, and what the consequences are of not choosing those numbers, whether that whether it's zero percent increase or thirteen percent increase or eight percent, whatever. Um, so um, it, I guess it's it's hard on this this particular one because it, it it's hard to articulate what the goal is that we're trying to get to, um, and does this is this the biggest impact or the biggest change? Is that the rising cost of dumping fees that the county assesses, or what is the what is the thing that is con constantly driving this up? Well, our biggest our, our biggest costs are our um, fleet and people. So the things that impact our fleet costs and our and our employee costs. Yeah, people, equipment, fuel, fuel and maintenance. Right, right. Okay. So sorry, maybe I didn't ask the question very clearly. Um, so a resident sees, you know, here's okay, it's going to be a fifteen percent increase this year, and next year it might be a twelve percent increase. Um, if it's not dumping fees that are pushing that cost up, is it that every year we're adding 15% more garbage cans? Like what, it, how would you explain to residents um, what is pushing that up it, to this number that we don't know, um, or that we don't ultimately know how long it's gonna be and how many years it's gonna take? Does that make sense? Is that a better way of asking it? Yeah, and I think, I mean, so <laughs> maybe I'm not answering um, any differently, but it, it's, a, it's a combination of like fuel costs going up and personnel going up. So if we did not raise the fees this year, we would have less flexibility to pick up tree branches in the wind, uh, you know, during a windstorm, or hmm. um, we just have that much less financial resilience, and um, it could impact operations where we would have to uh, start looking at, at, at cutting some, some services. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I've been working on the, prior to my role now, I was the communications manager, so led the, the rate survey that we did in 2019 where we were asking for feedback on exactly these questions. And I think what's a little bit hard to understand sometimes um, is just that if we're not cutting services, costs are going up. If we're maintaining services, costs are going up because there's always a general rate of inflation, and now it's much higher. We're actually not recovering anywhere close to what we're experiencing this year. Mm -hmm. But um, just maintaining what we have means that there are increases along that you know, baseline CPI. Um, so that's why we, we did the, the survey in terms of requesting, for re requesting feedback on how residents wanted to see those fee increases. We got into the position where it had been so long that we had, since we had done one, that that's why we're in, that, in this position of the 12 percent and 15 percent and 15 percent residents expressed to us that they did not like to see those long gaps with that sudden larger increase and so we're trying to get back to the place where it will just hopefully if we can you know bring that to you each year um, it will be that smaller general inflationary rate to keep us at that at that level that's not surprising folks yeah sure and I don't I I'm not advocating that we should um, I don't think that one, it's necessarily wrong or right to say, you know, you should not do an increase um, for a longer amount of time and then do a bigger increase or, you know, d go to a system where you're having a year of no increase and then, a, a, you know, smaller, more frequent increases. I think reasonable people can disagree of what's better. Um, we're doing that right now. Um, but the difference with with the the fees for waste collection that I think are that I'm finding a harder time explaining to residents and justifying the numbers that we're picking and saying I don't know how many years there's going to be increases of between 10 to 15 percent is that that's not similar to the other fees that we're we're increasing right we can say we're, we're proposing this increase to, for example, water for this many years because of this reason. 
Um, and it's, I think it's harder to understand um, with recycling that if, if it's not, or, and waste, if it's not coming from the landfill, you know, what, what is driving that? Um, and then how come we aren't able to calculate every year we're going to anticipate that we're always going to have to raise 5% because of the cost of, of being in the waste recycling business. Does that yeah. make a little more sense as to yeah, why? Uh, 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 and in, in years past, um, fee increases were proposed when there were, there were changes like that. There were significant changes in services and then fees were not raised. So we would, we would do like a $5 increase and it would bring the cash balance up to a level that was higher than, than what we needed, and we would just draw that down over several years. Right. And so we want to... <laughs> right, and I personally sort of don't think that that's the right way to do it. Right. Like, I think and so we're most, playing catch-up yeah. now. The yeah. seven year, the, covering this seven-year gap, we already felt quite acutely, quite frankly, going into last year. In the face of current inflation, that I don't think anyone in this room anticipated 12 months ago, now it's really, really critical. Um, I mean, fuel alone has tripled, mm -hmm. um, if not quadrupled in some cases. So it's, it's just, we're, I mean, to put it in plain terms, we're feeling the effect of trying to make up that, that seven year gap. However, over the, to Debbie's point, over the next, we see we see that the light at the end of the tunnel is three to five fiscal years away to a point where we can get back to a, a smaller reasonable in, in, a smaller sane increase that um, that is more palatable and, and aligned with what folks really want at least you know according to the feedback we got if you think it'd be helpful we could we do have a website slcgreen.com slash rates and we could put the proposals out uh, further into the future years, if that would be a helpful resource for you and other folks. But I just want to say too, um, sometimes you, you might hear if you get flack from people that say, why isn't the city picking up our yard waste in February? Um, that's a cost saving measure that we're using. So um, just to let you know about that. Right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. And um, so I understand, you know, inflation costs and we're growing like incredibly, right? And, and so I can understand needing those services. I'm wondering if um, any part of the, the sort of waste and refusals, the re recycling side of the house that gets, I've picked that phrase up from Dan and I don't know how I feel about it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that, these, the revenue generated from there is also in part subsidizing any of the programs over in sustainability. I'm seeing a head nod no. I mean the fees that we, the recycling revenue? Yeah. The recycling revenue right now is, yes, it's funding the E&E side of things. It is not going back into that waste and recycling fund. Okay. But, but that is a, I mean, that's. The monthly fees are not. They're, those are separated, though. Yeah. The monthly fees that people pay go directly to waste and recycling. The recycling revenues go into the E&E fund. Mr. Chair, to clarify, uh, recycling revenues being the ones that come from the landfill, not from the city's recycling services that are paid for from the rates. So the rates are handled separately entirely, and the revenue that funds E&E is from the... Am I stating that correctly? Recycling. So there's from the MRF. The, um, so at times the recycling yeah. markets are high enough where we get a check. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And those are going to fund E and E projects. The rates themselves are the going simply to this to basically the O and M of the trucks and the the salaries of the the people yes. in the trucks. Yes. And whatever else equipment. Okay. Um, Uh, you know, I have this question, and it's apparently the theme for the last this last year and this year is um, sort of the sustainability of the office itself as its own department, and looking at um, the programs that we have, the redundancy of programs we have potentially 
again, not saying there is, and sort of asking this question as a discussion um, of programs that may be in can or may be out of hand and funded in other ways or or maybe somebody in the nonprofit world is already doing some of it and we could sub create partnerships with them, right? Some, some PPP partnerships. Um, and so I, I'm curious, and, and again, if at this point we're, this year we're subsidizing um, 1.7 or something, right? And next year it'll be more than that, without a doubt. Um, and we're going to continue that without necessarily having revenue coming in for those programs to support and sustain the programs that we have, right? And, and I think that's a policy question that needs to come to the council of where, what, is, what are these programs doing? And I appreciate programs, but are we reinventing the will elsewhere? Can it be absorbed somewhere? And I don't think that we've really had some of that deep policy discussion on um, some of these community initiatives. Again, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying, is it time to come back and look at where we're at? And you know, I can, you all know that I'm a champion of golf, but every year we have this also same conversation of the general fund subsidizing this basically program. And I mean, I don't know how many times I've sat in, in this chair or one of these chairs and had a fight with another council member about it, right? Um, so I, I just think that there may be a moment that we need to come back and actually have a really deep policy discussion um, about the office and the programs and what we're doing with them. Um, because the price, not that we don't need the department, but the price isn't gonna go down. And we're just, we have to figure out a way to fund that or streamline those things. That wasn't a question, it was just out there. A thought. Um, I, I kind of just say to some thoughts after Councilmember Fellers that, you know, it, it almost, like to me, it feels like if the ask is like $1.7 million out of our general fund to do all of the things that we want to in terms of environment and air quality and do things here and there so that we can improve the air quality because that's something that we have all said that we value and care and want and look forward to the future and having a clear environment. To me, that doesn't s seem like a huge ask. We are being asked by other part departments for a lot more money that is still very unclear what the mission or what the purpose or is it really needed, like the golf, right? Like it's, golfing is something that um, is a lot of open space. It, it's, a, it's a very expensive sport. We provide a very cheap sport, but is it something that it's, is it helping with the environment? I don't know, like, you know, we, we always have to talk about priorities. What, yeah, and so that's, what, that's how I look at this division. Yeah, of course we need to look into streamlining and see what else can they do or what else, somebody else doing the same thing for sure, but if that's the only ask, then I'll be okay. We, we uh, you know, we pay for a lot of other things that we shouldn't be paying for and we do. So. And okay. Mr. Chair, if I may respond. Okay. Um, I, I recognize that it's not, you know, we get asks for a lot more than 1.7 million. I understand that. My thing is that I don't know that we've had that deep policy discussion. And that is where I feel that we need to be a little more involved and make sure, I mean, we did it with the RDA, we've done it with CAN, we, I, the police, right? And this ask isn't gonna go down as we continue either adding programs or changing needs or growing as a city. And so, as we prepare for the next budget, we already know it's gonna be at a minimum of what we're projecting is 1.2 million, right? And, and to be fair, that's probably a minimum. And so as we know that that's coming and probably more than that, then before the next budget, I think it's important that we sit and have that policy discussion about the department and what the mission goal and all, all of our goals are. Um, yes, clean air. Woo, are we doing the right programs for it, right? And, and that's, again, sort of the theme I've had uh, of a lot of the departments is the streamlining. Not, it's not a huge ask. It's 
Are we doing it efe efficiently and effectively? I would welcome that conversation. I would really appreciate that because um, it does, you know, it feels a little bit, I feel vulnerable not having that discussion. And um, I, I think that will help ground us and, um, and, and be more aligned with, with what you all want to fund and where you all see the gaps. Because we try, we, we work across all departments and we try not to duplicate anything that they're doing, but we find those gaps, right? Where how can we assist you or how can we be of help to move this needle that we're trying to move? And um, I, I think it would be really beneficial to have that policy level discussion. So thank you, council member, for suggesting that. Thank you very much, and I appreciate uh, the future discussion on this uh, subject, but uh, time for dinner. Sorry, our brains are fried, and we're going to be taking our 30-minute dinner break at this point. We're about an hour and 15 minutes behind, uh, but we've had some deep discussions and some very powerful discussions, but we also uh, have some future discussions to have. So thank you very much for your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Thank you. Those are my favorite. Welcome to Capital City News, your source for staying informed and engaged with Salt Lake City government. I'm your host, Brian Young, with SLC TV. This week, we sat down with Mayor Mendenhall to talk about her budget priorities as we head into the next fiscal year. Our History Minute is about the early bike lobbyists who got the streets in Salt Lake City paved. But before we get to those, let's take a look at our legislative update, our lookbacks, and take a look at road construction. At its May 3rd meeting, the City Council heard the Mayor deliver her annual address for her proposed budget, discussed further options for new district boundaries, and renamed the City's Housing and Neighborhood Development Division as the Housing Stability Division. At its May 10th meeting, the City Council received a budget overview for the next fiscal year and voted unanimously to enhance the safety of Salt Lake City by changing the standard speed to 20 miles per hour on all streets unless otherwise posted. To learn more, visit slc.gov council. 
Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall and the city's Urban Forestry Division planted trees at Rose Park Elementary School with kindergarten students and faculty in celebration of Arbor Day. These trees are going to make a giant wall of shade on the playground on the soccer field here in the hot afternoons in summer. It's going to be like a wall of green trees shading the lawn. It's going to be amazing. To learn more, visit the Salt Lake City Urban Forestry Division's website. Last month, Mayor Mendenhall proclaimed April Fair Housing Month. The mayor joined partners from the community at Valor House, a supportive housing facility operated by First Step House in partnership with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and the Housing Authority of Salt Lake City. They spoke of the need for accessible accommodations in housing and business. Fair housing, it isn't just the law, it's the way that as a community we can t say to those of us who want to call Salt Lake City home that no matter who you are, there's a place for you here and we are dedicated to making sure of it. To watch the complete event, please visit our YouTube page. In honor of Small Business Week and in coordination with the Department for Economic Development, Mayor Mendenhall visited six small businesses across the city who have benefited from Salt Lake City programs. From Quarters Arcade Bar in downtown to the Neighborhood Hive in Sugar House, you can watch all of her visits on our YouTube channel. Mayor Mendenhall and the City Council appeared on the steps of the state capitol in support of abortion rights in the United States. The, the decision of abortion is an individual decision that is one of the most difficult decisions a woman may have to make or choose to make in her life, and it is hers and hers alone. To watch the complete event, please visit our YouTube page. For our road construction update this week, we're going to take a look at projects on 200 South and 900 South. You may have noticed that the 200 South reconstruction project has been getting prepped the past few weeks. The actual street construction is finally beginning this week. Learn more at 200SouthSLC.com. 900 South Phase 2 will be focused on the area between the railroad and 300 West. One lane of traffic in each direction will be maintained, with the work starting primarily on the south side of the road. Keep an eye out for the extension of the Nine Line Trail while this work is happening. The businesses on this corridor are open, so shop small, especially during construction. Learn more at 900SouthSLC.com. To keep up with these or any other road construction projects going on in Salt Lake City, be sure to visit slc.gov construction. For our interview this week, I sat down with Mayor Mendenhall to talk to her about her budget priorities as we head into the next fiscal year. The first Tuesday of every May, the mayor gets to present their budget to the city council. And the six or seven weeks that follow that are filled with pretty rigorous debate and examination of what that proposal is and I was excited to present my first budget in person to our city council just a couple weeks ago. I'm really grateful that I had six budgets on the city council to get to know the process itself, but really what our awesome divisions and departments are able to do. On top of that, being the mayor now going through a pandemic and numerous crises, I really know what our departments and divisions are capable of and what kind of a vision they have for serving our residents even better. Salt Lake City is in high demand, nationally speaking. Our economy is incredibly strong, but that doesn't mean the opportunities are connecting to our residents. And I love being in this position as mayor and being able to direct our budget to consider the opportunities of our residents who haven't been connected to the growth that is benefiting so many others in the city. That's really what's driving my motivation, and I'm so happy to be in the role down here at the south end of the hall where I get to put together these values and priorities into a budget for the council to consider. We've made a priority matrix so that as we receive the requests for our budget process from department directors, we were able to weigh them and value them against what the priorities are of this administration. Air quality, equity, looking at our public safety, homelessness needs in the city, affordable housing, and the environment in general were some of the leading priorities that helped me make those budget decisions for the city. This budget is unique because it's the most multi-dimensional budget that I've seen in City Hall in almost a decade. We are asking for a property tax increase of our residents. We haven't done one in about eight years. 
And in that same amount of time, we've seen our city grow to the largest population it's ever had. We need to grow our city capabilities in terms of our staff and our program ability to match the needs that our residents and our businesses are asking us to be able to serve. That's what the property tax is about. But in addition to that, we're asking the council to put on the ballot for November a decision that the voters will make around a general obligation bond, $80 million that would help us reimagine nature. It's an investment in a regional park, more park investments throughout the city, trails, planting along the Jordan River and activation there. It would be an incredible investment in our open space that as a fast growing population, we really need to improve the quality of those green spaces that we cherish. We've put together a remarkable amount of money for affordable housing. All together across two city departments, there's a $21 million affordable housing proposal. And we wanna prioritize most of those funds for deeply affordable housing, which the private market really isn't able to reach the need of enough. In addition to that, we are able to use some of our Hive Pass dollars in the city, which is our transit partnership with UTA, and we are planning now through the budget to offer a Hive Pass to every K through 12 student in Salt Lake City, making bus access, tracks, streetcar, whatever mode they need to travel on completely free. The Commission on Racial Equity and Policing has continued to help us examine how we do public safety in the city, and their recommendations are reflected in this budget. The majority of positions in this budget for the police department are civilian positions, and we're really grateful for that continued work with the commission to help us figure out how to do public safety better in this city. The city wants to hear from you. If you're a resident or business owner here, please get involved in our budget process. You can check out the budget at slc.gov. There's public hearings coming up. You can email the council directly or reach out to individual council members. You can show up and listen to the, the city council's deliberations over the budget and make your thoughts heard, whether that's through Zoom or in person. We definitely want your input and we need you to be a part of the process. Time now for the History Minute. In the 1890s, with roads left unpaved, bicyclists often took to riding on the sidewalk. Referred to at the time as scorchers, these bicyclists sped down the lanes, crashing into pedestrians often with no regard for safety. In 1892, City Council Member Frederick Horn was hit by such a bicyclist, and he went to work trying to ban bicycles from Salt Lake City altogether. Ultimately, he was unsuccessful, but something still had to be done to keep this emerging mode of transportation in the city safe and easy. In 1894, restrictions kept bicycles off most sidewalks during the dry summer months, but this still didn't fix the problem. By 1899, a total ban on sidewalks was in place, and the public largely supported it. One person told the Salt Lake Tribune that, quote, Salt Lake is the only city of its size on earth that contains only two miles of paved streets. The bike has come to stay, so the proper thing to do is to provide for wheels as we do for other vehicles. The sidewalk is not the place for them. Paving streets for bicycles was a hot button issue of the day and debate continued while cyclists began organizing enough to influence local politics. In 1901, the Wheelman's Protective Association nominated its own candidates for local elections. This challenge was enough to bring about change and created a compromise. Cyclists would stay off the sidewalks and pay a licensing fee, and Salt Lake City government would start constructing the paved bike paths that turn into our streets of today. That's it for another episode of Capital City News. Remember, the best way to stay engaged is to stay informed. You can do that by following us on social media at SLCGov, by subscribing to us on YouTube or watching us on Channel 17. So, reporting in from out of the blue in the 9th and 9th neighborhood, I'm Brian Young with Salt Lake City TV. Until next time. Welcome to Capital City News, your source for staying informed and engaged with Salt Lake City government. I'm your host, Brian Young with Salt Lake City TV. On our episode this week, we spoke with Larry Martin, a Salt Lake City School crossing guard. Our history minutes about the oldest bicycle shop in the United States. Before we get to those, let's take a look at what's happened in the city, what's going to be happening, then our road construction update and our legislative update. At its April 19th meeting, the City Council heard briefings regarding Budget Amendment 7, which includes funding for repairs to the Leonardo after flooding and rebuilding a pedestrian bridge over the Jordan River, got a status update on the Foothills Trail System, 
and received an address by the students in the Youth City Government Program. To learn more, visit slc.gov council. Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall celebrated Earth Day early by visiting the 900 South constructed wetland and reaffirming the city's commitment to water conservation and environmental protection. Mayor Mendenhall was joined by the city's Director of Public Utilities, Laura Briefer, and Deputy Director of Sustainability, Sophia Nicholas, to highlight the environmental work the city is engaged in. Just about everywhere you look in Salt Lake City is a road under construction. Two of the projects we're going to highlight today for our road construction update are State Street's Waterline Project and some of the local streets that are covered under funding our future. Salt Lake City Public Utilities is replacing the existing water main on State Street between 1st Avenue and 200 North in Salt Lake City. This key public utility is over 100 years old and needs to be replaced to enhance the infrastructure for downtown growth. Work will continue through the summer and will include installation of new water lines, replacement of existing residential water meters, and sewer rehabilitation work. Learn more at statestreetwaterline.com. Our local streets program, funded by the 2018 Funding Our Future voter approved bond, focuses on residential streets selected by pavement condition and council district. Local streets is focused in the East Liberty Park neighborhood this year. Kensington between 800 and 900 East is getting poured May 3rd and 4th. Roosevelt between 600 and 700 East will be poured the following week on May 10th and 11th. All of these projects are subject to change due to weather since it's still spring here in Salt Lake City. That's it for the road construction update this week. To keep track of these projects and any others going on in the city, be sure to visit slc.gov construction. For our interview this week, we spoke with Larry Martin, a crossing guard in Salt Lake City, about the importance of the work he does and how you can help. My name is Larry Martin. I have been a crossing guard for three years, actually two and a half because of COVID. You know, people just forget that there's low kids here and they're anxious to get home just as you're anxious to get to work or where you're going and the little kids don't realize that you know these one ton projectiles can do a lot of damage and i guess the bottom line is when i was about 12 years old one of my friends was killed crossing going to school and just something i felt like i owed the community if nothing else the real challenge is the cars. You've got a four-way stop here, and then somebody with a, another stop sign runs up back and forth. And people are so focused on what they're doing, where they're going, that they forget that there's little kids here they can't see. And uh, sometimes you just actually put yourself in more danger than what you really want to be. And you go home and wonder, why am I doing this? But you show up the next day. The first year I was here, we had everybody stopped and somebody ran the stop sign here and that's a daily occurrence. I grabbed the two kids who were in front of me, pushed them actually out of the way and I dove on top of the hood of the car that was in front of us. It was uh, one of the older Buicks that the guy was restoring. We caved the hood in. He said, oh, don't worry about it. I got another one at home. Uh, you know, outside of that, it's just normal. People don't pay attention. They don't, uh, they don't realize that just because three cars have gone that they don't have the right of way that you know, these kids have the right of way until they're completely across the intersection. You know, it's not all the driver's faults. Kids get a little anxious too. I've got a lot of them that say hi Mr. Thank Larry you. or thank you Larry. Uh, thank you. I had one the other day that drew a picture of me uh, with this crans. Uh, I think it looks so, more like my brother than me. Uh, I'm much more handsome. Uh, Halloween, you get all sorts of little candies, uh, but mostly it's the smiles and the thanks and things like that. And you do get attached to them. Uh, you get attached to the parents that come down here, and you got to say hi to the dogs for being walked, and it actually makes it fun at times. I would say if you have the time, you care about the safety of, uh, of children and the safety of. Uh, those around you, uh, then do it. Uh, it's 
not the best paying job in the world, but you know, the pay is not the point. It's, it's the safety of the kids, uh, the smiles you get, the waves you get. To watch them grow up, uh, we've got kindergartners that are now in the third grade, and to see the growth, and I guess that's more what I'm into it for than anything else. It's, it is rewarding, it's frustrating as heck at times, but the rewards are more than, than you can actually say. And I, I really feel inadequate to, to fill that part in, but if it's something you're interested in, uh, by all means, give it a try. We need all the help we can get. Now it's time for the History Minute. It turns out that the oldest continuously running bicycle shop in the United States is right here in Salt Lake City. In the 1880s, Alfred A. Meredith and his brother began manufacturing bicycles in downtown Salt Lake to compete with the new craze sweeping the city. Over the next decade, Salt Lake would see an explosion of more than 2,500 bicycles wheeling up and down city streets. In 1904, with bicycles proving to be a lasting fad, James W. Guthrie offered investment and management of the store to the Meredith brothers, and the store eventually took its name from Guthrie. In 1926, the business was sold to Locus Manwaring, whose descendants still own the bicycle shop. In 1931, Manwaring moved the business to the building where it would remain until 2011 at 156 East and 2nd South. For almost a hundred years, they sold bikes from this one location, from the old-fashioned high wheelers to today's carbon frame bicycles. Although they moved locations to Sugar House, Salt Lake City has been their home for close to a century and a half. That's it for this episode of Capital City News. Remember the best way to stay engaged is to stay informed. You can do that by following us on social media at SLCGov, subscribing to us on YouTube, or watching us on Channel 17. So reporting in from beautiful Tracy Aviary, I'm Brian Young. Welcome to Capital City News, your source for staying informed and engaged with Salt Lake City government. I'm your host, Brian Young with SLC TV. This week, we sat down with Mayor Mendenhall to talk about her budget priorities as we head into the next fiscal year. Our History Minute is about the early bike lobbyists who got the streets in Salt Lake City paved. But before we get to those, let's take a look at our legislative update, our lookbacks, and take a look at road construction. At its May 3rd meeting, the City Council heard the Mayor deliver her annual address for her proposed budget, discussed further options for new district boundaries, and renamed the City's Housing and Neighborhood Development Division as the Housing Stability Division. At its May 10th meeting, the City Council received a budget overview for the next fiscal year and voted unanimously to enhance the safety of Salt Lake City by changing the standard speed to 20 miles per hour on all streets unless otherwise posted. To learn more, visit slc.gov slash council. Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall and the city's Urban Forestry Division planted trees at Rose Park Elementary School with kindergarten students and faculty in celebration of Arbor Day. These trees are gonna make a giant wall of shade on the playground, on the soccer field here in the hot afternoons in summer. It's gonna be like a wall of green trees shading the lawn. It's gonna be amazing. To learn more, visit the Salt Lake City Urban Forestry Division's website. Last month, Mayor Mendenhall proclaimed April Fair Housing Month. The mayor joined partners from the community at Valor House, a supportive housing facility operated by First Step House in partnership with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and the Housing Authority of Salt Lake City. They spoke of the need for accessible accommodations in housing and business. Fair housing, it isn't just the law, it's the way that as a community we can say to those of us who want to call Salt Lake City home that no matter who you are, there's a place for you here and we are dedicated to making sure of it. To watch the complete event, please visit our YouTube page. In honor of Small Business Week and in coordination with the Department for Economic Development, Mayor Mendenhall visited six small businesses across the city who have benefited from Salt Lake City programs. From Quarters Arcade Bar in downtown to the Neighborhood Hive in Sugar House, you can watch all of her visits on our YouTube channel. 
Mayor Mendenhall and the City Council appeared on the steps of the state capitol in support of abortion rights in the United States. That the decision of abortion is an individual decision that is one of the most difficult decisions a woman may have to make or choose to make in her life. And it is hers and hers alone. To watch the complete event, please visit our YouTube page. For our road construction update this week, we're going to take a look at projects on 200 South and 900 South. You may have noticed that the 200 South reconstruction project has been getting prepped the past few weeks. The actual street construction is finally beginning this week. Learn more at 200SouthSLC.com. 900 South Phase 2 will be focused on the area between the railroad and 300 West. One lane of traffic in each direction will be maintained, with the work starting primarily on the south side of the road. Keep an eye out for the extension of the Nine Line Trail while this work is happening. The businesses on this corridor are open, so shop small, especially during construction. Learn more at 900SouthSLC.com. To keep up with these or any other road construction projects going on in Salt Lake City, be sure to visit slc.gov construction. For our interview this week, I sat down with Mayor Mendenhall to talk to her about her budget priorities as we head into the next fiscal year. The first Tuesday of every May, the mayor gets to present their budget to the city council. And the six or seven weeks that follow that are filled with pretty rigorous debate and examination of what that proposal is. And I was excited to present my first budget in person to our city council just a couple of weeks ago. I'm really grateful that I had six budgets on the city council to get to know the process itself, but really what our awesome divisions and departments are able to do. On top of that, being the mayor now going through a pandemic and numerous crises, I really know what our departments and divisions are capable of and what kind of a vision they have for serving our residents even better. Salt Lake City is in high demand, nationally speaking. Our economy is incredibly strong, but that doesn't mean the opportunities are connecting to our residents. And I love being in this position as mayor and being able to direct our budget to consider the opportunities of our residents who haven't been connected to the growth that is benefiting so many others in the city. That's really what's driving my motivation and I'm so happy to be in the role down here at the south end of the hall where I get to put together these values and priorities into a budget for the council to consider. We made a priority matrix so that as we receive the requests for our budget process from department directors, we were able to weigh them and value them against what the priorities are of this administration. Air quality, equity, looking at our public safety, homelessness needs in the city, affordable housing, and the environment in general were some of the leading priorities that helped me make those budget decisions for the city. This budget is unique because it's the most multi-dimensional budget that I've seen in City Hall in almost a decade. We are asking for a property tax increase of our residents. We haven't done one in about eight years. And in that same amount of time, we've seen our city grow to the largest population it's ever had. We need to grow our city capabilities in terms of our staff and our program ability to match the needs that our residents and our businesses are asking us to be able to serve. That's what the property tax is about. But in addition to that, we're asking the council to put on the ballot for November a decision that the voters will make around a general obligation bond, $80 million that would help us reimagine nature. It's an investment in a regional park, more park investments throughout the city, trails, planting along the Jordan River and activation there. It would be an incredible investment in our open space that as a fast growing population, we really need to improve the quality of those green spaces that we cherish. We've put together a remarkable amount of money for affordable housing. All together across two city departments, there's a $21 million affordable housing proposal. And we wanna prioritize most of those funds for deeply affordable housing, which the private market really isn't able to reach the need of enough. In addition to that, we were able to use some of our Hive Pass dollars in the city, which is our transit partnership with UTA, and we are planning now through the budget to offer a Hive Pass to every K through 12 student in Salt Lake City, making bus access, tracks, streetcar, whatever mode they need to travel on completely free.
The Commission on Racial Equity and Policing has continued to help us examine how we do public safety in the city, and their recommendations are reflected in this budget. The majority of positions in this budget for the police department are civilian positions, and we're really grateful for that continued work with the Commission to help us figure out how to do public safety better in this city. The city wants to hear from you. If you're a resident or business owner here, please get involved in our budget process. You can check out the budget at slc.gov. There's public hearings coming up. You can email the council directly or reach out to individual council members. You can show up and listen to the, the city council's deliberations over the budget and make your thoughts heard, whether that's through Zoom or in person. We definitely want your input and we need you to be a part of the process. Time now for the History Minute. In the 1890s, with roads left unpaved, bicyclists often took to riding on the sidewalk. Referred to at the time as scorchers, these bicyclists sped down the lanes, crashing into pedestrians often with no regard for safety. In 1892, City Council Member Frederick Horn was hit by such a bicyclist, and he went to work trying to ban bicycles from Salt Lake City altogether. Ultimately, he was unsuccessful, but something still had to be done to keep this emerging mode of transportation in the city safe and easy. In 1894, restrictions kept bicycles off most sidewalks during the dry summer months, but this still didn't fix the problem. By 1899, a total ban on sidewalks was in place, and the public largely supported it. One person told the Salt Lake Tribune that, quote, Salt Lake is the only city of its size on earth that contains only two miles of paved streets. The bike has come to stay, so the proper thing to do is to provide for wheels as we do for other vehicles. The sidewalk is not the place for them. Paving streets for bicycles was a hot-button issue of the day, and debate continued while cyclists began organizing enough to influence local politics. In 1901, the Wheelman's Protective Association nominated its own candidates for local elections. This challenge was enough to bring about change and created a compromise. Cyclists would stay off the sidewalks and pay a licensing fee, and Salt Lake City government would start constructing the paved bike paths that turn into our streets of today. That's it for another episode of Capital City News. Remember, the best way to stay engaged is to stay informed. You can do that by following us on social media at SLCGov, by subscribing to us on YouTube or watching us on Channel 17. So, reporting in from out of the blue in the 9th and 9th neighborhood, I'm Brian Young with Salt Lake City TV. Until next time.
to the uh, continuation of our work session meeting. We're on item number eight, fiscal year 2022 to 23 budget, non-departmental funds. We have uh, Jennifer Bruno, Mary Beth Thompson, and John Vike. Yep. It's a table. <laughs> And because it relates to quite a few other departments in the city, there are a few other uh, representatives here that can answer questions if the council has questions. Um, just to give a brief overview, the non-departmental budget is the largest budget in the city, the largest department budget in the city, which is ironic because it's not a department. It um, is sort of a holding uh, place for funds that don't cleanly fit within one department or another. And it's also the place where um, the city transfers funds to either other internal service funds or um, external governments like uh, memberships and things like that. So in some cases, it's kind of like an accounting tool for um, some of those accounts like the IMS fund and the fleet fund and the golf fund. That's where all of those um, general fund transfers happen. Um, if you want to look at um, how it has changed from last year to this year. You can look at pages 45 to 51 of the budget book. In general, there is a 6.4% increase in this budget, in the general fund portion of this budget. Oh, do we need napkins? <laughs> it's okay, just making sure everything's okay. Um, and, if, and if you include CDBG and E911 and all the debt service funds, the total budget is just uh, shy of $260 million. If you wanna look at every line item in the non-departmental budget, which is a really helpful thing actually because there are so many detailed expenditures in this budget, you can turn to pages 237 to 234 of the mayor's recommended budget book. And that will have every single line item uh, that is funded by the city through that budget. The orientation of the staff report is sort of from high level to detail. So if you just want a high level overview of what the non-department budget does, um, that's page one of the staff report. Um, if you're interested in where the non-departmental budget overlaps with council priorities, that starts on page three of the staff report, um, just to highlight some of the specific items that are spaced throughout. And then some of the more detailed allocations are at the end of the staff report, sort of organized by section of the non-departmental budget. So we don't necessarily have a slide deck because it would be probably the world's longest presentation to go through all of these line items. Um, so I guess I would turn it over to questions if the council has specific questions or areas you want me to address. Um, happy to answer. Oh, that's my model. So thanks, Jennifer. The difference between the 257.6 million and the 122.5 million is uh, like, are the is that roughly 130 million accounted for also in all these other departments? Because you said that's the transfer. So th those aren't truly expenses; they're just money that passes through non-departmental. Or so the the hundred that hundred million dollar difference is is like CDBG, nine one one. Um, debt service funds, so like our geo bonds live there. So they're not necessarily the transfers to other departments. The, the transfers to like, let's say the fleet fund or the IMS fund live within that $122 million. So I guess my answer is both. Transfers exist in both the $260 million number and the $122 million number. Um, okay, so is it accurate to say that all of the expenses related to the $257 million are only only show up in depart, non-departmental? I don't like, think so because um, like for example, no. CDBG, um, right, would be accounted for separately in its own fund. So it wouldn't, okay, so if residents come and say, look at all these departments that each have, you know, 80 million or 40 million or whatever, 30 million, plus this huge thing of 257, they're not actually additive. Correct. The 122, though, is. <laughs> the 122, yes. Is, is over and above all of the other departments put together. No, the exception of the internal service funds, right? Right, yes. So okay. let's so it's take, more let's take, it's let's take um, IMS, for example, right? IMS is funded from all the departments inside the city. Right. Um, a, the largest portion of that is the general fund, and we transfer that money from the general fund to IMS's revenues, and then they have expenses below. So it, like you, you asked for that double counting? Yes, that's technically. That's the double counting. That's a double counting, right? Because 
we take the expenditure out of non-departmental, transfer it to IMS as a revenue, and then they, ex they have an expenditure budget associated with that revenue. I that happens for all of those that are blocked out in non-departmental. And I kind of think about like, um, and I think your questions are, get, are getting to this, um, like in the RDA, how the central business district is one fund and then it transfers money to the housing fund. And then the housing fund has its own budget with those transfers. So it's, it, you couldn't necessarily add those departments together because the, that double counts the money if, if I'm following you. That's so there are some cases where it's, it is double counting. So like the internal service funds, the funds that face internal to the city, so fleet and IMS. But for example, the golf fund is getting a transfer from non-departmental and in addition has its own revenues. And so that you would add. So it, I guess it depends, and I apologize that it, <laughs> it's very right. confusing. There are some expenses, though, that purely live in non-departmental. Yes. And don't show up in any other thing, like Correct. body cameras, right? Like body cameras, like um, our membership in different organizations, EDCU, the league, um, that kind of thing. Large probably. contracts. We, but we don't have that added up right now, what that number is. Of the I, 257, which is actually truly just expenses? I can figure that out and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Yep. I'd have to go, I mean, it's, it, you really would have to go line by line because it really just does depend. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, d lower priority than all the other yeah. millions of priorities you have, so. <laughs> the other, the other um, really big transfer that lives here, lives in non-departmental, is the transfer to CIP. So this is where if the council wanted to adjust the CIP transfer from 9% to 8% or whatever, this is where that adjustment would be made. What music one, are we licensing question. for seven thousand dollars a year? Yeah, that's that's the music you hear on the telephone. That's the music you hear at the Galvin Center. Can I introduce you to some local composers who will give you a little ditty? In fact, the mayor asked if we could do local composition instead of do. Yeah, let me get sure. you a little. I'm ditty. sure we, we would want time. I'm sure we would want to pay offering. them though, right? We would want to pay them, right? Sure, a love <laughs> offering. I mean, I can I can cut this number down for you. <laughs> We're licensing music at the rate of $7,000 a year. <laughs> on page 238. It's, it's the music you hear when you're on hold the or I at the Gallivan the Center, too, the, um, the ice rink. <laughs> so um, it's illegal you know, to, pay, or to play music without paying for it. So What are we, what are we getting for the $1 million to the NBA All-Star Game? So we're not actually paying to the NBA, but this is a way, this is a, I, I guess it's kind of the first time I've seen the city do this with a, a known major event that's coming to the city because the city has security costs, police overtime, um, road barricades and stuff like that. So if you look on page, I think it's in the key changes document. It, didn't we do this when the UN came? I don't think we itemized it in the annual budget. I think we did, did, we did it, a budget, budget amendment. amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I and think, yeah, and this is in response, I think, to, you, to council members saying, well, what we knew about it when we did the budget, couldn't oh, we consider yeah. it in context? So it's like earmarking it So ahead everybody's of time. looking ahead, okay. which yeah. is great. So starting on page 50 of, of the budget book, it talks about, you know, um, Police staffing estimate for three days that traffic would have 170,000 and motors 23,000, going all the way down um, to you know street barricades 240,000. So it rolls up to a million dollars, but it's all of those line items. So this isn't guaranteeing that Rudy Gobert is going to show up so we can fawn over him in a council meeting. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So close yet so far away. All right. <laughs> I do. I have a question on the. Uh, apprenticeship program we have a, a million dollars in the apprenticeship program and just uh, curious of uh, how many students that is the uh, benefits this the city what they are what departments they actually work in uh, and uh, that that whole program itself and how that works so I have the current information but the current information runs under the ARPA guidelines instead um, this is a little different. I, when HR presented their budget, they asked for a part-time individual t in order to do this program, so it's a little bit different than under ARPA. Um, the average hourly rate that we gave for the apprenticeship program was $18 an hour at part-time. So, 
and equipment, right? At equipment at about $2,300 for those individuals. So if you back it in, I think it's a roughly around 52, 53 F FTEs. Okay. Not FTEs. And for customers time. who are looking, it's on uh, page 237. Right. And what the reason you see no money in the fiscal year 22 budget and then money in the fiscal year 23 budget is because it's shifting from ARPA funds to general fund dollars. So I think this is an example of a program that was started under ARPA that the administration views as valuable and continuing to the general fund. Right, and I guess my question would just be back to that value. I'd like to understand that value better. Uh, I think it's wonderful that we have an apprenticeship program. I just wanna know what the, uh, the value of that million dollars is. Because uh, when we're talking about a uh, property tax rise and everything else, it'd be nice to know what that $1 million is. Yeah, I can get you the data on the um, number of positions inside each department that is current that are currently apprentices. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I have a couple questions. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Maybe if I could talk. Um, the 50000 for the BioHive, is, that is the ongoing membership. The 30,000 is what would be left over. We discussed this in one of the budget amendments because I was like, no, bring it to the annual budget. And that's what this is, right? So it's 30,000 for this fiscal year and then 50,000 as an ongoing. That's correct. Okay. And then um, just out of curiosity, why we funded 190,000 in racial equity and policing commission, commission staff, but then it's not proposed. Did we move that staff it, somewhere? It's transferred to the mayor's office budget. Oh, that's right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's another um, a reminder of the other uh, reason we've used non-departmental in recent years, which is kind of new, but I think has been helpful, is to add an additional layer of transparency when the council's looking at a big issue and doesn't want it to sort of live in one department where it can kind of get buried and lost. And so racial equity and policing is one of those items. A lot of the funding our future items are sort of uh, funneled through non-departmental instead of just living in the budget of the departments. And so um, that's another tool that non-departmental can provide. So. I, s I noticed um, the DAQ lawnmower exchange is that that's just because we moved it into sustainability that's what they just presented on yeah it's a yeah. transfer from the general fund to sustainability so if you added all of those up the transfers to sustainability comes out to that 1.7 million that sustainability was discussing and those tie but this is that why it's not under um under the fy 21 22 adopted budget is because we moved it permanently under sustainability but before it was in non-departmental uh, correct. It was before in non-departmental, and we okay. moved it to sustainability. That is correct. Cool. I just got to say, too, I, I can't resist on the licensing fees th for the music. It went up $5,000 in one year. Like, in two years. Well, one year. Done. It was a ch Yeah, I'm just like. Ch I think uh, if I, I remember I was a budget analyst when we first started including that in the budget, and I think it was like $20,000 when it first appeared in the budget. It was. So we saved money on it. Can we, can, we, can we play the same songs all the time? I mean, if you're okay listening to that at the ice rink right. over and over again. <laughs> seven, we're talking seven thousand dollars here. Yeah, we we, you know. Okay, I have a question on the uh, transfer to debt service fund. That's ten million there, and what? Sorry, where are you looking? The transfer to debt service. Third one down for the intergovernmental transfers. I guess that's not really, uh, since those are intergovernmental transfers, is that from the one city to the other city? From Just below the uh, CIP. It's from million. the $10 million. That's what yeah. you're discussing, right? The $10 million is from the general fund. It transfers to pay our sales tax and revenue bonds. Also, the LBA bonds for fire. So that's what that transfer does. It transfers from the general fund to the debt service fund in order to pay the debt on those bonds. On those, on those bonds, gotcha, okay. That does include um, a portion for um, 
the new bond that you will be discussing as well. It does not. It does. Uh, uh, the, the current, the current uh, sales tax bond? Yes, okay. correct. Right. Oh, and page 240, uh, Salt Lake City Donation Fund under Special Revenue Fund Accounting. Can, can someone tell me what this is? There's a lot of money in it. Wouldn't that include donations for the Eccles Theater Donation Fund? Oh, the Donation Fund is funds that we receive as donations, not necessarily non-departmental. That's what that is, right? Right. Yeah, so those are donations we receive, Salt Lake City receives, and we use for um, the cemetery. Um, at, you know, the books that we had at the cemetery when we created books about the cemetery, that money goes into there. If somebody gives a donation to Salt Lake City, it goes into the donation fund and is kept separate by a cost center, and then we report it to the council on an annual basis, the donations we've received. And how do we know how much donations we're gonna receive? Um, we don't, from year oh, to so year, we don't. Oh, so this is just an estimate? It's mm -hmm. an estimate, yeah. This, that, that's the money that is in there right now? Those are estimates. Those are estimates of what we're gonna get in donations, yeah. 2.8 million. And if, and if a donation came in, you know, if a $10 million donation came in, that's when the administration would probably come to you for a budget amendment to adjust that budget. Yeah, because we couldn't do it without a budget amendment. What That money is similar to grants, um, so we can, um, you all give us the authority to, to, once we receive the donation, we can create a budget and spend on that donation. Um, anything over $10,000, um, we have to give a notification to the council, and it has to be an official donation agreement through the attorney's office and the department. Anything under $10,000 can just go through the process of receiving it, me sending out a notification, you know, acknowledgement letter according to the IRS regs, and then we can put it into a cost center to spend. Is this the con connected to the foundation, uh, or the, the, the Salt Lake City Foundation? No, so no. These, are, these are not tax deductible donations. Yes, they are tax deductible. They're tax deductible through a government agency. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. Question? Go ahead. Um, so, Maribeth, there's a sister city's $10,000, um, um, sorry, budget, budgeted last year and then this year, so, I thought that program was kind of dormant, like it wasn't really happening, and did something happen this last budget year that, with I, those $10,000? Yeah, I don't know, I'll have to, I can check on that for yeah. you. Would you. Yeah, that would be great, because it's something that and I, what you s I've been interested about, but I, I was told that we really didn't have the budget for it. What you see in fiscal year 2021 is what was actually spent, and so that's another, uh, I, I think that's another data point to say, even in 2021, no money was spent from that budget. I know that that line item has been in for dozens of years. So that, that $10,000 has been in the budget for Except since I've been in the city. No, because in 2021, that column is actuals, which means okay. what was actually spent in that budget. So what that tells you is that $0 were spent, which is why I think that is a valid question of if this is a, if this is a dormant program where money is not spent, Either should we reallocate that money to end the program or be more intentional about spending that money? Great, great, thank you. And then there's a local business marketing program for $20,000, used to be 40. I can remember, it was it grants that we gave out or was it a loan? I don't know. I think um, Ben maybe can help us answer that, but I think what it was is, um, it, we, we had a contract with a vendor. With a vendor, okay. Let me put him on the spot, you know. Sorry, Ben, but no, I, we thanks. saw you that's, come earlier. So. That's a great question, and hello, council members. Good to be here with you. The, the, the money that you're, re you're referencing is um, a fund for local business support that the department has run for several years. This was in addition to Local First and was tied to that at one point. Local First, by the way, is no longer is in existence. And this contract has been used over time to say, okay, we have certain aspects of economic development to, that businesses, diverse businesses especially, need help filling out applications. This has been contracted through the Small Business Center at one point. 
Um, and now the contract has been awarded to the IRC to help some of our diverse businesses apply for some of the programs that exist. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Councilman Petro. Um, on the Hive Pass for children, do we have a guesstimate on, I, I know the goal is to make it available to every school child. Do we have a guesstimate on how much, how many this 100,000 covers? And is part of that going to be allocated for any sort of PR or just awareness raising of the program? Don't see anyone from transportation here, but we can ask them and okay. get back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think a good question also, because this would be in, in conjunction with the other million dollars going to the city hive pass program. Because well, it we says the expansion of the hive. So there's already a million, 1.1. Well, we took 100,000 also from the city resident bus yeah. pass. Is that, historically, has that 100,000 not been used by the adults? And, and that's why this diversification, diversification is a good idea? Like, I don't think it's typically been 100% used. Um, one of the other things is, is that that is subsidized, a portion of that is subsidized by um, so city, res city revenues, right? So um, Hive residents, pay a portion into it, that becomes a revenue to Salt Lake City, and then we have to have the expense at the total expense. Okay. So, uh, and I can get those numbers for you if Thank you would you. like. And when transportation uh, was asked that question when they were here presenting their budget, they did say that it was underutilized, um, par partially because of COVID over the last couple of years, but even before that, that number was lower. Another line I'm just looking at the uh, animal service contract. What is involved in that $1.9 million? So we uh, contract with Salt Lake County to um, provide our animal control services. So, um, you know, dogs off leash, um, things like that. We have a little bit of control over the costs in that program and that we negotiate with them, but um, there's not a whole lot of flexibility. So each year when there's an increase, we tend to just have to pay it. Um, I don't know if there's any other aspects. It also you includes talk about. Uh, raccoon um, abatement. abatement, is what I, we, right. at one point we had um, significant issues with raccoons, and so they help us abate raccoons. I'm just, I'm just, you talked about the dogs off leash. I mean, uh, is that uh, enforcing the, dogs off leash program because I don't can't believe we en enforcing um, the rules as it relates to animals in the city so um, in general dogs off leash dog bites um, dog running loose in the neighborhood cat, I guess raccoons running loose in the neighborhood I, I, I just kind of would push back a little bit on the dogs off leash I've never seen anyone out there enforcing any dogs off leash and anywhere. I think that that is the feedback we regularly get from residents is that the program is not robust enough I think that the county funds it where I think there's maybe one officer in the city not full-time so I'm, I'm just pushing back on this 1.9 million dollars on something that doesn't back to the question I think Councilmember Fowler said about programs that you know get on the budget and then we just keep them there and are we actually getting a good service on this one? The, 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 the other side to that is that we would have to fund our own. So we have to have one one way or the other. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'd like some answers on that one because that seems like a lot of money for something that I don't see any, I haven't seen any benefit from. What page? We, as can, as we can look at the um, The raccoon abatement thing really oh, was. I can understand. <laughs> that I can understand. The, uh, it's the, on page also, 237, um, Councilmember Valdemoros, okay. about, let's see, halfway down the page, yeah, it's 1968. On it also oh. pays for the um, management of the facility, so we are part... We Cindy, are, you had to turn on oh, your microphone. Sorry, no, it also pays for the um, facility that they where they keep animals, strays, and things like that, so when they do have an animal from Salt Lake City, they take it there we used to have our own animal shelter and it was a yeah. tough thing yeah. so i've seen a lot of this uh, their animal control and i actually called a few times these last few months to pick up some stray dogs i had one in my car that was just running around so they and they are very fast at coming in and and i had to call another one uh, recently for uh, uh, yeah an accident but 
Um, so I don't know about the value, but uh, about the whole budget, but I know that they work a lot in Salt Lake. Yeah, I'm just asking. And we can get, yeah, we can, we'll ask them for metrics because it's possible that um, because of their staffing levels, they're doing more response than they are patrol, right? Because it's easier right. to respond than it is to hang out in the foothills waiting for someone to right. break the law. Uh, Councilmember Wharton. Um, yes, um, I'm hoping that the, having the Rangers will help with that because um, that's where I see the biggest offenses. Um, but um, I wanted to ask about the um, if we choose to, as a council, put the geo bond on the ballot, paying for an election, and I was trying yes. to find out how much it would cost. That is actually not included in the budget. Right. Um, and so if the council wanted to have an election, it would be something you'd have to add. And because it would be a citywide election, it, I would, I guess, assuming is always dangerous, but it would. Re I would reason to think that it would be the cost of a full citywide election, like a mayoral year. Right, yeah. Um, and is there a way to vote this year to put it on the ballot, but for it to actually appear on the ballot in 2023? Or does it have to be on the ballot the year that we vote on it? That's a good question. And maybe... We could save a lot. And I worry about voter participation in an off year on when the only thing on the ballot is a, is a geo bond. Right. We could follow up with the recorder's office um, and the mayor's office on that. There may be a there may be a number of reasons why they're recommending a geo bond for this year and not next year. I'm not well, sure. Well, the follow up I would request is: Can we vote on it this year, and then can we have the cost saving of putting it on the ballot? Okay. You know, in 2023. So we, as a council, vote to put it on the ballot, but it doesn't appear on the ballot until 2023. Isn't there already a ballot going out because they're voting for everything else? They don't have a separate city ballot from their state and congressional. But we don't have any there's ballots no, going Yeah, out. There's, there's no, no city ballots. Salt Lake City specific. Right, items. but all of the residents that would be voting on the geo bond will already be receiving a ballot. So we're probably just cost sharing with oh, the state and, right, the county? Right, right, because they're going to be voting for like so it's not like Senator It's not like a ballot is going out right. that would otherwise not go out. It's just another line on the ballot that's already going to go out. That's a good out. point. And I think we would have to confirm that. With the I don't, Yeah, county I don't know. I have a, oh, sorry. Uh, just the E911 fund, is that the money that comes from Sandy? It comes into non-departmental? What is this $3.8 million and why is it here and not in the E911 budget? So the E911 budget is actually a department. The E911 fund class is where the money comes from your cell phone's 911 oh, fees. And that does right. come include Sandy's fees as well. And that comes into uh, to the non-departmental. It, it sits in non-departmental in this overview because it... Um, is it separate fund that doesn't reply, sit with a specific department? What did it, what did those fees that come into the city from Salt Lake and Sandy City cell phone users ye pay for? They pay for software and dispatch services. So some of the cost of the E911 department. So it is lives similar there. to like body cameras where police have all their funds, but they're also using body cameras that are paid for and non departmental. Yeah. E911 has all their staffing and everything, but then they're also using this $3.8 million for some, some of, of their software. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And, and I think the difference uh, the, in those two examples you just used is the. Body cams is the general fund part of non-departmental, which is your general city taxes and sales taxes and property taxes. And the E911 is fees from people's cell phone bills. So it's a right, separate right. Okay. revenue that source. That makes sense. Do we, don't we also receive a transfer from Sandy City for that service, though? Yeah. It, in addition to this E911 fund? They pay for a portion of the service. And yes. that goes into our general fund? and Correct. then So that doesn't show up in here at all? Correct. Okay, thanks. Councilman Fowler. Of course, I just put chocolate in my mouth. Um, do, 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 I had this question. So the Arts Council, um, 
is funded out of non-departmental. Why doesn't it come out of CAN? Isn't that where they live? I think they live in economic development. Or economic development, sorry, Ben. <laughs> I think this is the Arts Council Foundation. Is that right? Ugh. Correct. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that like was your the, outside voice. <laughs> <laughs> I like the foundation. It's this confusing thing that we are funding the foundation that does or does not fund people to work and vice versa. So um, we're increasing this by 150,000. For why reasons? I, think, I believe Felicia can come up and discuss it, but I think it's because we didn't, they did not receive their ZAP funding. Oh. So they are short on programming. Okay. Sorry, Felicia. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you all for supporting Living Traditions this last weekend. <laughs> um, so the question is why the amount of funding? So you might recall in the past before my tenure that we previously ran the Twilight Concert Series in-house at the Arts Council, and we no longer do that. We pay a flat fee to contract that program out. And as a result of that, for our Zoo Arts and Parks, one of our major grants, um, remember that the Arts Council funds about 30 cents on the dollar to city dollars through grant funding. And Zoo Arts and Parks, our county grant, our second largest source of funding is based on qualifying expenditures. So we previously spent a million or, you know, sometimes upwards of that um, on the Twilight Concert Series, which we no longer have and it has have as an expenditure and so now because those expenditures are lower the grant amount is lower so from fiscal year um, 18 to current we've lost about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in grant funding which is um, averaged over a three-year period and has, has been compounding and is here okay um, can I make one budget book request? Can we label that foundation, the Arts Council Foundation? Because when it's very confusing, and then I was like, wait, where didn't are we going to have this presentation? And so yeah. that will help me yeah. keep things straight. Maybe. Thank you for questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I have one additional question here on the Sorensen. So with the county in 2020, 2021 we didn't have anything last year's a million this year's again a million and i'm just was it i think in 2021 actuals that was the pandemic year where operations were i'm looking at mary beth i think that's why there's no because in that's again that's the actuals column that's what was actually spent right um but that's the contract we have with the county to actually operate the building that we own um, what line is that? So I can look at that. It's on the 237. 237 about, it's 1,014,000. About eight or nine down, yeah. Is that maintenance to the building and keeping it running? It's programming mostly for the building. I believe we're responsible for at least some maintenance. At least that's our typical agreement with the county is that they program and we own facilities. Oh, so, so like. It's similar to our contract with them at Steiner, for example. So they do the programming, but we pay them for the programming. Or some yes. of it. Yes, that's yes, that's correct. Are we talking about Sorensen? Uh, right? Sorensen. Because it's a little bit different because they don't pay for as much of the programming. They don't pay for as much of the programming there as they do at Steiner. There's a special contract that we have with them because it wasn't um, a, a facility that they initiated as a partner with us. I think we went to them after or something. That's starting to ring a bell. Um, I could get yeah, more we'll information. To, yeah. Steiner is not here as, as a non-departmental -department, line item. It's would not. S where would Steiner appear in the budget book, our contract with the county? Public services. Oh, it's, it's, it's in, the part, in the department, okay. Okay, a lot of questions here. On back to the police body cameras, last couple of years we've had- Council Member Mono, we do not do things consistently 100% of the time. 
Um, I'm just saying what you're thinking. But <laughs> Council Member Mono, what I will tell you is the new ERP is going to force us to do it 100% exactly the same way. So non-departmental will become very, very small um, with the new ERP. And what will happen is all of these will go back to the departments. Yes, Council Member Mono. <laughs> uh, what about when we have, which goes to Dan's next question, I think. But what about when we have like legislative priorities and we want to put use the non-departmental as that oversight or transparency tool? Can we still do that with the new ERP? Um, we'll be able to identify that by a cost center or, or a project or a program. It's a completely different. There's about seven areas what we call wheels. Oh, but because we're doing program-based budgeting, or we're moving to program-based budgeting, that that will be unnecessary. Because we'll just say, we are funding the program of body cameras. Correct. The other thing is, is that um, a lot of the reason that we put it in here is because it, be, it is a transparent, but the other is that, you know, all of these payments I get to approve, which is a lot of fun for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and. We still have the ability to put finance as a reviewer on those funds as the council chooses. Okay, thank you. So back to the uh, body cameras here. I like the ERP system going into place, but back to the, this is our third year of one plus $5 million. Is that going to be every year we're going to be doing this additional? Lease. I think the lease is a five-year lease at this point. It's a five-year lease? Mm-hmm. And then we'll need new ones, right? It's a five. We'll have, then we'd have to either, either, depending on the life of the body cam, we'd either have to renew, a, do a new lease, or maybe it could go a couple of years. I don't know that, but we could find that out if you would Does like. It? And some of the cost is also the storage cost associated with all of the files. Oh, the, uh, oh, the, uh, okay. The of film. all of the video Got from you. the okay. body cameras. All right. And Thank I you. Can, oh. thought that this also included the program itself. <laughs> so it's not just the actual, like we're leasing just, you know, a camera and then a desk drawer to put all the storage in for that much money, but we're leasing the actual program that allows all of the things to happen that we want the body cams to do. Correct. And I think it would be nice for us to get a report as to whether we're actually utilizing that service that we're paying for and what benefit that is helping. I mean, I know we're using the body camera and the storage, but are we analyzing the data to help us make sure that we have, you know? Well, I think that we have, I mean, I, I don't disagree that we might need something, but as part of last year's budget and our audit with the police department, we are requiring that they go through and do um, an audit of like a random audit or of five things, and I don't. I know we have. It's, I think it's chief quite isn't minimal, here. though. Oh, is I that, think a the, what? It, it's very minimal. What was? It is put into minimal place. that we put in place, but we uh, are. We did require that they do like a. They have to look at one right I, I body think cam a month or whatever that that requirement is, and that this this particular program would help that audit and then also if there were an incident and searching or if there there were some other technology yeah things I, that I, were I cool those are words that make me sound intelligent our ordinance said like this many per month but i i believe we paid for the upgraded software package that could actually like use like uh, whatever word recognition yeah like what's that word you know that in yeah. yeah use an intelligent computer to like recognize if there's a racial yeah. racially charged word that is used and then that would automatically so it's like actually auditing not by a human but by a computer auditing literally every video Ben let me know that he has he had some of uh, had some additional information on the status of that in the PD staff report he's going to email that to you guys and then I'm sure there's additional clarification we can we can do okay so. council member Pui. so this is I don't okay so that question will be very useful to me I would like to learn more about that uh, from the PD I thank you and so this non-department I'm learning I'm I'm, 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 I'm new here um, so 
This is, it reminds me of a folder I usually have on my desktop where I put all the stuff that I don't know where it goes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> okay, okay. It so was referred to earlier today as the junk drawer of the okay. city. And okay. You well, know, that, that's pejorative. Or junk the drawers misfit are great. Toys, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, this, <laughs> misfit toys. this, there is a lot of money in yeah. this one. Um, so, okay. And uh, again, to, uh, I know that this probably was mentioned and I was probably talking to someone. I was that kid in school. I, um, why some of these ones are not living inside the departments? Like there are some that are very obvious, right? Like the, 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 the one that we were talking about, the body cam, like that is a very obvious a police department. I think, well, okay, so, so there's a couple of different reasons. Um, I think the body cameras had a separate story where um, that was at a time when the council was looking for ways to reduce the dollar amount of the police department budget just frankly reduce the dollar amount of the police department budget. And so there were certain equipment related expenses that did not technically need to be in the police department budget. And it gave the council a measure of, um, a slightly higher measure of confidence that it would be spent in the way that they wanted it to be spent. And so that's why it was purposefully pulled out of the department. There are other things that are in non-departmental um, through no fault of the department's own, but that's when they got put in the budget, or um, it was easier to put in the budget in the non-departmental because um, the percentage increase year to year in departments um, is sometimes scrutinized uh, more heavily than others. So um, there's probably a handful of other reasons. That yeah, the, the, especially on the police body cam, the council was really very closely examining that and wanting to implement it in a certain way. And so we had kind of a team with the administration working on it. And so it, it made a lot of sense to be sure that it was implemented in a particular way in collaboration with the administration. So um, that's that was the main reasoning. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, just I think that police department racial equity one is kind of the one that you're like, that shouldn't as belong somewhere else. But like the, our social workers that go to the police are out of here. And I, Jen said this a little earlier, I think it, for us as council members at the time when we put a lot of that money over from the police department to non-departmental was a way to ensure transparency because we had, to Cindy's point, a little bit, a lot more control over how it was spent. And in fact, I think that's where the racial equity and policing money came from as we sort of took that out and said, we're gonna put this in non-departmental and put it in this, you know, holding account. I didn't say it. And um, and then when there's when there's an answer from the administration, then we'll come back and release those funds. And so for some of these things that seem like they should be in a department, it was kind of the council's decision to say no because we want more control over it. And then in, in the future, with the new ERP system, a lot of these things will go back into a specific department, and then this should uh, shrink this junk drawer uh, <laughs> so that it's actually by the program and by the, the correct department. So it'll be a lot more. And, we'll be there. And the transparency will be there because we, we know exactly what it's, the program is going for. Okay. So it's, it's a work in progress right now with that new ERP system coming into play. I'm very excited for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Any other budget questions for the non-event yeah. departmental? One budget more questions. question, my last question. So um, on, on page 237, there's a federal grant match account for a million dollars. So are those funds like available to any department that finds a grant and needs matching funds so that we can get the whole thing? Or, and if that's the case, who decides who gets? <laughs> The grant. Um, so I think it's for the reason that we put this in was the example we used for the raise grant, the one point two million dollars that the you put what? in budget raise, raise the one point two million dollars that you put from funding our future rev projected revenues and budget amendment number seven. Um, sometimes we don't have matches to grants. And so we wanted to make sure that we had at least a million dollars in there for matches for the bipartisan infrastructure grants moving forward. Okay, all right. Okay, and if we don't use it, can we use it for something? Like, can we? Yep, it will drop to fund balance okay. and you can use it to, for something. All right. Okay, non-departmental, we're good, um, go ahead. 
and <laughs> so the same the same goes for this uh, as I think I can't remember which budget it was earlier in the conversation if you come across a line item that doesn't make sense just email one of our staff and we can find out or we can check with the administration so don't hesitate to ask questions thank you very much Mayor West John Jennifer thank you moving on to yep. item number seven excuse me item number seven item number nine Fiscal year 22 to 23 budget, the golf fund. Jennifer's staying at the table, and we have Kristen Riker, and we got Matt from golf. Give them just a minute to get up to the table. <laughs> <In this space. laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just give a really brief intro and then turn it over to the department. Um, the Golf uh, Enterprise Fund collects the revenue generated and pays for uh, most of the expenses associated with the city's six golf courses. It technically lives within the Department of Public Lands, but because it's of its size and complexity, we're treating it as a separate briefing. The recommended budget for the fund would increase by about 1.2 million, which is about 13% more than fiscal year 2022. The total budget is uh, 10.2 million for fiscal year 2023. Um, one unique change in the 2023 proposed budget is the um, increased level of investment in capital projects that have been put off for many, many years um, as the Gulf Fund has, um, has struggled to uh, provide the funding for that capital improvement. So um, they're taking advantage of some of the increased revenue from the last couple of years and are um, putting that towards capital projects. Um, the recommended budget does continue the practice of transferring some dollars from the general fund to the golf fund to help with some of the operations. And so that was actually in the non-departmental budget that we just discussed. If you wanna go through those line items, we can, but um, that's just a really broad overview. So leave it to you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, but before I do, I just um, wanna tell the council how impressed I've been with Matt since he's taken over this division and the adjustments that he's made to have cost efficiencies and to really tighten up some of um, the policies and procedures in golf have been so impressive. And, and the reaction that golf has had to the pandemic and really um, financially um, done quite well through the pandemic and um, the team has just made some great adjustments to take advantage of a not so great situation but offering outdoor recreation. So kudos to Matt and I'll just turn this over to him. Well, thank you very much. That was a very kind thing to say. <laughs> and I appreciate your time this evening. And uh, before I get started with our presentation, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the uh, we're going to be celebrating the 100 year anniversary of the foundation of the Nibley Park Golf Course, uh, which was started in 1922. So it's, uh, it's uh, was started by, a, by a, a very kind of forward thinking legacy donation by the Nibley family um, that that property be used as a golf course and only as a golf course moving forward. So 100 years of being able to offer that uh, type of recreation amenity to the citizens of Salt Lake City. So. We'll be having some celebrations uh, later this summer, but again, wanted to at least acknowledge um, that 100 year anniversary. That's a big, that's a big deal. So do we have our, our presentation um, loaded up? It looks like we don't have that. I don't know if you can email it to me really quickly. I don't know if you sent it to me and I just missed it. I did. It I am so sorry. It, I can send it again if you'd like. I am so sorry about that. I just searched, I apologize. If I forward it to one of our staff, will she be able to open it or do you have to give shared permissions? Okay. Okay. Oh, 
Sorry. <laughs> Says she doesn't have access. Let me try to open it and then maybe I can share it. All right, I'm going to share it. There we go. All right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Great. Sorry. Great, thank you. Okay, so I, again, I appreciate I appreciate what what Kristen has said about about our our, our division, and w would like to acknowledge you know the 270 some odd individuals that we have working for us, 34 full time. The rest are are hourly or seasonal employees. So that's a lot of in different individuals that spend a little bit of their time um, helping us to um, provide a very good service that we think for the community. Next slide. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. Thank you. We did add one position from last year's uh, budget. It is a golf programs manager position that we have filled that with uh, um, an individual that's been working for us for for a number of years, Gina Varney. Uh, she will be overseeing all of our instruction programs, uh, junior golf programs, adult clinics, and, and other special events. Um, it's a position that we feel will benefit the growth of the game and to keep people engaged and, and coming in and, and, and keeping our, our golf operations healthy. Next slide, please. Okay. Our key division goals that we focus on and are reflected in the budget um, is to one is to grow the golf game where we're developing programs that introduce new segments of players to the sport and foster love and respect for the traditions and values of the game. We also want to be able to develop our talent and provide improved employee training and leadership opportunities resulting in increased efficiencies in customer service. We have a lot of aged facilities. Um, we recognize the cost involved in replacing these facilities. Each one of them deserves to be replaced at some point. However, um, that's a ways away. So again, we, we've tried to find different ways of improving the assets. Um, we're wanting to improve the appearance, playability, functionality, and efficiencies of each one of these city-owned courses and clubhouses. Um, we've just completed a, a major repainting of the Forestdale Clubhouse. That building has been there since 1905. Um, Stop by some point, some, at some point, it looks, it looks great. Our final goal is to be a community partner. Um, where we're seeking opportunities to responsibly integrate golf assets and programs into the community, providing increased value to both golfers and non-golfers. Next slide, please. Just a few of our numbers that I'd like to highlight um, here today um, would, be our, would be participation in our leagues. Um, leagues are our weekly events that we have and, and are the kind of the, the backbone of, of what we build our play around. Um, we have between our men's and women's leagues um, just over over 1,400 participants, which is a which is a very large number. And these are very dedicated individuals who who again support our program on an annual basis. Um, we're very excited uh, for our women's clinics that we that we continue to build on year after year. Um, in last year, we had 237 participants, and this year we'll probably be well over 260 by the time all of our events are full. Uh, junior clinic participants, we should probably exceed 1,000 uh, junior clinics this, this summer. Next slide. We feel that there's a number of benefits that extend beyond the players who, who pay a fee to play the courses. So we feel the community also benefits whether they, whether they step on the golf course or not. Um, we feel that the golf course um, provides a number of different um, benefits, namely capturing and cleaning runoff in urban areas. Uh, a number of our courses serve as stormwater 
repositories that, that either flow onto or are collected on the course or flow through the course. Um, there's a, we provide a lot of wildlife habitat. Uh, the, the, the turf protects topsoil from water and wind erosion um, by improving the community aesthetics by having a highly manicured space. Um, the golf courses also absorb and filter rain, improves air quality through the trees, turf, and other plants, discourages pests and reduces weed incursions and negative pollen releases, and makes a substantial contribution to the community's economy. Next slide. What we're looking at here um, is we track rounds on an annual basis, um, and we record them in nine-hole equivalents. And you can see kind of the, the trajectory that we've been on um, a lot of you who've been here more than a couple of years will know that, that it's been somewhat of a roller coaster. Uh, but this past year, um, starting in fiscal year 20 and continuing on through fiscal year 21, is, is we've seen a substantial increase in play, obviously, as, as demand continues to, um, to come into our golf courses. Uh, we operated about a 90% utilization. Um, some courses actually operate over 100% utilization. Um, so again, we're, when we're open, people are interested and they're there and they're showing up and enjoying themselves. Next slide. This slide kind of details um, each course's performance over the last 10 years. And you can see, again, the last two years have been, have been phenomenal. It's, um, we're, we're at levels that have been exceeded where we were when we had nine golf courses a few years back. So um, again, it's, it's something that's, that's obviously welcome given the, the state of the golf fund in previous years. We don't know how long it's gonna continue to last. Our projections are conservative based on a number of uh, factors that, that we see, whether in the economy with the inflation, um, there's a number of uh, operational expenses that we see going up. Obviously, um, fertilizers, chemicals, the cost of water um, goes up continually, uh, personnel costs. So again, we're, we're, we're aware of all these things, and, and again, we're not, we're not, you know, we don't feel that this is going to be the new state of golf. However, we do feel that what, what has happened over the last few years has put people in a position where they're, a lot of them who had left the game are returning to the game, and we're getting a number of people that we haven't seen before, which is, I think is good for the, the long-term health of the game. Next slide. To give you an idea of the trend of play, um, the dark blue line represents the previous five-year average. Uh, the light blue line is fiscal year 22, the one we're currently in. We're, again, when we measure it against the five-year average, it's a 19% increase. Again, so this is, it's unprecedented. Um, and as we kind of dig into the, the meat of the budget a little bit, you'll see how that's impacting us and, and what we plan on, on doing with this. Um, this, I hate to say windfall, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something that golf needed, um, especially the golf fund needed to be able to see this type of, of increase in play. So here we see the, the proposed golf fiscal year 23 budget. Um, on the pie chart there, you can see each, each particular area that we track. Um, but I wanted to specifically go over the general fund transfer items. I think that's probably of the most interest here. Um, the living wage and salary adjustment transfers, these are for previous uh, living wage increases. Uh, the golf fund does not anticipate having an increase over where we currently are. Um, we are, uh, for the most part, uh, fully, fully staffed at this point. We, we offer a golfing privilege that we look at is, is the primary driver for a lot of the, the employees that we have. Uh, we have mostly either retired individuals or students. Um, these individuals aren't using this income necessarily as a living wage. Um, but when we, when we factor in the, the golfing privilege that they have access to, it's, it's, it comes out at about $18 an hour, um, which each, each employee has the ability to, uh, to receive that. The ESCO payment transfer of $493,000 um, is for the, the secondary water uh, transfers for a couple of golf courses that we had in the irrigation system uh, at Bonneville. Uh, the city-related administrative fee transfer of 339, the IMS fee transfer of 200,000, 
and the general fund support for the Rose Park stabilization of 500,000. And I'll go into that a little bit more with the next slide. So one of the golf courses obviously that needs the most help is, is Rose Park. Their irrigation system in some sections is 64 years old. Um, it is transite pipe, which is not easily repaired. And when it does need to be repaired, it requires remediation by public utilities. It's very expensive. The majority of our maintenance staff spends their time repairing leaks and other issues with the irrigation system. Even though that course is on a secondary water system, um, it is not good quality water. It is pumped directly out of the Jordan River into the system that's, again, this old of a system. So not only do we have water quality issues, we have water delivery issues. And so we felt that the, in, order, in order to best spend this general fund transfer of 500000 since fiscal year 20 was to reinvest that in, in Rose Park because we felt without finding a way to fund their irrigation system, that course was, is left vulnerable. Um, so if you track that out, um, this isn't an on, something that we feel will be ongoing. Uh, again, this is for going to be used directly for the irrigation system at, at Rose Park. Um, we, after the first three years, put aside $1.8 million um, so that we could do a match for a federal, uh, federal water smart grant that, that we partnered with public utilities to do. We found out about a week and a half ago that, we, that public utilities did not receive that. Um, at the same time, we, we wanted to have a backup plan in case that didn't go through. And so we, we knew that we projected we would have enough revenues to be able to fund the, the, the rest of that. Um, so the continued payments, uh, sorry, if, if we continue to have the 500000 for Rose Park stabilization, that would, by the end of fiscal year 26, we would no longer need that. That would help fund half of the irrigation system. We will be paying for the other half through our revenues. Um, and then the $1.2 in fiscal year 24 is for a retention pond or a settling pond where we would pump water out of the Jordan River to be able to settle in this pond, and then we would pump into the new irrigation system from there. So that reduces a lot of the sediment and it improves the quality of the water going through and it's, it's um, less destructive on the irrigation system. Can I ask a clarifying question on these numbers? So the general fund support is 500,000 that is moving from general fund into the golf fund. And the negative number on the 1.8 is that the like That was the, the, that was the match that we set aside for the grant. So uh, is it, that's not an additional general fund transfer. That's money that's sitting in the golf fund that would then be spent on Rose Park Irrigation in fiscal year 23, and then again on the retention pond in fiscal year 24. Right. So we needed to have the funds in place in order to apply for the grant, and that's how we used that, those funds. But because we didn't receive it, we're, gonna, we're still going to use those funds for the irrigation system. We will provide the other match ourselves from, um, from revenues that we have from this budget. From Golf fund revenues. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So because uh, we had a, a, the total list here that we have for our capital projects is, is just over $4 million, which um, in, in my 20 years uh, in golf, we've, we've never really been able in, to be in a position to reinvest back into the facilities. Um, we, we've never been able to make excess revenue to the point where we could reinvest. And so it's very exciting to be able to, to have a list of items where this money will, will go back into the courses themselves. Um, obviously, there's no, there's no shortage of, of need at the golf course. We've, we've provided through the staff report, I think about $27 million worth of projected need. Um, this being able to address it in fiscal year 23 would be 4 million of that. So that's a considerable amount. It takes a big chunk of that. Um, because we didn't receive the, the grant, we've had to change some of the other projects that we had um, projected. Uh, and so we have a total of, of two million going back into that Rose Park system, um, irrigation system. 
um, with an additional $525,000 for cost overruns. Uh, as you can imagine, the, the cost of putting in an irrigation system goes up on a monthly basis. So every, every month that we don't put it in, uh, the costs continue to go up. But the, the philosophy around how to best use, use this money is, is we're putting it right back into the courses and right back into the playing surfaces. Um, leveling tee boxes, cart path constructions. We have some, some basic needs that we have at a few of our clubhouses for, for, uh, for heaters and roof repairs and things like that. But again, this is, these are basic things that, go, you know, that this is why people play golf is the, is the product. And so we're putting it right back into that. So that's all I have for right now, and so happy to take any questions that, that you may have. Chair. That's a point. Um, I'm looking at the, um, this uh, other document, attachment one, Golf CIP Projects Backlog, um, and uh, I see the clubhouses uh, for some of the golf courses being in low priority, or labeled as low priority. Um, and I've been talking about this for a little while. I've been probably uh, you know, trying to learn a lot about golf uh, and uh, you know I understand that it's there is a lot of value there and there's a lot of it's an important asset to the community and Victoria has told me a lot about this and uh, you know Amy Fowler Councilmember Fowler uh, told me so I you know I understand the value I but I also um, struggle with uh, with some of the amenities that we have not you know I'm not pointing at you I'm just pointing at the air and us I guess um, uh, other cities uh, in a very close in this county and in, uh, in New York counties have invested a lot of money on their clubhouses, on their golf courses, and they're making lots of revenue um, uh, as amenity. Um, they're hosting uh, retirement parties, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, <laughs> other um, uh, and uh, other events. Um, other, other events. Time. <laughs> <laughs> you can write to the city council via email. I, 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 I'm sorry. I thought it was a good joke. I, um, yeah. And, uh, but I, I wonder if there is a way to move that. I know that there's a lot of money, and I'm, you know, the, you know, there is a lot of events, and the community on the west side is always asking for more event space. And, you know, why can we not have nicer amenities? Uh, I know that those are big ticket items. Um, but I, I hope that we can think about a way to start slowly upgrading them instead of putting them as a low priority and at the same time hurting, you know, uh, revenue possibilities for the golf courses. Yeah. Right, and I can, I, can, I can see both sides of that. And obviously we, we, see a need, we see need in a lot of different places, but still I guess I, the lifeblood of a, of a golf course is the turf and keeping that healthy is, is, is paramount to that. So looking at the age of almost all of our irrigation systems, it, it has to be a, a priority. Um, we've had some discussions with, with other private entities for a public-private partnership for, for clubhouses where we have you know, joint events or, or even office space or some things like that. Um, and so we're, we're definitely open to, to you know, having those discussions and, and finding you know, a, somewhat, some, a similar arrangement where a private entity is bringing some of those funds um, to the golf course again, you know people pay money to get out and play and so again my Focus is to make sure that, that their experience, you know equals what they're paying um, And so again, I would if there was no unlimited amount of money, you know, definitely the clubhouses would, would get that Can I just give a little bit of history in the the last time and it's been a long time since the council expressed a policy on the topic of clubhouses and renting them and things like that, but the last instruction the council gave is to not um, create um, a draw for uh, for public for clubhouses and have them be like wedding reception venues and things like that. Because for quite a few years, the city was getting criticism for competing with the private sector reception centers and things like that. Now. Yeah, so I, that may not be the issue anymore. I, I had one, one other piece of information to share too. If um, it, when when we did a financial analysis of the golf fund in 2013, I believe it was, we looked at some of those clubhouses across the county, and I think that it's um, almost as much lore and not supported by facts that that 
they produce revenue that pays for the courses because when you actually dig into the dollars and cents of how much they were to build and how much revenue they're producing, they do not pay for themselves. And so frequently the communities that build them choose to build them because they need a draw in their community and they're willing to subsidize that draw to you know, have a nice kind of um, crown jewel, but the, the math it, it does not bear out that they pay for themselves. How, how long was this again? Uh, I wanna say 2014. Okay, and I, and I would like to look. No, no, I think, I think it, I think like anything else, you know, we, we need to look at it. Right? And, and, and it was actually, it was that analysis that um, I think caused the golf fund to um, go out for a private sector kind of public private partnership because the reason they don't pencil is that you have to issue debt to build them, you know, five, $10 million up front. And so you have to have cash flow to come in to pay that debt. If you have a private entity willing to come in and put that money in um, and with a revenue sharing agreement, then that of course changes the calculation. Um, there wasn't a response to the to the one RFP that the um, golf fund put out, but I don't know if there's a new um, conversation since then. It is for sure a pro like something that I feel very strongly about to look into it again. Yeah. Uh, me too. Maybe expanding on that, I think uh, Matt, you highlighted some benefits that non-golfers have from the golf courses, but I think there could be more. I, I mean, I think that we could actually have sort of intended uses of those open green spaces for people that aren't golfing or at times when golf isn't really feasible, like when there's snow on the ground. Um, so I, if it's not the clubhouse, is there efforts to like make some type of cross country skiing path across the course or things like that? And I, I believe it's been discussed before, but I think um, that to me would make it uh, more uh, palatable for us to be using property tax and sales tax to be su subsidizing the golf courses um, and also just make those spaces, you know, we need park spaces and if we can use golf courses and I understand that we don't wanna destroy the turf and we, there's like all sorts of other things and you don't want people to get hit by a flying golf ball and whatever else, but our city is in need of recreation spaces and not everybody plays golf. And so if we can get those golf courses to act as a sort of s kind of subsidize the park system that, that you know, we, we all wish we had more space to recreate. If I, I feel like the golf courses could be really like a, a winning asset because we don't, parks are so expensive to maintain and golf courses almost maintain themselves but not quite, right? But, or m maintain themselves better than parks do. They generate, they generate more money than parks do. And so if we could figure out a way to, to use them in some ways like we, are, we use parks as well, I think that that could be a really great way for us to maintain financial solvency, but also have green spaces for our community to use the whole community. And, I, my father would hate me if I said anything bad about golf because he's a very <laughs> avid golfer, so <laughs> he will roll over in his grave if I tried to cut the golf or anything. That's Mayor Fowler. Mr. Chair, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, I mean, everybody knows my position on this, but I think it's, it's interesting now having a new council and the way the conversation changes. Um, but, you know, I think um, to your point, Darren, uh, Council Member Mano, I mean, as you all know, I live down the street from Forestdale, and when there actually is snow, it, the, the golf courses aren't closed, so people go over and use them all the time. Um, and <clears throat> I see people on their cross-country skis, I see their dogs out there, you know, running around. We don't have any rule about, like, I think there at one point when there was construction, it said no trespassing and absolutely zero people paid attention to that. <laughs> um, and so I think to the point of the philosophy behind an open space and what they give to the neighborhood, um, whether you golf or not, is a, is a f philosophical question um, that I think, again, having where I started in the council in this conversation to today has changed quite a bit. but. Um, you know, one of the things that isn't mentioned is that, um, for, again, for example, you drive down 9th East, 
um, near my end of the neighborhood and you have a bunch of condos and buildings and all of that construction going on in Sugar House and even just driving by that open space creates, I get to see the mountains, right? Like, oh yeah, it's great, it's beautiful. So there's all of these unintended benefits, I think, that we haven't in, because we've been so focused on the budget and how it doesn't pencil, that I don't know that we've gotten to a level of what really are the public benefits, even if we're not making any revenue off of it. Um, and similarly, going to the clubhouses, I think to Jen's point, it may not pencil, but the question is, is this a public benefit to your community? And to your point, Council Member Pui, uh, there is a, a, a need for some gathering spaces within different areas of our communities that looks nice and maybe we don't, you know, maybe it's a very minimal cost to rent it out to communities to, and I did this, um, in December, a community member came to me and said, hey, is there a space that I can do a community dinner for just anyone that is alone on Christmas or around the holidays? And I said, I don't know, let's call the pro over at, at Forest Hill. And we had a great uh, turnout from people, not just around my neighborhood, but all over. And we definitely utilized that space. So I think the part of this discussion of subsidizing things and and I did bring it up and almost put it on the chopping block earlier and compared it to something else, right? But um, is, is the offset it has to the actual benefits and it does generate more revenue than a free park does, whatever, but they have different benefits and, and different things there. So uh, I think even just looking at this clubhouse idea and kind of moving it up the priority list of that backlog, um, is a philosophical question that I, I think does add a lot of value to our communities, even if they don't pencil all the way. Um, there isn't a lot of probably community space to meet over in, on the west side. There's not really a lot of like big enough community space to meet in down like my area of Sugar House, right? So it is a, a thing to utilize and to look at and I'd like to see that moved up as well. And. I appreciate the open-mindedness to the philosophical benefit discussion and the community benefits that golf courses and playing golf brings. That's all. Thanks. <laughs> I think I think I've been always uh, I've always since I've been at the council I think I've always been in support of having investing on something for the golf courses that might not give us a lot of revenue back, but it will be a benefit. So. You know, like we said, like parks don't make a lot of money, so but we still pay for them. Golf courses bring some money, doesn't pay for 100%, but so I'm in favor of that. I think we've talked about this before. It seems like there's a more interest um, in doing this. So can we do a legislative intent or something like that where they will look into, again, investing in some of these clubhouses, uh, meeting spaces in the golf courses or do we need to send an email to you guys say hey this is what we want to do can you look into this the sooner the better we can definitely look into that and you know one thing I'll just say is the projects that Matt has proposed here are projects that will add value to the golf course and the golf experience that hopefully will retain the golfers that are coming there and attract more golfers, which in turn eventually would add more revenue coming into the golf course that hopefully we could use to invest again into golf courses. And so, I mean, you have to have green grass and beautiful grass for golfers to be out there. And so that's his number one priority. And some of these other ones like um, cart paths and tee box leveling, those are super important as well. You, you know, having those basics and then once we get that established at some of our um, courses, hopefully we can bring in more funding to do nice things like have a great clubhouse because we agree with you. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank Councilmember you. Wharton. Um, quick questions. Do any of the um, these proposed um, investments in golf infrastructure include um, like a gray water or brown water, non-clear water? Um, <laughs> Is that possible? And then, well, I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> well, 
The water in the Jordan River is pretty gray. Um, <laughs> however, we, I have had discussions with public utilities. Uh, Rose Park is an excellent location, obviously, to the sewage treatment plant. However, I've been told that the, the quality of the water um, that will be re released is not beneficial to turf, um, to put it lightly. So we, we've, had, we've had a couple of different discussions, but it, it's really, that's, that's our best opportunity, I think, in order, if, if that exists. Uh, but right now, Public Utilities says that's not, that's not a very good option okay. for us moving forward. Okay, and then, because I thought, uh, I thought we did have some non-culinary water that we were using. We did, and Liberty Park has non-culinary. Oh, okay. Mountain Dell that... has non-culinary, um, and the Ro Rose Park and Glendale Esco was intended to bring it to non-culinary water, and then when the water quality issue was discovered, uh, it pivoted. Got oh, it. We, we still, it's, it's non-culinary. Uh, it just Glendale presented challenge. Rose Park, yeah. <laughs> so okay. we're, we're, we're making do. Okay. Um, and then my second question is, um, how difficult would it be um, to just reissue the RFP that we had issued a couple of years ago um, with like maybe a little bit more, I think it was pretty broad. We were like asking people to come with all kinds of ideas, like compete with Top Golf and stuff like that. <laughs> but if we just maybe like tone it down a little <laughs> and make it more of like an event venue thing, um, how hard would it be to just reissue that pretty much the way that it was out a couple years ago? Um, I don't think it would be difficult at all. I think, I think probably the shortcomings you're referring to, there were some stipulations that we had put in it around revenue sharing. Mm -hmm. I think that, that possibly kept some people away. Um, so yeah, I, I think we could, you know, I don't know if I would dust off the old one, but I, I think we could come up with something that yeah, yeah, I just I don't want to spend too much time like um, re you know re redrafting a whole thing when we we kind of went through this a little while ago and and I hope that I mean you would know better than I the changes that we could make that might um, you know get more bites um, but I really would love to um, see a way to you know increase revenue through event space as well and if reissuing the RFP is a way to to get that conversation going again um, or get some ideas generated then that's I'd be interested in that thank you okay I have a two more uh, different different line here one was the using chemicals out there are, are we looking at any uh, natural chemicals instead of uh, on pesticides or, or grass stuff, dandelion removal. <laughs> <laughs> the big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I think I, I I heard Lee Lee speak to that. We we run into the same thing with with uh, with organics. Um, is is there typically twice, okay. sometimes three times the cost? Um, we're very interested in being able to do it. Um, in fact, we we operate Mountain Dell um, with putting very little on because with you know we're protecting, you know a, a you know water runoff source there. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it's just, it's, it's a matter of <laughs> kind of having that part of the industry kind of come up to, the, to speed where it is more cost effective to being able to do it. We definitely would, would, would like to go down that road if we could. Okay. And the second one is on the, you know, uh, water's a big issue and the drought tolerance seeding that we're uh, doing in different golf courses. Are, are you planning on doing that on all the golf courses or is, uh, after Bonneville? And how much uh, water do you think you're going to be saving from using that drought tolerant grass in the non playable areas? Well, I can give you a couple of different examples. And one, I'll, I'll speak to what we did th this, this previous year. We're 10 months into this water year for, for us. And we, we've implemented a, uh, it was de developed through the, the, the drought plan for the city. And so being in stage two of that, we, we actually projected what would happen if we were in three and four. And so we started implementing a lot of those, those measures anyway because we looked at it as an overall budget. We didn't want to get to August and not have any budget at that point. So we, we really did some, uh, some aggressive measures around cutting off certain areas, irrigation to out of play areas, our driving ranges and whatnot. So when you, when you compare what, what we spent so far this year in the 10 months of this year to the previous 
time frame of the previous year, we're at 36% savings. So that's that's pretty outstanding. And so we're, you know, that's part of our plan as we, we go, you know, the, the drought's still, still with us. So we'll continue to do that. To give you some numbers from Rose Park that we included in our WaterSmart um, grant application is we propose to reduce turf at that golf course by 25%, um, if not more, um, and replace with the drought tolerant grass. Um, when you combine with the efficiencies that you get with a new irrigation system, removing the, the those uh, removing the turf, it was a 44% savings. So it's it's significant. So it, I think we want Rose Park to be the model of how a public golf course, in the, at least in this region, not only looks, plays, and, and utilizes water. So it's going to, going to be a lot less turf. As far as irrigated turf, we'll still have uh, more drought tolerant species on the on the property. Um, but again, I think I think all of our courses need to be able to, you know, either their their irrigation systems need to be made more efficient by, you know, cobbling together whatever we can, like we do at a course like Forestdale. Bonneville system is is an amazing system. It saves a lot of water. That's a culinary water source that we use there. So again, I, I think, you know, we're learning a lot on how to do this. And again, Rose Park is is kind of we we want to be able to kind of have that be the model for for this region on how a golf course should operate. Great, because I mean, you're saving us financially dollars, but also the biggest is water. Right. So that's appreciated, and I think we got to, uh, you know stress that point that we're not only saving money, but the, the, the water's a big deal for most of us here. So I appreciate everything uh, you got going here, and thanks for the brief. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Council. Okay, we're almost, uh, we're almost halfway through the night. We got item number 11 of uh, 27 items. I'm just sorry. That's, that's being facetious. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Is there a second dinner plan? There's a second dinner plan. It's called, it's called chocolate. All right, we're on item number 11, the fiscal year 2022 20, to 23 budget, the insurance and risk management. Jennifer Bruno, if you haven't met her yet, she's <laughs> the deputy director. She, she's here with Tamara and Deb Alexander. I thought I saw Deb. And I don't know oh, if they'll be here for sure. They're, they're departments. I mean, Deb's, yep. Oh, great. There they are. Um, and there's not uh, necessarily a presentation for this budget. It touches a few different areas. Um, because this is, uh, there's some new council members, I will go through everything that the uh, Insurance and Risk Management Fund covers. It covers costs associated with the Employee Health Insurance Program, our dental insurance, our disability insurance, life insurance, and unemployment com compensation. Some of the items that fall into the risk category that are covered by the funds are, or by the fund is property insurance, workers' compensation, excess liability insurance, cyber liability insurance, crime and dishonesty coverage, and public official bonds. So those are um, the sort of detailed list of things uh, that are included. The lion's share of the fund, uh, the dollars for this fund, though, go towards the uh, employees' health and dental insurance plans, health, and health insurance plans being the most. Um, there's a total of 7.475 FTEs between HR and the attorney's office that are technically charged to this fund based on the duties that they perform. And the increases for the fiscal year 23 budget um, mostly reflect the in, uh, increase in costs related to cyber liability for obvious reasons that um, those issues have been growing recently. And then um, $300,000 increase to cover increases in the city's property insurance rate. So um, those, that's probably the high level. Uh, and I don't know if you have anything you want to add or Tamara or Deb. I thought you did a great job summarizing it. Okay. Thanks. And if you have any questions. Did I hear public official bonds? Mm -hmm. someone like, uh, what are they? Like how we're all like friends in addition <laughs> to me. Yeah. <laughs> It's the this snacks. This is Tamara. Covers the snacks. I'm monitoring. I think Tamara so is joining that, online. Like. All right. So the public official bonds include uh, a bond of the, the city treasurer, the um, finance director, and the deputy uh, treasurer. And and Tamara, can you um, add a little bit more information of uh, what the term bond means in that case? Does it cover oh, sure. liability for those positions? 
It does. It's a uh, faithful performance of duty and also um, a fidelity bond, basically. So if there was um, a mishandling of money, the city would have some protection there. There's a $10 million bond for each of those three positions that's required by um, city ordinance. The rest of the city employees are covered under um, a crime policy that acts as a, an employee blanket bond. Thank you, that, that helps a lot, even though they're, they're not public officials that are appointed by public officials, but it's a protection, it's a bond. Okay, I get it. Any other questions? Boy. I did want to draw attention to one of the attachments because it contains a lot of really good information. We didn't plan a briefing about it because I know we're running out of time, but the attachment um, goes over the detail to the city's um, employees' health insurance and dental insurance plans. It talks about data during COVID, um, why the um, premiums are increasing, things like that. So it is worth, uh, it's worth a look through for that. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And I'll just add to that. The slide that talks about Salt Lake City historical claims reflects the $45 million of cost avoidance that the city has realized because we made changes to the way we were delivering health care about 10 years ago. So. Thank you very much. That was pretty easy for you. Sorry. You have a great Thank evening. Thank you. And um, council members, before we leave, I'd like to take a minute and acknowledge Tamara because she's retiring um, this month after 30 dedicated years of service with the city and wonderful years of service in the city attorney's office. Well, not the entire time, but, but a good chunk of the time she was in the city attorney's office. And we just want her to know that we honor her and we've always appreciated working with her and we wish her well. That's really fine, thank you. <laughs> camera, you can't see it because the camera hasn't Thank changed you. yet. But they're standing. Yeah. You were standing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you very much. We're now moving on to item number 12 fiscal year 2022, but 23, budget, Justice Court Department. We're changing seats, Sylvia. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you too. And we have Judge Landau. Come on up. Oh, there he is. There's Curtis and Valletta. Nice to have you. And Curtis. You yeah, Curtis too. Yes. So, if you uh, just a quick overview of the court, the Justice Court um, budget key changes are found on page forty. The organizational structure and more de details are found on pages 191 to 195, and the staffing document is on page 270 of the Mayor's Recommended Budget Book. Uh, the Salt Lake City Justice Court is the largest municipal court in Utah with a very high volume of misdemeanor cases. The court is a limited jurisdiction court under the umbrella of the Utah State Court System. The court is responsible for and processes class B and C misdemeanors, small claim cases, jury trials, appeals and expungements, video hearings, prisoner transports, and daily interaction with jails throughout Utah. Additionally, the court monitors and tracks probation, warrants, community service and restitution, collection of penalties, appeals, expungements, and plea and abeyance cases. The court also provides traffic school and coordination of interpreter services. The budget for the Justice Court is proposed to increase um, by $354,000 or 7.3%, which is attributed to personnel costs. The court is not requesting any new programs or services, and uh, Judge, Judge Lando, Landau and Valletta Hitchcock and Curtis Priest are here to take it away from here. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, hi, uh, council members. We're very pleased to be here. Thank you for um, being patient and hanging out till the end of the night with us. Um, 
I speak for the whole Justice Court team in, in saying uh, that we're so pleased of your interest and um, attention and support over the last year. Uh, we're happy to be here just for a few minutes tonight with you. Um, briefly, uh, two years ago we were doing 100% of our hearings in person and by the end of 2020, 95% of our hearings were done remotely and we continue to be, be right around 90 to 95 percent of uh, all of our hearings being done virtually. So uh, that's just one example of the, the many changes that the court has gone through uh, over the last two years. Um, we have s several projects we are working on and, and several research studies going on. I'm going to turn some time over to Judge Landau to to uh, give you some briefings on that and then uh, open it up for questions. And I'm just going to echo what Curtis said. To try to put myself in your position, I try to make sure to listen to the whole afternoon. And I just can't believe how exhausted you guys must be. So um, I'm going to just thank you on behalf of our institution that you guys are putting this effort in. I think it's um, quite magical how our institutions work and I think we were privileged to be on the front line during the pandemic and see just how our institutions were able to respond in difficult circumstances. With the thanks, I want to lead out with someone that's been, I think, a model public servant who's going to be retiring in just a week or two and my voice is catching as I say this. Judge Baxter has served us for over, no, almost 20 years and he's going to do arraignments for the very last time on July 1st. It's hard to imagine running the Justice Court without him. He's been a force of nature in uh, moving us along and putting us, frankly, in the position we are in today, and we're going to miss him dearly. And we're going to celebrate him well um, later on in the year. So I just wanted to get that off my chest. He's been a dear uh, friend of mine and has helped me so much and I think has helped all of us really envision a lot of what, we're what I'm going to tell you about right now. Um, it's also going to come with, an, obviously, a new judge. We, we, we hope that you um, take that process, I know you will, seriously, and, and think about uh, the mayor's selection and then also get that process moving. We have a pretty short window to make sure that person gets trained up in time to start covering uh, busy calendars on July 5th. So you'll, you'll have that business. Uh, we won't talk about that anymore, but that'll be hitting your desks pretty soon. Um, so I think one of the themes that I heard today, and I think it was um, Council Member Pugh, uh, Pugh uh, talk about just the fact that a lot of our equity projects, we've talked a lot about um, changing modes of travel, alternate service delivery models throughout the afternoon, and those equity projects, they just require investment. So Curtis said we're at around 95%. Um, we also know from the National Center that these virtual hearings, they take more time. They take approximately 25 percent longer. But like all equity projects, they're worth it because they save our community so much money in terms of not having to, to, to lose jobs or take days off or hire babysitters or pay for gas to come in, pay for parking, and sit at the courthouse for four hours. So it's an investment that we're all making, I think, in the community, and we should see it as such. With that, uh, switch to remote court. We also have, of course, users that don't have the ability to join remotely. We know the statistics are that about 97% of the populace has a smartphone that's video enabled, so that would get you into any hearing. But we know that um, many of our patrons are, are not very privileged and don't have access to that kind of thing. So whenever we do that, we also have to do things like put uh, video booths in our lobby spaces. Uh -huh. And there too, and this is not something we're requesting now, but we have about 3,000 square feet of courtroom on our first floor that we really don't use regularly and we can convert those spaces into more useful spaces for the public to come in, participate in hearings, uh, sit comfortably while they wait for their judge to come online and also maybe take care of some VIP classes or other things for their court work so they don't have to come back in uh, three months time on an order to show cause because they never had the opportunity to complete the thing that judge, the judge ordered them to do. So that's just um, something about our uh, mode of travel right now. We have obviously also organizational needs that's associated with that. We worked hard uh, with management to get more tech support. We didn't have any IT support really and now we have a very IT intensive mode of travel and we have 
have gotten mostly grant money to get the National Center for State Courts to come in, and they're just finishing a consulting project with us to give us some guidance about what they think our org chart should be like and how we should run things going forward. There are other courts that are doing things like having technology bailiffs uh, to help people through the virtual court experience. That, of course, was unheard of two years ago, and these are all positions that we have to think through and see whether it's worth it or not. Um, so look for that. Uh, and then some of these other projects that Curtis mentioned, we've been very focused on um, trying to lessen the impact of bias in the court system. One of the major projects there is we're working with Harvard. Harvard, of course, is where the implicit association tests originated. We, um, we have a jury trial study where we use different techniques to de-bias the jury, including telling them about implicit bias, giving them instructions about it. And then we have control studies where we don't say anything. We just say what every other judge in the state usually says, which is we expect you to put your bias aside, and then they go on to the case law, uh, or the law, the, the law applicable to the case. So we're trying to do that study to, in an effort to determine whether there are uh, useful methods of making sure our juries are as unbiased as possible. We know that uh, as humans we all are um, unfortunately a little bit biased, and we have to work hard to overcome those things. Um, the other part of that, and this is also thankfully, to, thanks to the pandemic, we have a growing database of jury data available, so this is something we never had. We have about 6,000 data sets, so we can tell you exactly what the racial breakdown of our jury pool is and how it's changing, and also how their attitudes are changing. And I think we tried to send you those pie charts, um, but it was 18 pages long, and we knew that you would devour that information to the detriment of everything else that you were supposed to do today. <laughs> and so we didn't send it after all. But if you're interested, just contact me. And our hope is that, that we'll put that on our website, and there'll be kind of these quarterly reports on what our jury pool is looking like. We, by the way, we've seen uh, pre-pandemic, for example, our, um, our breakdown was about 87% uh, white and 13% uh, people of color in the pool. That's changed a little bit um, with doing things virtually. Now it's about 83% white and 17% people of color. So it's nice to be able to have the data. We can at least tell what's going on in our jury pool. Um, Another thing that I think this is the theme that you guys also have addressed with the fire department and the police department, thinking deeply about folks that have heavy involvement with the criminal justice system and trying to figure out what they need. Um, you heard from the fire department about their use of social workers. LDA, of course, uses social workers. The jail has a new reentry facility that's going to have social workers. And we're just trying to work with our partners to, um, to do a better job of helping people out that have kind of an uh, overlapping issue with mental health, uh, drug addiction, and criminal justice system. And we're trying to solve that with all our partners. It's taken a lot of work. We meet about weekly. And uh, we're very hopeful that we can make some progress on that front as well. Um, finally, uh, and we heard it from uh, Council Member Fowler at the beginning about the CAT. Uh, we know that we're doing all these outreach events. That's also a difficult mode of travel. That's not easy to do. We couldn't do it without the city. So we have all of our friends at the city that help us put together things like court on the Jordan River, court at various homeless encampments around town, and we still do the court that Judge Baxter started 20 years ago, which is court at the Wiegan Center, although we're only doing that once a month because, of course, our homeless population is a little more dispersed now. It's not as, um, it's not as heavy a calendar. Uh, those things are all a massive lift, and they, of course, affect our um, division of labor. It's not easy, but we feel like it's worth it, and we're very thankful to be in a city that I think sees the value in that work and doesn't just look at their court as a um, how much money did you bring in and fines this month kind of facility. So, um, yeah, with that, who's got questions? Councilman Wharton. Um, so I just sent you a message. I would love to see that report. Um, so what is the caseload uh, now for the Justice Court? Curtis Corp, has all, he's the graph man. He's like got all the graphs. 190,000? Yeah. As you know, our cases have gone down beginning at the same time COVID did. Mm -hmm. um, the, the two areas of the court that stayed almost the same throughout mm -hmm. COVID are the most serious cases that come to the Justice Court, and that's the DUIs and the domestic violence. And those have bounced back the quickest. They're almost uh, exactly the same as FY19 uh, today. We, we have about 100 filings of domestic violence a month, and we have 75 DUI filings per month. 
and that's exactly what we had in 2019. Um, the, the areas, uh, some areas that are not bouncing back as quickly are the traffic cases and um, the other standard uh, minor criminal cases. And because of that, the revenue has not bounced back either. So. Okay, but what's the total caseload of the court right now? Because I know maybe 2018-ish, it was like 190,000. 180,000 cases? Uh-huh. Um, no, not Free that year. much. Right but, now in uh, 2022, we've done 8,000, uh, 8,100 traffic cases, and we've done um, 4,100 criminal cases. Oh, maybe it was only 90,000 a year. Anyway, I don't, don't remember what, exactly what it was, but still like far and above the busiest justice court in the state. Um, and what about the, um, the, this is more, was more an issue or a question I had pre pandemic. And I wonder what the plan is moving forward, um, about, um, it is a very small building. Um, is that building going to continue to be able to serve, um, the needs of the city? Um, or does it need to expand or is is moving to, the, to this remote option going to help alleviate those pressures that were on the court prior to the pandemic? I think it's alleviated all of our crowding problems. Great. Uh, I mean, that's what Judge Landau was talking about. We now have vacant space available that we're trying to reuse in another way. Um, we have a lot less people coming into the court. Uh, we have a lot less staff there each and every day. Um, so we have room to spare. And you're, you're anticipating keeping a lot of these changes, making these changes permanent, even after the pandemic's long, long over? You know, Council Member Wharton, I think that uh, remains to be seen because okay. uh, we obviously are part of a bigger justice system. And I remember vividly in January or in, in June of last year before the Delta wave hit, um, there were jurisdictions around the state that had already decided we're done with WebEx, we're going back to in-person. I remember that week because that was a week where every single private defense attorney was scrambling and having other people cover for them because they actually had to drive to where it, wherever it is their in-person hearing was and then they couldn't cover us. So we're, we're connected to a bigger system and the administrative office of, a, of the courts has a green phase committee that is going to be making, I hope, uh, these recommendations later on this summer about what can stay uh, remote and what presumptively needs to be done in person. Once we have that guidance, uh, we're gonna have pressure to just fall in line, but our intent is to preserve the benefits of the remote work that we've learned to do so well over the last two years. One of the things I forgot to mention is we have the- yeah, I was just gonna uh, bring that oh, up. Oh yeah, you why don't you go for it then. Well, I was gonna say, um, this time next year, we'll be able to give you some data. Uh, we've partnered with the University of Utah Business School, and they're going to study the uh, positive effects of a hybrid model and using remote hearings, uh, not only financially, but environmentally. And uh, we're just getting underway with that study. And so we're going to have some data on that, on how, how much pollution we're reducing from not ha having so many people come in, not having so many employees come in, um, and also the financial end of that as well. And about the and so we're excited about that because I think you'll see the tons of uh, carbon that aren't going into the atmosphere because we're working remotely. Um, on the space issue, this is something that the very first um, National Center uh, uh, Judicial Conference that I went to in 2018, the ver very first uh, keynote speaker uh, started out by saying, um, by 2030, no one's ever going to build a brick and mortar courthouse ever again because we're going to be doing so much virtually. And you could tell that the whole room said, Pasha, that's nonsense. We're going to keep building our nice, beautiful marble courtrooms till the end of time. And then within two years, it's come to pass that we really don't need our spaces. Um, I think if everything went wrong on a particular day, we'd need two courtrooms because the only things we're doing in person are jury trials and bench trials where there's a misdemeanor where someone has a confrontation clause right to, uh, to do it in person. And so everything else is just empty. And we need to be creative about using those spaces better 
Because like I said, right now we've got cramped lobby spaces with a couple of booths and people aren't being served well. And we can learn a lot from, I think, even other departments in the city, this building, community health centers. Just look how spaces are designed to be welcoming, to have a nice seating area, to have somewhere where people can get work done on their cases, see the judge. Uh, we've talked to CJS, our, our probation providers. They might be willing to just put one of their people, just have them stationed at the court. You just say, you just got done with the judge. There's your, um, there's your probation provider. Go talk to them before you leave, and then we don't have to have that order to show cause hearing in 60 days because you didn't set it up. Right. That's, that's so great. And so the last thing is I just want to say that's been so, so many um, positive improvements um, in the justice court just on the time that I've been on the council, but also in the time that I've been a practicing attorney and when I started as a third year intern in the prosecutor's office. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I, I love seeing all of the changes that you're making and embracing that innovation um, and those opportunities and um, well done. And I'm excited to see what's next. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. And. Um I, I just want to uh, thank, uh, you know, th this department for the emphasis on uh, digital. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a huge improvement for, uh, for people in, in my community. I think it, 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 we're going to see the long-term effects and the positive effects on this and uh, being uh, accessing the court uh, from a computer. And to spin this, uh, maybe there is something to think about our libraries to be, uh, our people in our libraries to be trained and how to Maybe the, our library computers need to have WebEx or whatever we use, uh, and, and maybe they need to be trained on uh, their employees and how to log in, you know, into this and the court system, to, so so people can actually go to the library if they don't have a computer or a or a, a fancy phone uh, to access a web, WebEx from from it. Um, so and. I just, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned this before, uh, since we are having all this extra information now on, on people that are going through the, the justice system, including emails, um, because we know we're communicating with them so they can get the link to WebEx and whatnot, um, I wonder if there is a way of systemi systemizing uh, when people are due for expungements. Um, and they can get a notification whenever it is. In a month, you're due for your expungement. This is the website, you know, in this and that. I know that that might require more funding or, you know, some technology in there, but I think it would be wonderful that the people that have done everything right um, and we already have their emails, I know that some of them might lose, you know, but, but maybe we can capture some people uh, and no capture, that's the wrong term, but you know, it, it help, it help, some, yeah, help some people go through the sometimes complicated expungement process. Um, but I, I know that there's some law changes in there, so. Um, Luckily, we, we're not having to do that work because um, the county has the county. an expungement office and there, there have been a number of clean slate bills that have been passed and uh, Clean Slate Utah and Noella Sudbury's uh, folks have been working really hard on getting the information out about that automatic expungement process. Okay. So uh, we kind of piggybacked off the county's work on that and direct people that way. Um, but it is confusing. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I have is about Veterans Court. I know that that will be discontinued after Judge Baxter leaves. Um, he, that was, he was kind of the linchpin for that program. And while I recognize, I, when I was in, um, at LDA, I did a, a stint at a, a rotation in Veterans Court, and I recognize there's probably not a ton of clients coming in and out of there, but my concern is that there are clients that are incredibly dependent on that um, structure. And are, do we have something in place to make sure that they are getting the resources outside of veterans court that is needed? I mean, I know the VA is yeah. obviously very um, connected with veterans court, but there's this sense of like, if if I'm going to be, I never see Judge Baxter, I'm not in his court anymore, but if, if, if I'm gonna be upset about him leaving, people that are very dependent on that structure are going to be upset and, we do know that there's a, a lot of mental health resources that when we change with PTSD and things like that, when you change the, the environment, 
things can happen. So is there a plan in place through Veterans Court that we are making sure that the clients that do come through there are getting the resources that they need? Let me just start by saying nationwide, Veterans Court numbers are down. And so, you know, for whatever reason, it may just be that we're in between veteran groups. But nationwide, the numbers are down. And the plan there is I think we only have five or six people in that court. And we can do, and I have to talk to Judge Mao, who runs the um, Veterans Court at the district court level. We can, of course, engage in a appeal process where we artificially kind of create jurisdiction in the district court uh, veterans group so that we can, and then I think there's a, probably an associated expectation that we help out a little bit with that. But because I think both courts are low on numbers, it makes a whole lot of sense to try to get the benefit of the economies of scale and just put the groups together, um, but certainly not leave people hanging. Um, right now it's just, correct me if I'm wrong, I think five, Judge Baxter said five or six people are, are regulars in the program. Okay, great. Um, that was the only question I had, but uh, I'll save all I'll save all my Judge Baxter comments for J Judge Baxter. I do want to say that um, all of the I, Judge Landau is um, and his team I think are rather humble, and um, the the work that the that Judge Landau particularly has put into the improvements made within the Justice Court, including obviously the implicit racial bias. Um, project, but beyond that, um, has been recognized nationally, and Judge Landau has been recognized, um, and it goes straight to the dedication that he has for the change and for the uh, for actual sincere criminal justice reform at, you know, I always say that Salt Lake City government, uh, you know, or, or councils and are the closest to government that people can get to, and our justice court system and the way that we've structured it is the closest to actual resource and justice that I think a lot of people can ever get to. Um, so your work is, uh, is should not go unrecognized as much as you believe in humility. I, I, I don't for you, so I get to well, point all of that out. So thank you for that, and thank you for being a model for a lot of jurisdictions throughout the country and continuing to, to come up with my, uh, you know, uh, let me be a part of the crazy ideas. Sometimes you've supported me in those, and um, thank you for uh, all of your team's work. But I got to piggyback off that and say that um, there are people at the court, like Curtis, Valida, Judge Baxter, have been doing this for years, and we couldn't, we couldn't have responded the way that we did without the foundation that was built there. And so, um, you know, the dandelion story came, came to mind. You know, we got lots of the chemicals, but no one to spray it. We have all the people that do the work, and it's our judicial assistants that come in and, and do this stuff day in and day out, and it hasn't been easy. Um, courts don't change easily, and so it's not fun when you're the guy that's saying, all right, Sunday's come around again, and I'm going to send out an email for how we're working this week. And that's very disorienting, especially for courts, because they just say, what? We haven't changed in 30 years, and now we've changed three times in the last three weeks, and we can't handle this. And so everyone's been very patient with me. I hope I've been very patient with them, and everyone's really pulled on the rope in a, in a spectacular way. And uh, some, some gratitude to you as well, uh, Councilwoman Fowler. It's, it's been nice over the years to see you in homeless court and on the river. Um, it's it's been fun and it's it's been good memories and we appreciate that kind of support well thank you very much and I, and I think Councilmember Fowler said it well uh, and I appreciate all your work and you know your desire and your vision to move forward with everybody so I appreciate that very much have a great evening thank you thank you thanks so much everyone yeah Okay, Council, do you want a uh, quick uh, five-minute break? Can you take a five-minute break, ten-minute break, before you go to unresolved issues? Yes, yes to the break? Yes to the break. Yes to the break. Uh, take a quick five minutes, stretch out, give Jennifer five minutes.
item number 13, fiscal year 2022-23, unresolved issues. And Jennifer Bruno at this, on the stage. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you'll notice that there's no information in packets for this item because this is really more of, uh, it's, it's a little early in the process to have a, a defined list of unresolved issues. Um, but uh, as staff, we thought we should orient the new council members especially for what the purpose of this topic is. And it's basically just a catch-all for every potential thing you're, as a, you as a council member are interested in uh, adding, cutting, changing, more information on legislative intents. So those are kind of the main categories that I'm tracking right now. And in all of our um, individual meetings and in all of the briefings, as different items come up, I have just been tracking them on a list. So right now it's a very ugly, not publishable list, but by June 2nd, by your Thursday meeting on June 2nd, it will be a somewhat more publishable, polished list. And then, um, as we have those discussions, that'll be the um, kind of the framework for you guys to have a conversation where you actually figure out if there is a, a support for any one of those items. If there's four, it, it, I mean, basically it comes down to, is there support from four people to add something, remove something, change something? Um, so like hypothetically, if you wanted to say, you know, remove uh, this one specific item from this department or add this one specific item from this department, it would be a little line and you would take a straw poll and then we'd figure it out and staff would keep track of the overall budget balancing because that's the most important thing is balancing the budget, right? And we'd figure out where you need to get the revenue from if we're over budget or um, if you're under budget, where you want to spend that money if you want to spend that money or if you just want to reduce the budget. Um, one of the other topics that came up in chair vice chair today that's not like specifically in the budget, although tangentially it is, are the conversations about the geo bond and the sales tax bond because a lot of the projects that are in the geo bond and the sales tax bond could also be funded in CIP and then vice versa. So a lot of the projects, and you could kind of mix and match any and all of those projects. There might be um, logistical or strategic reasons why you would wanna put a project in one place or another. Um, but we'll be working with the administration in the next couple days to see if we can pull together kind of a high level overview of all of the things, all of those projects that are on the list. One of the reasons that um, we want you guys to think about CIP in the context of the annual budget adoption, um, even though you don't actually go through and approve all of the projects, is let's say there are like four projects that didn't make the cut, but you don't want to cut any of the projects that are recommended for funding, but it means you need to find another million dollars to transfer to CIP. That needs to be decided in the context of the annual budget adoption. So you need to figure out how to put an additional million dollars into CIP to fund those projects. Or let's say you decide, well, we're going to fund those projects in the sales tax bond instead, and we're just going to do a bigger sales tax bond. Or we're going to do a smaller sales tax bond because we want to reduce the property tax increase. Or, you know, all those options are on the table, but... Um, we, we don't have, the, n none of those uh, proposals are necessarily neatly within one department necessarily, so they don't necessarily fit in the department briefings. Um, so we're gonna try to have a sort of more holistic discussion about that. And I don't know if, if there's any initial feedback on that tonight, we can work that into our um, work with the administration on that, or, um, or if you have items you want on my rough list, go at it. <laughs> so. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Wait, what? Where's the rough list? In uh, your, it's in not publishable. Okay. So just know that I've been taking notes as you guys have been talking, and I'm working on polishing it up. Just so you know, the general categories are potential cuts, because I heard I've heard from some council members that there's an interest in reducing the property tax increase or eliminating it. Not necessarily a conclusion either way. There's a section uh, that I'm calling follow-up questions where it's not to say that you guys are interested in taking away the funding or changing the funding, but we need a lot more information. Um, animal control is one of those. Um, there's a section called potential ads um, that I've heard from some council members about things to potentially add to the budget. And then there's a section on legislative intents where um, that's sort of more of a place where you put your intentions for the following year. So. Go ahead. Jumping into this? Well, um, yeah. Whenever, I'm just going to go around the room and ask. 
So I haven't found like the silver bullet of anything <laughs> that I want to cut, especially since so much of this is just driven by like making sure our people get stay paid well enough to live. Um, and that's an expense I'm never going to argue with. Uh, but I would like a legislative intent that we I've spoken about in small groups with a few people. We have a lot of programs that we've been piloting lately that we are going to need if I'm going to tell my constituents that we're raising their property taxes and after a review, this number is the right number, we have to raise it, I think I owe them accountability and transparency in response to that. And so I would like us to commit ourselves to creating very clear metrics, particularly around these programs that we are starting or have recently started. I'm, t I'm thinking about all of the racial equity and policing programs, the park rangers program, things like that, that will allow us to continually evaluate if this investment is what we want it to be, uh, will allow us to optimize more swiftly. But if we're gonna, if we're gonna raise taxes and, and pinch people, I want us to have a high level of quality control to make sure that it's worth it for our constituents. Thanks. I wonder, Anna, or, well, just yeah. Councilmember Petrush, I wonder what, how, what does that look like from a legislative standpoint? Like, what do we, do we ask for a six month review of every, I every mean, I new think, budget? Like, I'm not sure exactly how to write that. I th my think the predisposition is, is always toward a rubric and something that is that takes subjective factors, but makes them objective and simple enough to be at least understood from the outside. And then that rubric should be systematically executed and reviewed, whether we decide that's biannually or if it's just something that we do in the lead up to budget season. You know, all of that is up for debate, but I do think we need to set some internal controls on these new programs. I I would like to uh, to team out to this. I think, to me, it's hard to, for me to tell them, you know, to create a, you know, some standards because I don't know, and maybe no one really knows what the standards are. But maybe more transparency about how, what did what did they do in the last X amount of months? How many people they have responded to? You know, how many case, you know, how many calls, and like a little more reporting back to us, so we can actually go back to our community councils and explain to them, you know, the alternative, and in, in this case, the alternative, you, you know, responses that this city is asking to be funded. And uh, I am I'm very happy that we are having this for the work of many of you before. Um, but I would like to know, I don't want it to be in the bucket of all of this that no one knows if it's working or not, if we don't, no one knows how many people that are responding right. to so it. So just, I don't want to get into the, it's really, we're just kind of sending yeah, out. Yeah, we don't need to be in the weeds. And we don't want to be in the weeds right now. We're really just trying to get Jennifer some some bullet points of yep. an unresolved issue and a request for legislative intent of, mm -hmm. we'd like to have some metrics on the new programs or something of that nature. So and with the legislative intents, just so you know, the um, staff will take our best shot at, at kind of writing it based on what we've heard, but obviously it's open to wordsmithing, it's open to detail, so just know that it's sort of a first draft. It, it will be a first draft um, on the oh, second. Councilman Valdemars. Uh, thanks. I, I'm one of those that think that, you know, I would like to, for all of us to take a second look at the budget and see if the, you know, we can reduce that percentage um, of uh, a tax increase just because I think that's our job to, to squeeze the pockets as much as we can for, and on behalf of the taxpayers, so we can save them as much money as we can uh, with the services that we provide for them, so um, so that's one thing. So I'm I'm still trying to, but again, it's hard. Like Victoria said, it's hard to find you know those those line items that you're like, oh, this is unnecessary, right? And also, it's it's not only hard because of that, but also because what you said, sometimes it's hard to understand where that money is going, etc. So, having that said. Um, something that to me it's unresolved, Jen, and I think we talked about this overall, is that I would like to have a clear list, so I can explain to the public, clear list of where the 
CARES and ARPA money went. I know we did a lot of budget amendments. I know we approved things and all that. But if we can have like a kind of like high level understanding of and the programs or services that we added with those funds that now we need to replace with new money that we don't have. Because, and, and, and I think maybe, maybe we can work with you. I, we, we have um, our staff put together that infographic that showed all of the um, things that were added that were ongoing and the things that were added that were one time. Some of that is being shifted to the general fund from a policy basis, but maybe we can work with you to figure out what on that infographic is not clear um, or, what, or what we could add to, to be more helpful. Um, right, and then because to me it's unclear because in my mind when we did a lot of the ARPA funds was, okay, I know this is a one-time money, I know these things are temporary, I know I won't have, like most likely we will be discussing if we continue this or not. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what we did that, like I don't know what I'm discussing about about that. So maybe and it's just that, a me thing, and but I, think that it's, um, I couldn't explain it to the public. Yeah, and, and I think the hardest part to explain to the public, and I think we've had this conversation, right, is that not all of it went to go to new things. A lot of it went to go to revenue replacement and salaries, which were ongoing things. And so, and maybe, you know, hindsight being 2020, maybe we should have been more clear um, with the public then that, you know, and, and I think, I, I think we talked about it as a structural deficit, but that was probably like too wonky of a term to mean anything. But whenever you put money in as revenue replacement, and so that goes with this current year's budget too. So if there's $15 million in the budget for revenue replacement, that means that every single dollar in the general fund is now kind of tainted with the ARPA funds, meaning you are balancing your general fund budget, all of it, with that one-time money, unless you identify one-time uses for it, but because it just went to general revenue replacement, it was not tied to one-time uses specifically. So I think that, you know, that was the original problem is that it was not tied to one-time uses when you guys first adopted it. Okay, all right, thank you. On the uh, couple of items, I, and I, we spoke about this. I spoke about this earlier, and we've both, I've had a, a few conversations with others about uh, a couple line items, and whether they're in the sales tax bond or the geo bond, I'm not really. I'm just using the line item. I'm using it all as one big group. Uh, I'd like to get more clarity on the Allen Park. Uh, you know, we've already spent quite a bit of money on the actual park, and I'm just uh, concerned that that park will be very expensive and I'd like to, and we also talked about when we first bought it that we would have some uh, uh, outside uh, private donations, funding, support for that park. So I'm really concerned about the $9 million there. And then I like the idea of this seven neighborhood parks, uh, whether it's, you know, $7 million and millions of dollars for each or how we balance that, but I think that uh, that peanut butter spread is probably uh, not realistic. Um, so a little bit more details on that. And in, in my area, I would add the Miller Park, not just the Donner Park to that. So I would just change that. And, and uh, on top of the bonds, I'd like to look at uh, the daylighting creeks. And I'm not sure how much that would cost or where that would be, but it's just an idea that, hey, we have some sections of, uh, of the Red Butte Creek and immigration creeks that would be nice to daylight and throughout the whole city. Uh, and then uh, a couple questions on the Warm Springs historic plunge, the $6 million to that. Seems, um, again, look at are there other ways to get or other funding mechanisms for that? And the same thing for the uh, Pioneer Park, $10 million. The park looks, I think the park's great. Do we need $10 million? Can we get some? Uh, outside funding to support that and we need to do that all at one swoop here for the sales tax bond those are just uh, three of the areas that or four however um, many counted there <laughs> sorry repeat the the you wanted uh to know if there could be private fundraising for pioneer park what was the one before that i just said warm, warm springs, springs, plunge? Warm springs okay. the plunge okay and then there might be uh, others but i'm just looking at those big dollar items and thinking uh, it's 
a lot there. And I think in, um, is your goal at looking at evaluating those dollar amounts in an effort to reduce them to reduce the overall size of the sales tax bond, or you don't know yet? Yes. Okay. It, yeah. To, and or justify what that, that, that dollar figure is. Okay. But I'd like to look at that because, again, uh, this is still coming out of our general fund, and uh, that is where our property tax increase comes from, or is going to. So that's where I want to look at it. Uh, Mr. Chair, just in relation to some of the things you brought up, I think um, with the GEO bond, the sales tax bond, and the CIP fund, actually, first a clarifying question. You were saying like, hey, if we wanted to add a project, we'd have to figure out how to put more money in. We did just put $10 million in there. I know that was sort of just put there, but theoretically, that's un unattached to any project that in this MRB, right? That is correct. Okay. So, um, I guess I, I, I feel like the budget, if I am painting with a really, really broad brush, I, I think the budget has things in there that I know my constituents have been asking for, and of course, it also has added expenses to the residents, and sometimes people maybe think that there's just money we can find and pay for the things they're asking for, but they are, for the most part, things that I, I'm hearing that the community wants. So I have a hard time finding big things to cut. I think supporting our public lands and increasing the access to our parks, increasing, improving the maintenance of our parks is a huge priority. Um, for, for me specifically, but I think also for our community and uh, something that I, I feel like whenever I spoke with residents that was pretty unanimous that they felt like that was an important investment. Um, the one thing I wanna do is look at uh, making sure that we are investing in those public lands in an equitable way and for instance, I know the seven neighborhood parks is actually really small in comparison to all of the investments we're doing. And maybe that's fine to just sort of make sure everyone has access to, access to something good and new, but that's not actually equitable because we don't currently have equitable access to public, public land. Some neighborhoods have better access than others. So equity would look like investing more money in the neighborhoods that don't have any access or have lesser access currently. Now, again, the $7 million is a small piece, but when we look at the big picture, I think we need to make sure that some of those important things, investments in neighborhoods that currently are underserved by public lands and parks happen in, that we're making sure that the ones that we for sure control, if we, as a council agree to fund those things, that those ones, pieces that we for sure control also include investments in those parts and they're not all in the geo bond, which could fail. And then we end up not investing in the West side or in the Glendale park or in neighborhoods that, that desperately need that. And I know that there's a lot of considerations as to which things go where, where but I wanna make sure that we are using that analysis of which residents have lesser access to inform all of those decisions. And I think the ones that are the most important, we need to be making sure we're using the CIP dollars that, that don't have a chance of failing a ballot initiative in order to, to fund some of those. And I'm not sure exactly how to do that. I know that's a much bigger conversation, but that feels pretty important to me. Okay, thank you. Can I ask Bella. just a quick clarifying question? Um, I remember somewhere in everything where that seven million for a park in each district was, but where was that proposed at? Was it that was in one of the bonds? In the geo bond proposal. Um, yeah, I'm totally with Darren on this. Like, I think, I don't know that all the districts need another new park, but rather, and nor do I think that that's the definition of equity. So I'm with you there. One of the things um, with that bond, going back to looking at the different parks, 
something I would like to look at is like for the seven million, do we need new parks or do we need seven million dollars to maintain what we already have and then maybe create new parks where they need to go? But so if we were to, let me rephrase this. Does the bond have to be for something new or can it also be for maintenance? It cannot be for maintenance, um, but I think the proposed, sorry, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> The um, proposal is not for new parks in each district. It's for enhancements, enhancements. to existing oh, okay. parks, yeah. which are allowed by, are allowed to be bondable. And it sounds, it seems like they just, there's seven parks and they put seven parks down here. I mean, they didn't, I don't think they came to each council member and said, hey, which park do, would you want to be enhanced? I think they just. Yeah, said, they, they let us know it was just sort of a rough draft list. Yeah. And so again, you're right. You can't peanut butter spread that. Which that's what it is, one one for each. To use that technical term. Thanks. It's a finance term. Okay, well I just had like a, a short wish list, but this conversation got a little heavy, so I think I'll <laughs> I'll save my short wish list. But I mean I, I know that every single one of us has constituents that you're thinking about when we're talking about raising property taxes and maybe it's like a single parent who we know their landlord is going to push the cost increases down to them or maybe it's a senior that's on a fixed income or maybe it's a veteran or a disabled person we all have residents in our minds that we've sat down with and talked with on their porches or in their living rooms um and you know some of in my case some of these people are my own relatives or um and we absolutely, for that reason, should do what, what Anna and Amy um, and, and Dan have said and leave no stone unturned. But I also think that this is not a situation that we're in right now where we can cut our way out. Um, we, could, we could make cuts and we could change the number that we have to ask for for this year, but that's gonna mean we're gonna have to come back and have this discussion again sooner. And part of the reason that we're in the problem that we're in, I believe, and this is my own opinion, is that you can't go eight years without making any changes at all to property tax and doing all of the things that, that we have promised residents, not just this council, but previous iterations of this council have promised that we would do. And we can't do that and meet all of the mandates that we were given in you know the majority of us that just stood for election or the, those of us that stood for election just three years ago, we can't meet all of those mandates with the current amount that we've been, um, that we're getting in terms of property tax. Can't do it. And that's why we, we had to go out, um, and I, I don't think it was, um, when we went out to do the, the sales tax increase for funding our future, um, and we talked to people about this. Yeah, absolutely, they were worried. But by and large, people said that this that they were willing to pay a little bit more. And part of the reason why we did such a big increase there is because we were sharing the burden with a lot of people that don't live in Salt Lake City, but that come and work in the city every day. And there was no other way to capture that revenue. But now, you know, we're at the time where we need to, we, we cannot keep operating even at the level that we're at without raising property taxes. And that's what I mean when, say, when I say that we're not gonna cut our way out of this. Um, we can save ourselves another year, but we're gonna pay for it later. And because that's what we've done for eight years. We have shaken down the couch cushions and asked every department to do more with less. I'm sorry I keep looking at you, Anna. You're just like, yeah. I'm trying to look at all of you, but you're mostly over here. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I know. Um, we've been shaking the couch cushions and like trying to wring every last drop out of um, everything for eight years, and that's how we got to this point. That's how we've been able to go this you know crazy long amount of time um, without looking at property taxes. Um, and I think that we absolutely have to um, look at how, so, so I don't disagree with, it, with what you're saying at all, and I also uh, think that we need to be really good about informing those residents that we're all thinking about that we know this is gonna hit the hardest um, of, of what resources we can direct them to to make sure that they can, um, that, that, that we can help mitigate or offset this cost to them. 
But you know, looking over the numbers with Jennifer, looking over everything, if if we were to pass every everything that's proposed and the public were to vote on the geo bond as proposed, it would be a dollar a day for the average resident that's a uh, that would have an average home and is a median uh, a medium water user. And I think that you know we can go out there and we can tell these residents that this you know. What you're asking us to do, what you gave us in terms of deliverables, what you mandated for us to come here to City Hall to do, we can deliver that for you for a dollar a day. And I think that we can make that case really strong. Um, in terms of the, the other, the parks and um, some of the, the buildings, Ballpark, Fisher Mansion, Wasatch Plunge Building, Pioneer Park, these are all in the condition that they're in because we, acquire, we acquired them or we built them and we have decided to defer maintenance as long as Can you we add have. public safety building to that too, please? And the, yes, and the old public safety building uh, and Glendale Water Park. The only exception is Allen Park, which was an extremely unique circumstance um, in which we were being offered something that we would never be able to afford. Um, so I, I just want my colleagues to keep all of that in mind. Um, as we go through these talks, that that deferring maintenance on these buildings, um, like, is not going to is not going to save us all long term. It's not going to serve us well um, as council members in the long term. Um, and the other really big thing that's on my mind that I don't even want to bring up, but I'm going to anyway because I think we have to, is that if you know a lot of the economists that are predicting, making predictions right now are right, that we could be in a recession. Um, and I do not want to raise taxes in a recession. The only thing, the only environment that would be worse condition to raise taxes would be in a recession. Um, and I think if we make this decision now, we might be able to get through a, a couple of hard years if that is what's down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Mono. Thank you, Councilmember Wharton. I, I, a adding on to that mandate that you're, I think you were talking about a mandate that our constituents and the people that voted us into office asked for, but there's also mandates that like the EPA has put on us that right. have cost hundreds of millions of dollars for things that we don't even, whether we were voted in for those things or not, we actually have to do so. And that's the majority of the things we have, we had a water main break in District 2 just recently, and I don't know how many millions of gallons of water were lost. But enough to swallow a car. Enough to swallow a car. Like, serious problems are happening because pipes are breaking, and we need to fix those. Those, like, those are basic services, and I believe that street maintenance, street improvements, and making our streets safe for all modes of transportation are basic city services that fall squarely into the responsibility of municipal government. Nobody else is gonna do those things and we need to be focusing on these things that, that nobody else is gonna do and that our residents deserve and need and that are important for quality of life. So I, I also have those constituents and those neighbors that I'm worried about and that's really hard and I get a lot of emails saying well how could you think about raising taxes during inflation and I totally get where a person sitting there looking at all of their expenses going up and then hearing that the city is also raising taxes feels that, that hurts, right, as, a, as an individual. But the inflation is also hitting the city. Like, we have to pay our employees more for them to live. So, and we have to pay more for asphalt and for gas and for everything else. So inflation is affecting us all, unfortunately. And I think, like Chris said, in the way that the state tax code is set up is we cannot keep up without continually raising taxes or our service level drops. And I, I don't believe that 
residents are asking us to reduce the level of service that we're giving them. But, I mean, maybe that's what we'll find out during the budget process, but I think it's hard to, to say, no, we're not gonna. Okay. Yeah. So this is unresolved okay. issues, so I'm Really sorry. tired. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm cutting you off, sorry. We got a few more minutes. Do we have any actual unresolved issues that we want to throw out there? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Perfect. So, I uh, so th I just want to make sure that uh, to th to the mandate or you know one of the main issues I heard was traffic mitigation and tra speeding and all of this. So the police budget cut the 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 steel Speed plates, racing. the steel plates thing, the yeah. rental. Um, but then talking to the chief was like, I want it back, you know, and then I talked to him again and he was like, yes, I really need it, you know. And so I, I, I know that that area will explode again with, with race, street racing. And yes, we can charge them now with like enhanced fines, but it's still, it, you know, it, so I feel like that needs to be back again. Yes. Um, and and uh, I also, going back to traffic mitigation, is I want to make sure that we're to, to uh, Councilmember Fowler's point, um, I want to make sure that we're funding more of the engineers and the people that can get things to the ground done faster. I know that we shouldn't be funding, uh, you know, bosses because you know bosses are needed. But I, but I also want to have some metrics. It's like how many more projects can we get if we fund more, one more of the, of the people that uh, get the things done. You know, jo John Larson mention at some point that they are working with like 10 projects at a time and they're supposed to be working with three or four you know it's a, so they are already at work so finding cuts in this budget means that we are going to uh, no fund either no fund our police no fund our alternative response no funding our stream mitigation no funding our parks and I think the voters in my district are going to be disproportionately affected by the tax increase but I also they, I want to make sure that they see things. Mm -hmm. They want to see things in our parks. They want to see things in our streets. So I, I really want to make sure that that is there. Um, and I want to have more structure about that. And so that's very important to me. I, I also have uh, an issue with the bond and I love, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a funding mechanism, but I feel like we're trying to chew too much and not doing, I don't know if the Fisher Mansion needs more money to get it ready to go. And, but we're spending money on these other buildings. Maybe we need to increase all of them, but I want one of these buildings at least ready to go so we can actually start getting, getting going instead of just patching things uh, here and there. And that, I struggle with that idea. And I know that we might have disagreements over the, here on the table about uh, the, the plunge or whatever we call the uh, warm springs. Uh, but after touring that building with, with uh, uh, Council, Council Member Petro, uh, you know, with one or two inches of mold growing all over and water all over the place, maybe it is, it's, it's just very bad. It's gigantic. And what do we do with it after we put $10 million in it? We don't even know. And that $10 million might not even be enough to get it going. But maybe the Fisher Mansion needs another million and we can get that going. Not that we should abandon the other one, but maybe we start thinking about something outside the box on that building because I still don't know what to do with that ginormous building. Um, so I struggle with that one uh, very much so, and I know that there is a lot of feelings and there's a group that's been pushing very much on that. Um, but uh, you know, just teaming up with the CIP question that I've been asking and asking is, how long, are, how, how far are we on CIP? What do we need to do to get it somewhat caught up? Not that we're never going to be completely caught up, but like, can, like will another person, will two more people help you because the monies are allocated inflation is eating on these monies so like it's affecting us in so many ways and at the, and at the same time um in my career in my career here this is actually the most funding we have ever allocated to cip at nine percent um we've never hit that and i think that the reason we've never hit that is is or part of the reason we've never hit that is maybe to um council member wharton's point about the desire to kind of constrain the budget has always, has, CIP has frankly been the easiest thing to cut because it's not people. And so it's, it's hovered around 7% and it is one of the reasons why we're behind, although you know the staffing issue is part of that too. Um, and so it's just the balance of, um, do you cut things that are easily cuttable like projects 
um, especially acknowledging that the staff probably can't handle all the projects anyway and it might take three years to get to the projects? Um, or do you kind of keep investing even knowing that it'll take years to spend that money? Or, or maybe we need to take a break. I mean, I mean, I'm not, maybe we actually need to set up the expectations right to the, to the public and say, we need a break. We need a year where there's not applications from CIP, and then we can get caught up. I, I didn't I know that go well. <laughs> like that, but like, isn't that the, it, is, isn't that isn't the same? Not doing them for three years, right? Like, I, I, I don't the commitment to the public to do that project. You, you kind of put your line in the sand, and you say, "We will do this project." It might be two years from now, and it might be slightly scaled back because of inflation, but it's happening. Yeah. Well, I just want to know if the, the administration, if we can find out a little more in there yeah. and see if we can find some monies for that. Yeah. Any other further comments before we just call Just a really, night? really small one related oh. to something. Oh, we oh. I also have a really small one. Oh. Well, we'll and start. you guys can each email me. We're going to start mean, with a okay. Councilman Pichel. Well, I just want to, I don't know if it's for this budget season. I don't want to have missed an opportunity. We have roads to build in the northwest quadrant, notably 2800 west, and I have no idea where that funding comes from. And we have a current farm road being used by 18 wheelers right now that is a danger to literally every aspect. I don't know if that's a this budget thing or an after, but I desperately need some clarity about how we're going to handle that. We have a one million square foot warehouse being proposed across the street from residences. I need some clarity on this and where that funding comes from and how we make that all pencil. Councilman Romano. Okay, that actually relates to my small thing that isn't really small, but I, I think that we can't do it this year, unfortunately, but I know Councilman Fowler was saying that She's been asking for an increase to fire CI or fire impact fees. I think road impact fees. Uh, also, the consolidated fee schedule that I keep bringing up for boarded buildings. Uh, those are things that I think are appropriate places to increase not taxes but fees that pay for things that we need because those fees are going on developers that are building a million square foot warehouses and those are where those funds to build the road that is required for that million square foot warehouse should be coming from. And so I hope we're not here in 12 more months saying, why didn't we work on the consolidated fee schedule? Why didn't we work on the impact fee schedule? Why didn't we look at all of these things? I know that's not a small task and I know that everyone is busy doing everything else, but it's been multiple years that I that this has been needed, so. Thank you. Councilmember Wharton. Yes, sorry, just since multiple people have brought up Wasatch Plunge, I mean, that's sort of emblematic of the problem. Like, Wasatch Plunge, how long has it sat dormant um, under the city's control? Most of my lifetime, since it wasn't the Children's Museum. And it, this is a city asset that we haven't been able to offload and that we are never going to ever turn it into anything if we can't get it to a place where it is stable and people can go in and look at it and think about what it could become. So if the goal, if the plunge building, if we're not willing to put in a minimum of the six million to stabilize the building, then we, we should cut the losses that we made and, and already, that we already invested in it when we acquired the property and get rid of it. There's, it's not an option to keep doing what we're doing, which is nothing, and saying like, we're gonna have to wait on that. Six million's too much. Like, you can't even get people in the door, this group that, that has a plan to turn it into something, we can't even let them in the building to see it. And we are, it's gonna be another Pantages Theater. And, you know, give it, give it 10 more years, it, and we'll be in the same position we were with that theater. So if we want to prevent what just happened, that this is the investment we need to make in Fisher Mansion and Wasatch Plunge. Turn it into something that can generate revenue someday. Thank you. All right. Okay. We're good. Jennifer, yes. thank you very much for your time and energy today. Thanks. <laughs> ben, Kristen, thanks for showing up. Appreciate that very much. Council? 
and, and council members, feel free to email me um, or, or text or anything if you have other thoughts that you want included on the unresolved issues list, and I'll make sure to add it. And there's no, uh, no reports from the vice chair, the chair, or the executive director, or anybody else, council members. We are adjourned. <laughs>